Hello. Greetings. Hello. Well, now the consciousness of some of you says, mm, how interesting, one more program. Well, what other interesting information will you tell us so that we become more spiritual? Well, we'll tell about the truth. The question is what they will hear. There is no greater obstacle to understanding the truth than a person's consciousness. And nothing distorts it so much. I mean the truth as a human consciousness. Yes, Igor Mikhailovich, consciousness indeed is not an assistant in spiritual matters at all. And you have revealed this question very well in the program Consciousness and Personality, which… Well, I would say apparently we have missed something, no matter how hard we tried, because there is still too much misunderstanding. Yes, it really turns out that every person is looking for this path to God, somehow, at some point in his life. All his life. And everybody is looking for it. In fact, the personality of even the most avid atheist, it always aspires to God. But consciousness manipulates and easily substitutes goals. It leads one astray. But this happens only when it manipulates a person. And a person without knowing this becomes a slave of the consciousness. Simply put, a slave of Satan. In the modern world, there is a lot of various information freely available on the Internet about the spiritual path. And without having keys, it is very difficult for a person to figure out where some substitutions from the consciousness are. That is, in general, to sort out this information flow, how to find the way to God. Well, the path to God is indeed the shortest path in person's life. Because God, or let's say the doors to the spiritual world, are always within a human. A person, wherever he goes, whether to high mountains or into deep, let's say caves, he will not find God there. God is within a person himself. Therefore, everything is simple. The only thing, in this case, who prevents them from understanding it, this is precisely the one who stands between God and a human. This is the one who, since ancient times, was called Satan, the Devil, the Iblis. There were many names. Here in the modern world it is more convenient, and we say this way, actually, the system. Because it should be understood that the Devil is not in the flesh. The flesh of the Devil is our flesh. And this should be understood. And he himself, well, just like the usual computer program, he is just an informational structure, and he is in every particle of matter. We also came across a huge number of questions from, as you said correctly, atheists, priests, laymen, and all people who are going to God and, so to say, are a step away from God. Or, as believers say, one step from the door to God. And it turns out that certain questions arise in all people, and there are no answers to these questions. Some become disappointed in their religions because of this. Of course, there are cases when, on the contrary, among the atheistic environment are found those people who find the way to God. But there is a huge range of questions to which people do not have answers, and we would like to talk about what kind of arguments the consciousness has in order to stop a person in actual fact? What questions, in general, do these people have and try to figure out, to give answers to these questions? Let's try. In order to somehow ease for people this way home. Let's try. Let's try. Well, let's start with atheism. Well, on the other hand, why just try? Let's act. Act. Right, we try to figure it out and have sort of figured out the topics of atheism, lay people and priests, and so… So you are the first ones who have figured out these topics. Yes. And on the topic of atheism, here is the question, what is atheism? And in fact… Atheism is a religion, a religion of Satan, meaning a religion of materialism, for they also believe what they believe in. Yes, the questions seem very relevant, because it was surprising to face the fact that atheism is on the third place in statistical studies on the list of religions after Christianity and Islam. So, what is the reason for that in general? Well, I would say that hidden atheism prevails over all religions. 
Why? Because there are many atheists in Christianity and in Islam. There are many atheists among those who call themselves believers. But in fact, they do not believe in God, they do not know Him and do not aspire to God. But they simply use religious organizations as a certain tool in this case. And unfortunately, this happens among clergymen, laymen and monks as well. This is a convenient form of existence, but their consciousness tells them whether God exists or God does not exist. The main thing is to live now. Right. A sort of one-day butterflies. I would even say there is such a fly, Drosophila, which is constantly being experimented on. Well, I would compare it with this. These are exactly those on whom the devil is conducting his experiments. Yes, there also such information was found. While exploring atheistic dictionaries, reading very skeptic books, we found out that atheists, they in fact deny God and do not believe in religions. They call religion a lie and deceit, meaning ignorance, lies and deception. And in fact, it turns out that they themselves do not believe. And they constantly demand to prove the existence of God. Yes. But let's figure out who among people does not require proof from God that He exists. Don't believers do the same? We have talked about this more than once, and people know that. Oh God, if you exist, make my tummy not ache. Yes? I have already given similar examples. Or, God, if you exist, let my financial situation be resolved, and then I will believe in you. The situation was resolved, but the person forgot about his promise. And again, let's put it so, from whom do these proposals for God come? From consciousness. But these are not even proposals, these are ultimatums to God. If you exist, prove that you exist, from consciousness. But consciousness immediately says, no matter how hard you try to prove to me that you exist, I will not believe you. Why? Because people should know and understand Understand. Consciousness will never perceive anything that is related to the spiritual world, the real true. It will always doubt. Always. A simple example, we have already mentioned it several times. This disbelief of so many people at those times when they were near Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and even with Jesus. What is here to talk about? Human consciousness. And the more firmly, let's say, Satan holds strings and manipulates such a puppet, which considers itself to be a human, the less of a chance the human has to come into contact with the spiritual world. This is also true. But after all, human is not a puppet. He's a human. And in fact, no one can force him as a personality to make his choice to choose serving Satan or serving God. The cognition of the spiritual world and aspiration and coming there depends on the person himself. No Satan has the right to defeat a human who aspires to God. And Satan cannot break the rules that are not set by him. No one can. Yes, in fact, Satan is the one who opposes everything that comes from God. In reality, he opposes nothing. He's just an always hungry program that constantly requires energy, and everything else are tricks and ploys just for feeding itself. Let's take people, for example. People who feel hungry also resort to cunning and everything else, isn't it so? Don't animals act like this? They do. The only thing that is different is that this is a well-organized, let's say, structure with a huge intellect. And, well, it is self-developing, meaning what we now call artificial intelligence. Well, I would compare it this way. And we might have attributed our consciousness, let's say, our thought process to a quantum computer. Well, they all are interconnected and form a single chain. But the only thing that needs to be considered here is that consciousness, as they say, even though it is primitive, everyone has it, both the microorganism and, excuse me, the parasites that live in the human body. They are well organized, and it is indeed so, because it is they who force you to take these or those products. If parasites living in you need sugar, 
You drink a cup of coffee, let's say, with an extra spoonful of sugar, and think that it is you who want this, even without thinking who really wants it. And imagine if a certain group of parasites can dictate to such a supreme being, evolutionally developed one, as atheists say, accidentally formed, but one that has reached maximum level of development, while simple worms dictate to them. Here is an example how programs actually work. Also, those same microbes and viruses, they also introduce their dictatorship and also rule. And there are a lot of such examples. They manipulate not only ants and animals, they also manipulate people. Yes, and here a question comes up, but what about a human being, the top of the food chain? Well, he is food for those who are at the bottom of the food chain. And here the circle closes. It's just interesting how the system acts, that is, it encapsulates a person, and he thinks that these kind of atheistic conclusions of his are his personal conclusions. Absolutely. Well, everyone wants to consider himself to be very intelligent, and in fact considers himself, let's say, capable of understanding so many mysteries. But these are all derivatives of pridefulness and everything. Only a prideful one can deny the existence of God and consider himself above someone else and assume that he knows everything. It's impossible to know everything. It was also interesting, when studying this question, we faced information that even that very atheism, which in fact was in ancient Rome and in ancient Greece, and that it was inherent in these elitist circles, who have their own… And you have just said the key phrase, elitist circles, meaning the elite. But only few people know what the elite really are. Elite are the servants of El, or ones who belong to the circle of El. And who is El? Well, we know that it is… Well, from classical understanding, it's… From the classical one. God in Judaism, this is the supreme God, and the meaning of this word is might. And look, now you're telling interesting things. After all, Judaism is mono-religion, right? Mm -hmm. It believes in one God, but how and where does the Supreme God come from? But if we take, let's say, Judaism and read in the original, as well as the ancient Greek publications, which have survived to this day, well, people will be surprised by what is written there, right? As it is written there, that the gods gathered under the leadership of El, and how the human allotments were given to the gods by El, meaning to the children of God, who later became gods. Well, all of that are, let's say, the echoes of ancient legends, which just told the truth. But history, or rather historians, pretty much erased and changed it. And here, instead of the truth, we got Olympus, you know, with its gods. But this story, it copies exactly that reality which actually happened in Atlantis, what is now called Atlantis, but it was called differently. But what's the difference? Now it's called Atlantis. Igor Mikhailovich, and who is El? El? In actual fact. Well, for those who love history in classic form, I'll say so. I'll tell a little fairy tale that has the right to exist. Whoever wants, he believes in this tale and looks for evidence, which there are a lot, in fact, a whole lot. And whoever doesn't want to, they just perceive it as, I, like I said, just a fairy tale. In order to understand how it was in reality, well, I'll make it easier for understanding, once there was a civilization that was much more developed than now. They aspired, like any material, let's say, formation, to autocracy. They aimed at single world government, as, let's say, as now many are striving for. But they explained that the world should be united, people should live well, and when there is a single world government, there is one world, there are no wars, no, well, let's say, misunderstanding in terms of economy and everything else. And indeed, 
at a high stage of evolutionary development, people have to be united after all, but they have to be controlled to avoid chaos. And out of the best motives, a single world government was created. But once again, as I've said, science did not stand still. And it is natural that prolonging human life beyond the species limit, many times over at that, is not difficult for modern science. There are already good experiments, the first attempts that give colossal results and show that it is quite realistic. It is not difficult. But when there are a lot of people on Earth, and at that time there were 8 billion people, just imagine, 8 billion people, that is almost like now, just a little bit more. Well, modern development keeps moving and we are already approaching this, their level of development, let's say so. And just imagine so many people, and they achieve immortality. What to do? And top of that, they are reproducing. That is the population increases. Well, there is nothing to feed them with, and so on. It is clear that for safety reasons, say, in order to avoid overpopulation, no one gave it to the people. But due to the fact that the scientific discovery was made, it was tested, gave good results, who needs it? exactly those who rule the whole world. So that people who lead could exist for a long time and keep order. Well, again, when a person has everything, he does not need anything. But when others come, everything might change. Well, in this way, certain people have become almost immortal. It does not mean that they could not die. They could. They could get poisoned and die. Mechanical damage to the body could lead to a fatal outcome. But let's say they certainly would not have died from an illness or of old age. And one of the Supreme Governors had the name L. That's what we... That's how the gods appeared. Why gods? Well, because generations were changing, but El lived almost a thousand years. Just imagine, people are getting bored, power no longer satisfies them, more over peaceful power. And like any civilization at the peak of its development, or rather reaching the peak of development, they stimulated people's knowledge, education, well, as long as it was needed, and then they stepped on education and began, say, to fight the logical thinking of people. We are observing this in education now, what is happening? That is the fact. Well, and in such way they deprived people of many benefits. People became a little wild and stupid. For them, that country, let's say, that world, you cannot call it any other way, well, it was kind of an assembly of gods for them, where gods reside and so on, something like paradise. And for those who, say, were extremely faithful and essential, they had a chance to get into that world, the world of the immortals. Only it ended badly. Why badly? Well, because people got bored, and those who were called gods, where they were actually anthropomorphic, yet ordinary people with a lot of problems under Satan's control. That is, consciousness manipulated them. And in order to somehow brighten up their existence, their way of life, they allotted, or rather El divided, because he was the only ruler, he allotted the dominions to each of his assistants, who were part of this group of immortals. Well, they received certain nations with a certain territory to rule, and he ruled them all. Then the chess game began. The war started between them because they were bored, just like in ancient Rome. Remember, gladiators fight and the like. It's human nature, it requires blood and preferably someone else's, not one's own. Well, they reach critical point, fell as low as possible, say, from the position of morality and everything else. It is clear that no one ever mentioned true God. As for all people, the gods were Atlanteans, led by El. 
and the group of gods with him who committed everything from the debauchery to murder. This was a norm for them. That's from where originated the legends of Olympus and so on. Well, it all ended badly for them, because one fine day they were simply demolished along with Atlantis and with their... Actually, the gods and their minions, practically all of them were demolished. And of course, most of the people who strongly believed in it, simply, like dirty dishes, have been washed. A question arises now, by whom, if in such a three-dimensional world, they were so omnipotent? Let's say it simply. God does not interfere in human affairs. But sometimes he has to. That is, there is still the one who represents the spiritual world. And when everything goes over the line, then... and there is no way back, when people are deaf and blind, it is natural that they are washed away. I'll give a simple example. Imagine farmer whose livestock are sick. What will he do? But there are also few healthy ones. He will save those who are healthy and not those who are irrevocably sick, right? So it turns out that all these, say, ancient myths, antique myths, they... They have been changed a lot by consciousness. And as of today, the Atlanteans, they were almost the best, the most intelligent and everything else. Well, everything was altered, everything was distorted and changed. This is beneficial for consciousness. But there are a lot of confirmations of these facts I am talking about. Artifacts, megaliths and much more. The one who wants to, he will find confirmation. And whoever does not want to, as I've said, let him perceive it simply as another fairy tale. There are actually many fairy tales. Atlantis. The elite in search of immortality. Were there more highly developed civilizations than now? Did Atlantis exist? The existence of an island country where a human-like god reigned, surrounded by his children, an assembly of gods, who ruled people, had wonderful technologies, mysterious magic objects, possessed climatic weapons. The ability to clone a human being. Medical technologies prolonging a person's biological life beyond the species limit, meaning increase in life for a long time the so-called immortality in the body for the selected ones. This information is mentioned in ancient legends of different peoples of the world. An earthly paradise, the country of gods, where supreme god reigned, surrounded by an assembly of gods. The legends about the super-advanced antediluvian civilization, which was situated in the far west on a large island surrounded by water, the country, the powerful influence of which once spread all over the world, the country where El autocratically ruled with an entourage of his selected servants, the elite, and endowed his children with power over different nations, refer to very ancient times. Both nations of the East and nations of the West, who lived several millennia ago, still maintain these legends. Each nation called this island state in their own way. For example, in the oldest Sumerian legends, it is the blessed island of Dilmun, 
the land of the living, where there was no disease and death, the god's place of dwelling. The scene of the oldest Sumerian myths about the gods Enlil, Enki, Ninhursag, about the human Utnapishti who survived the Great Flood. These legends are embodied in the Sumerian epic about the hero Gilgamesh, as well as in the Babylonian poem Enuma Elish. It is precisely from these legends that much later, after many centuries, Hebrew priests borrowed stories about the heavenly Eden, the forbidden fruit, the expulsion from paradise, the Great Flood, and much more. In Celtic mythology, it is the Isle of the Blessed Avalon, located on distant western islands. Its symbols are a glass tower or palace, miraculous apples that grant immortality, and so on. The word Avalon is originally found as a proper name in Welsh genealogy with regard to the mythical ancestor of the oldest dynasties of Britain. In Chinese mythology, the paradise of the immortals, Xi'an, it is located on three sacred mountains, Fanlai, Fanjan, and Injou, which swim in the sea ocean. It is mentioned that the immortal people Xi'an mount the clouds, riding the flying dragons. They have the garden of goddess Xivan Mu, in which peaches of immortality grow. Pantao. It is known that in legends an immortal people Xi'an often has a guise of a white-bearded old man, and his portrait with attributes of immortality. And in the mythology of the Hellenes, that is, the ancient Greeks, this country was called Elysium, the Isles of the Blessed, Atlantis. Hellenes about Atlantis. Atlantis. That is how this highly developed island state in the Atlantic Ocean was first called among the Hellenes by the ancient Hellenic philosopher Plato in his dialects Timaeus and Critias. Plato was a descendant of the Athenian lawmaker of the 6th century BC, Archon Salon, who was called the wisest of the seven wise men of the country of Elada, the country known today as ancient Greece. According to Plato, the great mystery that the history of natural cataclysms repeats itself, and the present civilization is far from being the first, was told to Archon Salon during his travels through Egypt by the Egyptian priests. By the way, according to the legends of the Hellenes, Solon's bloodline goes back directly to Poseidon, the god of the seas, who it is thought founded Atlantis and settled his children there. According to an ancient Greek legend, Atlantis was a large island state, which was located on the west of the Pillars of Hercules, opposite the Atlantean mountains. Other ancient sources report about the land of Titan Atlas. Atlanteans waged wars and spread their power far beyond their state. Atlantean society was at the stage of decomposition, selfishness, power, luxury, ambitiousness, corruption of morals. According to the legend, as a punishment, gods sent down a severe earthquake and a flood upon them. The large island of Atlantis was destroyed during a sudden strong earthquake and rapid flooding. It was flooded in the waters of the ocean in one day and in one disastrous night. According to Plato, the destruction of Atlantis occurred 9,200 years before the time of Archon Solon. That is 12,000 years back from present times. Today, there is quite a lot of scientific material on what oceanologists, geologists, 
geotectonics experts and specialists in other fields of science think on this issue. Many scientists had no doubt about the existence and submerging of a big area of land that had once been located in the Atlantic Ocean between Europe and America, which Plato had mentioned. However, many were astonished by the very fact that in this legend the land submerged in just one day. However, the current rapid global climate change on Earth, which has been observed over the last two years, indicates that in the modern world, any day may become the last for the consumer civilization. As Igor Mikhailovich Danilov said, it is people themselves who by their choice, and exactly by their choice whom to serve, the devil or God, are bringing closer or postponing this end of the world. A lot depends on people. Some people doubt the end of the world. But today, only a fool or someone who doesn't see what is happening behind the window may have doubts. Since ancient times, people who lived on different continents have preserved a common spiritual heritage, which contains an understanding of how a mortal human can attain life without death, how to acquire eternal life. It was based on primordial spiritual knowledge about the existence of the spiritual world, the eternal world of God, that God is one, about the temporality and mortality of the material world. There was an understanding of the power of God and that it lies in God's love. There was also knowledge about the seven messengers of the spiritual world, the executors of the will of one God. From time to time, they come to this world at the most important stages for humanity. That is, their immortal spirit temporarily incarnates in this world in a human body and thus being in equal living conditions with people they fulfill their mission until the destruction of the body shell meaning the death of the temporary body while six of the seven messengers from the eternal spiritual world come occasionally and when necessary one of them is constantly present on earth at God's behest he has many names, but his true name is Ariman. In modern terms, he is like a programmer who wrote a program, which is what people at different times called the devil, Satan, Iblis, or simply intelligent system. The system, a part of which is consciousness, and thoughts come into a person from the system, Thoughts have an influence and work according to patterns, like programs. Ariman constantly monitors the work of his global intelligence system. He stays here, in the material world, for just one day. Based on an ancient understanding that the entire material world, with its billions of years, exists for just one day. For many, a question arises. Why are the devil and these demons needed in their heads? All these programs with thoughts and emotions that come, build on pridefulness, envy, hatred and a multitude of earthly desires. However, according to the primordial knowledge, it is precisely they that create the conditions for human choice, whether to be mortal or to attain spiritual immortality. Thoughts seduce and generate earthly desires stimulate vices a thirst for power 
and dead attributes of the material world. But these programs filters, the devil and the demons, are also all seen guards at the gates into true paradise, God's heaven. The spiritual world is a world where there is no matter. It's a world in which there is another form of existence, interpreted in human understanding as God's love. People called by different names the immaterial place where messengers from the spiritual world constantly reside. One of the names known today is the legendary Shambhala, headed by Rikten Jappo. According to the primordial knowledge, Shambhala is located between the real, eternal world of God and the temporarily existing material universe. That is in the highest, 72nd dimension of the sphere. It is from there came the mention of the number 72 in ancient legends, tales, and images. It should also be noted that the familiar material world changes already in the fourth dimension, and in the seventh it's no longer present as matter. The seal of Shambhala is the ancient Alatra sign, stylized as the all-seeing eye of God or the sun rising from the horizon in a triangle with divergent rays. A territory or place in which Shambhala had an interest was marked by the seal of Shambhala as a sign. Similar signs of distinction were worn by representatives of Shambhala when they temporarily incarnated in this world, as well as by those from among the worthy people who held them. As there have been before and to this day, there are many legends about Shambhala, which are intertwined with legends about the cosmic world mountain. In the legends, it's been associatively said that immortal gods live on the top of this world mountain. This concept is associated with an immaterial place located outside three-dimensionality, which can be spiritually visited by those who are called saints. And this is connected with the processes of significant spiritual transformation of a human being from mortal to an immortal one and has nothing to do with matter as such, meaning neither with a person's physical body nor with any material place on Earth. Possessing this understanding, it is easy to distinguish wheat from chaff. when the primordial knowledge is lost. A human being feels the primordial spiritual. This is embedded in him at a subconscious level. But a human also hears the thoughts that consciousness is constantly dictating to him, and he mistakenly perceives them as his own. Whatever a person chooses in himself, what he attaches his attention to, is what he eventually receives. Loss of spiritual knowledge occurs when a person ceases to work on himself spiritually, loses his inner connection with God, that is, the possibility of gaining his real immortality in a temporary life. Instead, he begins as a servant to fulfill directives of consciousness, to seek immortality and salvation in the material world. The result is definitely sad a sub-personality. The patterns of consciousness as a part of the system are the same at all times. Therefore, everything in this world is stereotypical and repeats itself after a certain period of time. 12,000 years is just a cycle. What happened in Atlantis? A 
majority of people have chosen a consumer format of civilization in their minds. The desire to achieve immortality in the body became the dominant idea. Consciousness began to actively distort and substitute the primordial spiritual knowledge with directives beneficial to the system. Thus, ancient religions were born, where spiritual action inside a person was replaced by an external spectacle and satisfaction of earthly desires. Atlantis is an example of that. Thus, due to the loss of primordial knowledge, in the legends people began to call the seven messengers from the spiritual world gods. This misconception by the majority was taken advantage of in their earthly interests by ordinary mortal people who, having gotten their hands on power, resorted to the latest achievements of science, the discovery of prolongation of human life beyond the species limit. They called themselves the legendary immortals, although at the same time they remained mere mortal people who just significantly increased the term of their life. An ordinary mortal man named El declared himself the supreme god. He appropriated names and epithets from the legends of one of the seven messengers from the spiritual world who permanently resided on Earth, Ariman. And then he appointed as gods first his entourage and then his children, giving them the names of the legendary messengers of the spiritual world. And to make people believe him and his entourage, and to support their power, El and his servants, the elite, created Elysium on an island with a favorable climate and a single low mountain, similar to descriptions of the world mountain. As a result, after several generations of their power, people could no longer distinguish where the truth was and where the fiction. Only nothing remained of the holy. The society became degraded. Salvation of the body became the goal of people's life. And the concept of one God turned into worship of a material image of a mortal man with a beard sitting on the throne. It only seems to a mortal human that his earthly power is unlimited. But this is only an illusion created in his consciousness by the system itself. In actual fact, he becomes a controlled slave. Whatever thought the system imposes on him is what he will execute with obedience. The descendants of those who managed to survive after annihilation of Atlantis, to hide from retribution and to survive the subsequent times of the new spiritual formation of humankind, became keepers of the ideological heritage of Atlantis. When the epoch of patriarchy came, they started to actively propagate the ideas of omnipotence and sought to implement them and to establish a new world order, planning for centuries ahead. Controlled by the patterns of consciousness, they played a game of the system in secret knowledge and secret activity. They established closed groups, clans, secret orders, organized initiations into the so-called Great Mystery of Mysteries, presenting the story of the country of El as fate of the selected ones, endowing their pridefulness with belonging to a supposedly dominant race of highly developed people, which, in their opinion, must rule over all people on Earth, that is, to the servants of El, the elite. This can be clearly traced at different times in history. It was precisely on their initiative that there appeared stories, including the ones about Atlantis and the mountain of the immortal Olympic gods. This information was subsequently implanted in the minds of new generations as a pattern of behavior. After all, what is permitted to gods is what human pridefulness will invariably copy for itself as well. The descendants of the Atlanteans took many other initiatives causing a majority of people today to have lost their spiritual knowledge, to dream about immortality in material bodies, and not even to know that already for a long time they've been living under the aegis of El and unconsciously seeking to imitate his elite. 
But this didn't happen immediately. The descendants of the Atlanteans waited for the time when the system would gain strength and would again dominate in people's minds. The time when humankind's spiritual resistance will be weakened. Because they knew the main thing — that everything starts with a human being and his choice. How it really happened. When the era of patriarchy came, priests and militant leaders usurped power. That's how many gods endowed with human passions appeared, as well as bloodthirsty teen gods who were portrayed in material bodies with symbols of power and attributes of immortality. And this entire system of power was promoted owing to a mixture of particles of spiritual grains of primordial knowledge, otherwise it would not be so attractive to a majority of people, with the directives beneficial to the system, such as division of people, domination of some over others, hatred, intolerance. As a result, the society has degraded by means of the conventional patterns of consciousness programs, military clashes, conquests, exploitation. A simple example is the first Sumerian city-states in which the first kings ruled. Have you ever wondered why world history in different countries of the world, in school textbooks and textbooks for higher educational institutions, begins with the 4th, 3rd millennium BC from the ancient cities of Mesopotamia and Egypt, and then as a rule, ancient India, China and Ellada, ancient Greece are pointed out. Why is the attention of new generations intentionally concentrated on this Middle Eastern region and precisely on this particular period of time? Based on whose initiative, or more precisely, who is the sponsor of the dominance of exactly this opinion in this inexact science of guessing dates and events, as though nothing more significant had existed before. Neither megalithic cities on different continents, nor Turpilian cities of 10,000 people in the territory of ancient Europe, nor highly developed cities in Eurasia, whose inhabitants led a peaceful way of life. It's not even reported that before the Sumerians there had lived people in Mesopotamia who had particularly respected the Alatra sign, as well as other people on different continents since ancient times. And why in this world history of the selected ones were all communities of people before this period conditionally called cultures and later on civilizations and the first city-states? The answer lies in the word state. Due to adoptions from other languages and translations, we come across such interpretations as dominance lordship Dominus, Lord, Power, Head of the Family. Ancient sources of the origin of the word dominance lead to the Sumerians. After all, it was at this time in the East that active propaganda of the ancient supreme deity, the primal forefather named El, began. The history of his rise, the struggle for power with old gods and their overthrowing, 
the rule of the nations by his children and the assembly of gods under his rule. Considering that the power of religion reigned supreme in Sumeria and it propagandized the assembly of gods led by the main god, it becomes clear from what family of gods the example of governance of peoples was copied. The Kingdom of the Mind What did the history of the so-called civilization of the people that had come to the fertile valley of Mesopotamia start from? From carve-up of surplus and from bureaucracy. The first pictographic texts were accounting records, economic lists and checklists. To put it simply, the era of matriarchy was ruined by daily routine, as well as by patriarchy's thirst for power. The same thing happens to a person who loses spiritual connection with God within himself. Dictatorship of consciousness arises in him. He begins to pay excessive attention to his living conditions in three-dimensionality, at a loss to his spiritual development. And when the kingdom of the mind predominates, everything is stereotyped, regardless of whether in a family or in a community. Identification of an external enemy, a desire to seize neighboring territories, exploitation of surrounding people, and the struggle for power. What does this lead to? Was the country of Sumer actually a country of free people? Sumer of the late 3rd millennium BC was a country that constantly waged aggressive wars, a country of mercenaries, of slaves bought or captured in the war, a country of debtor slaves who sold their family members and themselves into slavery. It was a country that lived by a collection of laws of kings who proclaimed themselves vicars of gods. The country of 30 pieces of silver where human life was expressed in the measure of the value of commodity of that time, silver. This is evidenced by the tablets with annual reports of overseers concerning transactions with labor force and slaves. And this kingdom of mind of the slaves and servants of God and Lil spread its tentacles to Syria, Asia Minor and Elam. Strangers with a story of El the ethnonym, meaning the name Sumerians, is a scientific abstraction. It's not a self-designation of the people. This name is simply used to denote the people who came to Mesopotamian fertile lands. The general literary heritage of ancient Mesopotamia, which has been preserved through the cuneiform tablets of the Sumerians, and then the Akkadians who adopted their heritage, and later on in the writings of the Babylonian priests, tells first and foremost the story of a power formation, which repeats the antediluvian history of the omnipotence of long-lived El and his elite. El here is already endowed with the qualities of God and Lil, Akkadian Elil, who later on became one of the main gods of the Sumerian Akkadian pantheon. Moreover, echoes of the old legends left from the primordial knowledge can be traced here. About the seven gods, among whom was also Enlil, one of the Ariman's names. About the fact that Enlil was the second to the heavenly god named Anu and was his permanent representative on Earth. But already in the Sumerian legends, the antediluvian story of the world autocrat El is actively ascribed to Enlil of the seven gods. The following became Enlil's main epithets. The Great Mountain, the Lord of all the lands, the Lord who determines destinies, the Lord whose utterances are immutable, and the Father of Gods. There was even such an expression, the Enlil of all the Gods, Enlilship over the Gods. The term Enlilship means dominance, lordship. In the Sumerian hymn, Enlil is everywhere, in which Enlil is honored, his epithets and deeds of Gods are listed. This cult text, designated to intensify collective emotions, contains such words. Without Enlil, the great mountain, no city would be built, no settlement would be founded, no cowpen would be built, no sheepfold would be established, no king would be elevated, no priest would be given birth, no high priest would be elected by oracle, soldiers would have no generals or captains. The Temple of Enlil 
is a mountain of abundance. They take sacrifices there, they grant absolution. And Lil, if you look upon the shepherd favorably, if you elevate the one truly cold in the land, then the foreign countries are in his hands, the foreign countries are at his feet. There is a good example. One of the first ancient cities of Mesopotamia, Eridu, is called the city of the first kings. According to legends, its patron, god Enki, the son of Enlil, acts as the organizer of the world order on Earth. The city is ruled by the son of Enki himself, a man named Adapa, who was half god, half human hero. It was believed that Adapa was the one who brought civilization to the city from the island of Dilmun, meaning from the island of the immortals. By the way, in the Akkadian mythology, Adapa is one of the seven sages. A similar story about the seven sages much later existed also in ancient Greece, Ellada, where Solon was also called one of the seven sages. Nothing more than fiction. What patterns of behavior were implanted in the minds of the younger generation? And who benefited from this? The Sumerians began to actively write and replicate texts of the legends about the country of El. For these purposes, special schools were opened. Aduba, or tablet houses, scribal schools where they began to prepare scribes and those who would be their heralds among the people. It is interesting that when the Sumerian language had become dead, up to the first millennium BC, it was used as a sacred literary language and the language of science in that very Assyria and Babylon. In fact, Latin today is used according to the same scheme. That is, the dead Sumerian language was understandable only to the selected ones. Moreover, many symbols of cuneiform writing express precisely Sumerian words and their meaning, whereas phonation of Akkadian words was initially written through combination of sumerograms similar to present-day rebuses and charades. Yet why were such complexities and secret actions needed for transmission of ordinary literary epos, myths and folklore? If it was such, The Sumerians made the text convenient for memorization and easily perceivable by ear. Moreover, the plot was designed so as to cause collective emotions by means of the story, to put a crowd of listeners into an emotional state set in the text, because the content was mostly known to listeners in advance, generally speaking in modern understanding, to prepare mass media journalists. Although before this, for a long time, cult texts had been just memorized and passed on from generation to generation. By the way, exactly the same method was used several centuries later for dissemination of Homer's Iliad among the Hellenes and other peoples. Only those heralds journalists were already called rhapsodists, the sons of Homer. Why did such a bureaucratic state as Sumer where everything was on the register, even every fruit on the tree was counted, suddenly allow itself such spendings on epos. What were the goals of the sponsors of this activity? The fact is that all this mythology, intertwined with religion, consequently affected the worldview of not only these people, but also of the successors to their literary heritage, the Akkadians and later the Babylonians, and from them it was spread to other peoples, but with the only difference that in subsequent generations they no longer remembered the primordial, but literally to contrast what was said by local priests who were concerned about their power. The system has strengthened its positions in the minds of people. Basically, a role model for imitation was being prepared for people. What human-like gods allowed themselves to do was the same thing people did, following their example. Moreover, the goal of human existence was being substituted. Instead of the true meaning of human life, 
understanding of what a human had been created for, that is transformation into a spiritual being, merging with God's love within oneself. Priests, under the dictation of their consciousness, were implanting things beneficial for the system into the minds of the congregation. Namely, since childhood a person was being implanted with an idea that the goal of creation of a human being was to work for gods, to cultivate land, to graze cattle, to collect fruits, to feed gods with their sacrifices. That is, to work for El and his elite, devoting all their lives and all their attention to the external, which is what is still observed to this day in such a format of human society as a consumer civilization. Worldview Sumerian and Babylonian literature What was hidden in the role model for imitation? Pridefulness Murder Drunkness, deceit, revenge, vanity, selfishness, betrayal, human love with the help of witchcraft. Generally speaking, all those same pattern directives of the system in the people's consciousness. Division of people. As in else country, the system's ideology divide and rule. As in else country, and this will be explained in detail later in the story about the gods of Olympus, in the legends of the priests of ancient Mesopotamia, people were divided into gods, heroes and savages. And considering how the descendants of the Atlanteans, the Archons, have replicated these images in the minds of people for centuries, striving for a single world power, this can be observed even now in the modern world society. The assembly of the gods, elite, were patrons of people, endowed with all human attributes and qualities, possessing magical objects, high technologies. As an example, God Shamash made it easier for the hero Gilgamesh to defeat the monster, thanks to the seven winds that blow at the will of Shamash. The monster had killing rays, and guarded a special area of an unusual cedar forest of the god Elil. Today, many rich people of the world dream of being elected to the circles of the world elite, or at least of being of use to them, strive to have protection and their patronage for their mini-empire, be it a business or an influence on a territorial region. Heroes an example, the image of Gilgamesh, were lucky fellows, all of whose feats were not due to their own merit, but due to some mighty patron among the gods, from the elite of El, who possessed magical objects. That is, there was a programmed hero who was supposed to destroy the evil that his patron considered to be evil. And then, to die young, in general, as the gods would decide at the Council of the Gods. During their short life, the heroes had to think about the meaning of life, to seek immortality in the body, since the gods had already possessed this immortality. And the highest manifestation of courage, it should have been a recognition of one's own defeat. Promoted later in literature, to the point of the hero's suicide, Today, millions of people since childhood dream to be like the famous hero Superman of their time, from worldwide popular movies, TV series promoted by mass media. And as adults, by imitating them, many people risk their lives for sake of realization of the world elite's plans, while they don't even know who they actually work for and why. Savages Example, the image of Enkidu, the servant of Gilgamesh. A savage, a faceless creature, who joined the civilization and became a devoted servant of the hero. He had to pay to the gods, with his sufferings and death, for his and the hero's common accomplishments. Today, billions of people stay in a state of misery and poverty, barely living from paycheck to paycheck, 
Since childhood, they dream of at least standing next to famous people, not to mention of being as useful for them as possible, in order to break out of poverty to become decent people. Fixed idea – immortality in the body. The system's dream about its immortality. The striving of the main hero to achieve immortality takes a central stage in the Mesopotamian literature. The epic titled He Who Saw Everything about the hero Gilgamesh is built around this plot and is repeated in different versions for different peoples, on which the sphere of influence of the descendants of El spread in different countries. But it's important to note the main theme of these works. It is supposedly impossible for a person to achieve the main goal of his search – eternal life. The futility of human efforts in trying to attain immortality and eternal youth, that is, the fate of the gods. And the ending, that is, the emphasis on the idea of the work, highlights that the only immortality that is available to a person is the memory of his deeds, that glorified his image and name. What do we see today? Billions of people don't know about the spiritual aim of their lives. Other billions of people, considering themselves religious people, don't know how to really achieve immortality during life. This lack of knowledge is used by the world elite for their own secret manipulative goals. And how many people in the world dream about their own career? To become famous, glorify their name, commemorate it for the ages, so that everyone would know about them. For such a mass psychosis, all the conditions have been created in the consumer society by the hands of people themselves. And it doesn't matter in what scale one or another consciousness thinks, one dreams to glorify one's name through some nonsense on the Internet, having put up a lot of photos of oneself, and another, via Supermind, releasing volumes of scientific works with his photograph or giving his name to a new kind of mollusks. Everyone's consciousness works stereotypically – to glorify one's own name. But why is the system interested in promoting such a pattern as immortality in the body, achievement of eternal youth? Why does it focus a person's attention on promotion of his own image and name? Knowing the primordial spiritual knowledge and realizing that the system changes the essence of the knowledge, one can understand that the answer is hidden in two points – immortality in the body, today they call it salvation, and glorifying the name. According to the primordial spiritual knowledge, any person can achieve immortality during the temporary existence of his body that is, spiritually develop himself by means of the deepest feelings to such a state of inner spiritual transformation when he, the personality, as a spirit, begins to live in the spiritual world. It's important to know that only spirit can be immortal, but not the physical body or consciousness. Consciousness doesn't understand this. God is a material image for it. Consciousness is incapable of experiencing deep feelings. It can only talk, think, and create emotions. And what does consciousness understand? It understands only what the system understands. In the system's understanding, immortality in the body is prolongation of life beyond the species limit. It's an increase in the term of one's own life. Although the system understands its own finiteness, after all, its lifetime is predetermined as that of an ordinary program. So the promise of immortality in physical body is its patterned trick, proven by millennia. An illusion by living which people, without being aware of it, waste the real power of their attention on feeding the system and glorification of one's own name via an image in the centuries is also beneficial for the system. Thus, it churns subpersonalities for itself, which are also food for the system, being dead among the living. Enuma Elish 
Today, it's not a secret for scholars studying Bible issues that much of it was borrowed by Hebrew priests from the sacred texts of not only ancient Egypt, but Babylon as well. The scripture about the creation of the world, Enuma Elish, was basically the Bible of Babylon. And Babylonian priests, in their turn, borrowed these texts from the Akkadian priests. While the Akkadians had borrowed their cosmological scriptures about the world's origin and the administration of gods from the more ancient nation, the Sumerians, whose god from the assembly of gods is more powerful, depended on the political hegemony of priests in one or another city or country. In fact, there was a struggle to ensure that namely their god would be awarded the epithet and leadership over gods. The names of main gods and heroes were changing, but the essence anyway remained the same. The story of the seizure of power and the omnipotence of El and his elite over people. Enuma Elish is a Babylonian Akkadian holy scripture, ancient Mesopotamian cosmological texts about the creation of the world and the human race, about the origin of gods and the universe, about the struggle and seizure of power by old and new gods, about how a bunch of gods collided people with each other, how they dominated over peoples, and much more. Babylonian legends emphasize that the cause of people's troubles is not retribution of human sins, but the anger of gods their desire to reduce the number of ever-growing humankind that bothers gods with its noise. In Enuma Elish, the main role in creation of the world is no longer assigned to Enlil, but to a god named Marduk. And again, the old story is repeated. The main god organizes the world order through violence. The late motive of the legend is a violent overthrow of ancient forces, powered by the right of the strongest. Marduk is given the epithet of lordship, that is, Enlilship over the gods. He is called Enlil of all gods. Thus, Marduk holds the main place in the pantheon of gods on the second millennium BC. Due to the efforts of the priests, by the end of the Old Babylonian period, he is already venerated far beyond Babylon. And even later, in the Hellenistic era, the story of Marduk is largely copied by the Archons of Hellenes. Only the main god is already called Zeus, and the mountain on which he rules is called Olympus. What is the main goal of this promoted epic poem, Enuma Elish? Here, the main goal is to bring together many gods' images into one. Thus, the features of Sumerian and Akkadian gods Enlil, Anki, Ea, and others have already been transferred to Marduk. That's why, in the subsequent epochs, the main god of other peoples and tribes who came under the influence of this system of worldview had such different, conflicting characteristics and human qualities. For example, angry, threatening, intimidating, making a contract with selected people, an arose bewilderment of believers, and their inconvenient questions to the priests. God is one. But why did the system resort to such measures, having transformed multiple images of El and his elite into different qualities of one God? After all, the concept of one God is a concept from the primordial spiritual knowledge. Because in those days, knowledge began to be renewed, thanks to the prophets who preached about one God, and who came to this world to counterbalance the activation of the system. The primordial knowledge of one God had a big resonance among people. However, the prophets came and left, while the system remained in the minds of generations that lived by consciousness. Therefore, the primordial knowledge introduced by the prophets was distorted and replaced by the priests of the dominant religions at the time. They endowed one God 
with the qualities of their multiple mortal gods from the past, such as anger, hatred, rancor, and so on. And they did everything to make people fear God, but not to love Him, to bring Him gifts and offerings, but not to serve Him. Interesting facts. Do you know such concept as the triad, the Council of Seven, a personality, a soul, the invisible world? All these concepts were known in Babylonia, the successor of the Sumerian civilization. The triad, the Council of Seven. For understanding, at the time, the general structure of the pantheon of the gods, which was delineated during the period of the slave-owning Sumer, remains without major changes during the whole period of antiquity, including the Old Babylonian period. That is, at the head of the whole world, there was the triad, the supreme god Anu, Enlil, and Ea. They are surrounded by the Council of Seven, in other cases of twelve great gods, determining lots, shim to, of everything in the world. All gods are divided into two clans, into two generic groups, Igigi and Anunnaki. On the reliefs and seals of that time, there are often scenes depicting how the deity patron leads a human to the supreme god to determine his fate and to receive a blessing. It was believed that with the loss of his guardian deity, a person became defenseless against the evil willfulness of the great gods, and he could easily be attacked by evil demons. These are the accent echoes of the time of ruling of Fel and his elite in Atlantis, which will be clearly demonstrated a bit later in the story about Olympus. Personality, soul, the invisible world. There were echoes of the primordial knowledge also in Babylonia. And this is evidenced by the fact that in 2nd, 1st millennia BC, inhabitants of this country knew about personality as a spirit. The bearer of a human personality was called Lamasso, while human vital forces were called Shadow. While understanding of soul, Napishtu, meant something impersonal, priests identified it sometimes with breath, sometimes with blood, meaning that which connected a person directly with one God. Priests following directives of their consciousness replaced by material concepts, meaning according to understanding by the system itself. At that time, it was also known of the invisible world, ghosts and bitter shadows of the dead not receiving sacrifices, all kinds of spirits of the underworld, Utuki, Asaki, Lemuti, evil demons, night spirits in Kubilelu, visiting women, Sukubilelith, Lelitu, possessing men, and others. Mo, secret powers. Mo is one of important theological Sumerian concepts. Today it is often translated as Me, to indicate something that means secret powers, divine essences. For example, there is a myth dedicated to the theft of Enki's Me by Nana. It's not clear when the translation of Mo changed into Me and who was interested in that. In fact, in the primordial knowledge, one of the names of Allah was Mo. Once among peoples in the late period of the epoch of the human civilization revival, to which the Sumerians belonged to, there were words that reached the Slavonic language as well and are still used today. It is Mosh, Moch, Mayo, and so on. The Sumerians generally had more of O in the speech. In their language, two important concepts have been preserved since olden times. Mo in the notion of Allah and Do as a concept of anti alat Therefore, many names were associated with these words and denoted spiritual powers, powers opposing them. However, while the Sumerian language later on became dead, in the Slavonic language there are still echoes of important concepts since olden times. Do, in the designation of the earthly anti alat action, is used to this day in such expressions, for example, as 
before. For how long would you contradict me? From here to there. Road and so on. Generally speaking, the Slavonic language is one of the few languages which have preserved echoes of the common proto-language of ancient antiquity that was known to peoples living on different continents. It was believed that the mighty powers of Mo, the driving force of the world development, were possessed by humans, peoples, cities, temples. But these mysterious powers could abandon their possessor. Cult objects were also endowed with them in which these powers kept their invisible properties for some time. Sumerian ideas of Mo evolved into Akkadian ideas about the Tablet of Destinies, the determined movement of the world and world events. Moreover, it was emphasized that possession of these tablets provided a confirmed world domination. In ancient times, it was believed that possession of the knowledge of Mo was very significant. Similar to possession of a nuclear briefcase by the world power ruler in the modern world. According to the poem Enuma Elish, goddess Tiamat, Enlil, Marduk and other gods possessed these tablets of destinies. Enuma Elish, the lordship of El and the elite. As of today, experts, Sumerologists, admit the fact that they still don't know the Sumerian language well enough. And there is a problem of an elementary lack of understanding of ancient monuments of both Sumerian and Babylonian texts. In many cases, they are forced to leave gaps, question marks, or to be satisfied only with a common understanding of some part of the text, often relying merely on their intuition and on that understanding which this civilization has enabled them to acquire through the education provided to them. It is curious how today the title and the first words of the Babylonian epic poem Enuma Elish are being translated for the public, actively focusing attention on the fact that the most likely, it means when on high, putting forward, different versions of interpretation of words on the basis of this hypothesis. This kind of covering up the truth is simply beneficial to someone. However, for the initiated ones, it is the rule of El and his elite, whereas for the rest, it is when on high. And the first line of the epic for them sounds like this, before the rule of El and his elite. To write at the beginning of the sacred text before, it was a standard technique in ancient literature as a designation of anti -alat. For example, before there were those and those gods, before there was heaven and earth, before a human was created, there was something initial. That is, before there was something in the meaning of anti -alat. There was a lot from the spiritual world, from the world of one God, which gave rise to the whole before, that is, anti lot, and the material world manifested itself. So the one who is more aware of the true history of times, that one understands which story this peculiar Bible of Babylon is talking about, and why ancient priests put these words first, and how later on they translated these for peoples copying from these texts. The Unknown Known Knowledge The island of the immortals, a miss of archons of the ancient Hellens and of Hebrew priests. Today, legends of archons of the ancient Hellenes, as well as of Hebrew priests, about the country of El and his island of the immortals, are most well known to new generations and are promoted all over the world. By knowing the primordial, one can easily see what has been calculated for the sake of domination and world power in the common spiritual heritage of peoples, with distortion of its essence and meaning. Do you think that you haven't heard about the country of El, but you don't even know that today you live as a slave under his aegis? Think about it. Even if you are an atheist, 
From where, since childhood, you have had the image of God as an old man with beard, sitting on a throne? Why, since childhood, have you had a desire to possess magic objects and be like a belligerent hero from a fairy tale? Why are you attracted by the secret desire to join the immortals and live in paradise precisely in a material body? Why are your aspirations in this world aimed at becoming a selected mortal god, meaning a part of the elite? How strong is L today in your minds? Elite. The servants of El. Those who pledge to God El. Those who render service to God El. Elysium. Elisha. El. In legends of archons of the ancient Hellenes, who drew their knowledge from ancient priests of the East, the country of El is mentioned under different names. In addition to Atlantis, the most famous names are Elysium, or the Elysian Fields, and also Olympus. Elysium, in ancient mythology, is the earthly paradise located on the western end of the Earth in the form of an island where those selected by God El lived their lives, whereas heroes and righteous people resided there only after death and only in the form of a shadow. It's a country of pleasures and delights, which was mentioned by the ancient Hellenic poets Homer and Hesiod. Homer mentions that Elysium is situated at the very edge of the earth, near the banks of the river Oceanus. Elysium played its role in imaginative conceptions of more than one generation of people who adopted from these legends a false idea of the godly paradise as a special place precisely on earth where the selected ones supposedly live in immortal bodies. What does the word Elysium mean? Elysium, or Elysian fields, is translated from Greek as the field of dwelling, the dwelling land of God El. Known from the Bible, the ancient Hebrew name Elisha, Elise, Elis, from which the name the Elysian fields originated, as we already know, occurs in the 2nd millennium BC on the cuneiform tablets of the Akkadian and Babylonian epic written by the means of the Sumerian cuneiform script. It is interesting that the word El is usually translated as God, Might, Power, the one who is above, while Ish means human. And the word Elisheva means a person who pledges to God. Moreover, the noun Shavu, oath, has the same root as the numeral Sheva, seven. An interesting chain is revealed. The seven first mythical sages of Eridu, the city of the first kings of the Sumerian civilization, the seven first sages in the ancient city of Athens, who played a leading role in the history of Hellas, the seven pledging to God El, Generally speaking, it should be noted that in ancient times in the Middle East, the concept of a contract, covenant, and its various types was rather widespread. Between people, between kings, between kings and their subjects. One of such covenants meant a solemn, unilateral promise, a kind of an oath, when one of the parties undertook to execute certain actions. A special type of contract was a covenant concluded between God and a human being. It resembled a treaty on granting rights by a ruler to his subjects. It is interesting that the term Old Testament is a calc from the ancient Greek, which literally means former contract, the one that was before. L. As of today, the most well-known references to the ancient supreme deity, the progenitor named El, are also preserved in mythology of the peoples that inhabited Syria, Palestine, and Phoenicia from 4th, 3rd millennia BC. 
Different ancient peoples called El in different ways. For instance, one of the known names of god El is Il, Ilu, Ilim, Elim. In the Hellenistic period, El, Ilu, was identified with Zeus. In addition, he had different epithets by which he was revered by different peoples at other times. For example, in Syria and later on in the Roman Empire, he was revered as Elagabalus, meaning El of the Mountain, Heliogabalus, the Son of the Mountains, or for instance, such epithets of El as El Olam, meaning God the Everlasting One, El Elyon, meaning God Most High, are among the oldest names included in the Tanakh, the Bible of Judaism. It is interesting that the local god of Jerusalem, El Elyon, was revered as the highest god, the creator of heaven and earth, and the lord of the land, access to which was granted by him only on the condition of bringing tithes. El was first and foremost revered as a symbol of supreme power. He was considered the ruler of the world, the father of gods and people, sending down posterity to people, the king of the years, the lord of immortality. He was portrayed as a bearded old man, in long clothes and a tall tiara with horns. El was depicted as accepting a sacrifice and blessing the sacrificer, and also in the image of a bull. Legends say that El lives near the source of the river, near the source of both oceans. He has the counsel of all gods, his children. The gods act only with El's permission. The Ugarit list of gods mentions also El's father, whom El later on overthrows for the sake of his own power. But gradually, El himself loses this power too. In the first millennium BC, in the Judaic pre-Judaism pantheon, the image of El merges with the image of Yahweh, Yovo. He was widely revered in Phoenicia. In other tribes, Yahweh is revered as El's son. El's image as a symbol of power, the supreme deity who heads the Council of Gods, is preserved in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there are such words. God standeth in the assembly of gods. He judgeth among gods. In Hebrew, they sound like this. Mizmor le'asaf. Elohim nitzav bahadat el bekerev Elohim ishpot. Moreover, Elohim is one of the names of Yahweh in the Old Testament in the plural. That is, it means not God Yahweh, but God's Yahweh. In the beginning, gods created heaven and earth. In Hebrew, in place of the word God, there stands Elohim. The word Elohim is found almost 2,000 times in the Bible and originates from the pan-Semitic root El. El is also the ancient name of God in the Bible of Judaism, Tanakh. It's a collection of texts included in the Christian Bible. In the Slavic Bible, it is traditionally translated by the word God in the meaning of being strong, powerful, at the top. Interesting facts. Fact 1. El is still regarded as a patron of not only the ancient cities. El can also be found in the names of geographical places, ancient architectural and temple buildings, El already appears not only in the designations of modern names, but also in the names of entire peoples who don't even know about the true history. Why it is exactly this way rather than otherwise that in the lobbies of kings and their rulers an urgent decision is made about such renaming? And who sponsors such initiatives? And why? For example, let's take the history of ancient Greece. Since the second millennium BC, Tribes of the Achaeans, the Achaeus, along with the Ionians, Dorians, and Aeolians, were among the main ancient Greek tribes. However, in the 7th century BC, the Archons decided to give the common name Hellenes 
to their subordinate tribes residing in the certain territories and Hellas to the country. That's how it is still called. Whereas for the people, the reason for introduction of such name was suggested with a reference to myths that were also written by the Archons. But the question is, whose history was written by the Archons themselves? Fact 2. A Babbara. The White House. The White House is a well-known name. But why is the residence of rulers in different countries called precisely this way? Back in the 3rd millennium BC, in ancient Mesopotamia, in the influential cities of that time, Sippar and Alasar, Larsa, there were two temples. The object of special concerns for Babylonian, Assyrian and Chaldean kings. Thus, in both cities, these temples were called Ababara, the White House or the Brilliant House. For example, in Sippar, the White House consisted of 300 rooms and premises, among which there were dwellings of priests and royal chambers. White houses were dedicated to the Akkadian god Shamash, who was the grandson of God Enlil. God Shamash was revered mainly as a god who established laws and watched their fulfillment. He was considered a bearer of light and prosperity, liberated prisoners and even raised people from the dead. This god was portrayed as an old man with a long beard who is sitting on a throne. Aren't these images familiar to your consciousness? Fact 3 Selected by L It is interesting that today the word elite in different languages of the peoples of Europe has the same meaning, the selected one, and it is written almost identically, elite. Wir sind die Elite, so einer neuen Elite. Fear some of the global elite. Our elite. Free elite. elite. Your elite. elite. Controlled by the elite. The elite. The elite of the elite in Mario Kart. The elite. We are elite. Maria elite Simon. Elite single. Elite. Elite pro We're the elitist of the elite. Papa. Oh, hey now. The term elite appeared since the 12th century in French and since the 14th century in English, in the meaning to elect, to choose for service. That is, to select a servant to whom a subordinate group is assigned. In European languages, the word elite was widely spread by the end of the 19th century. It was brought into general use between 1930s and 1940s. Today, it is said that the ideas that later on served as a basis for creation of the elite theory, namely selection for the ruling circles, upbringing and education of potential leaders, among others, were developed by the descendant of the Archon Salon, the ancient Hellenic philosopher Plato. That very same Plato, who exactly mentioned the ancient legend of the Atlantis. But what was his ideology? and ideology of those whose will he implemented in his works based on. Old New Ideology The Iliad, the Odyssey The Iliad, the Odyssey are ancient Greek epic poems attributed to the unknown poet named Homer. Until now, these works are extolled for new generations as unsurpassed literary masterpieces, monuments of world significance. But what is their essence? Homeric epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, have similarities with the Babylonian epic Enuma Elish, as well as with He Who Saw Everything about the hero Gilgamesh and other legends of the Sumerian and Babylonian literature. The names of the main gods have been changed 
but the keynote concealed in these stories about the epic of the Trojan War and the wanderings of the leading characters comes down to one thing. The last word in the fate of the hero or peoples rests with the Council of Gods, headed by the main human-like god to whom all human qualities and vices are characteristic. In fact, it is not just a monument of the past. It is an inculcation in the human consciousness of the Atlantean ideology, the history of life of gods sitting on the mountain of immortality, Olympus. The Iliad tells about the participants of the Trojan War. The key moments is that all gods of Olympus participated in it. Moreover, not the gods themselves participated, but they gathered a council and decided, headed by Zeus, how the course of events will exactly evolve, who is destined to lose and perish, even if luck was on the side of certain heroes or peoples. Generally speaking, it was like playing chess with oneself. That is, the game of gods was shown, while the listener's consciousness was immersed in emotions of the fights and strife of the heroes, their conflict relations. Speaking in modern terminology, this is a thriller that ends tragically for the characters, where the leading hero whose example in theory should be followed by people commits suicide. And again, the idea is asserted that immortality is the destiny of gods, but not of people. The Odyssey also tells about the wanderings of the main hero Odysseus, who miraculously survived the Trojan War about his meeting with various peoples, monsters, with phenomena of the invisible world, and magic. However, the keynote of the work remains the same. The gods gathered the council and decided on the fate of Odysseus, and then ruled the hero in his wanderings as a puppet. As a result, with the hero's hands, the undesired ones were destroyed, and the obedient ones were rewarded, and the last word rests with gods. Just like in case of the Sumerians, the text was intended for easy memorization and perception by primary consciousness, that is, for the level of perception of a six-year-old child. Heroes or actions were associated with the moments encountered by a person in everyday life, and this served as an additional reminder of the plot. Just like in the case of Sumerians, these works were addressed specifically to listeners, not to thinking readers, with the purpose of provoking collective emotions. It was assumed that the listener knew the backstory, so the emphasis was made precisely on affecting the listener emotionally. Moreover, as an introduction to such declamations were used the Homeric hymns, containing appeals to different gods. Poems were created by the same technique as the Sumerians had. During a quick emotional recitation, like through music perception, the public's attention is focused on the plot and its development. Such a peculiar ancient rap rock concert. The result is a state of collective excitation of the animal nature in the public. Simply put, a collective egregore was generated. People were emotionally infected with thoughts about the plot and they themselves became active bearers and distributors of the history about the gods and Olympus among common people. Just like in the case of the Sumerians, when they were preparing their ancient journalists, special people were also being prepared here for promotion. As it has already been mentioned, since the 6th century BC, there were people who, at the legislative level, had the right to publicly recite Homer's poems the so-called Sons of Homer, Rhapsodes. But who gave birth to the image of Homer himself? So to say, whose son was Homer? What a Homer! Why exactly Homer? Several interesting facts have been preserved in the history. Fact 1. In the first millennium BC, 
especially between the 10th and the 7th centuries BC, events took place that subsequently influenced the change of the worldview of not only peoples of the East, but also of the West, and reflected on the worldview of modern people. Precisely in those times, the Babylonian epic poem Enuma Elish was popular and continued to be translated into different languages. The ancient Hebrew Bible Tanakh appeared, which later on formed the basis of the Bible's Old Testament. The epic poem of Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey was being composed. It is interesting that God and Lil was known to the ancient Hellenes owing to the Babylonian translations under the name Elinos. And the word Eliada, the Jewish Eliada, is translated from the Hebrew as whom God El knows, or El knew, recognized. And Lilship, and Lil, Elinos. Eliada, the Iliad. Fact 2. In the Bible, precisely in the Old Testament, there is a mention of the descendants of Noah, the men who survived the flood, according to ancient Oriental stories. Noah had three sons. The eldest of them was named Japheth. Japheth had seven sons. One of them was Homer, and the other was Javan while one of the sons of Javan was Eliseus, Jewish Elisha. It is they who are considered to be the ancestors of the Hellenes, the ancient Greeks. Fact 3. According to the Greek legends, it is precisely Helen, the grandson of the Prometheus, in another version, the son of Zeus, who is the progenitor of the Hellenes, while his sons and grandsons are eponyms of the main Greek tribes. Why exactly Mount Olympus? The name of Olympus is of pre-Greek origin. In the legend, Mount Olympus was considered to be sacred and became the abode of the Hellenic gods and the center of mythological stories. Few people know that Mount Olympus got its name from the word El Olam. In fact, it's an expression known since ancient times meaning the same as the Sumerian, the immortal Els mountain. Until now, in scientific studies or literature of the past, there is the so-called Homeric question. The learned men still argue when, where, by whom, and for whom were these poems composed. Consciousness, as always, draws attention away from the main question to trifles that is, not global causes of origin, spreading around the world and the effects of these works on the mind of entire epochs and generations are highlighted. But the dispute boils down to the point who wrote them, one person or a collective of co-authors. And this dispute is traditional, but not focused on the essence. Organized criticism began from the 6th century BC as another way of promotion and drawing attention to the works. Later on, it was organized by means of such authorities as the same Plato, who criticized Homer. He, so to speak, led those who were against in order to manipulate their opinion in the right direction. And Aristotle, who praised Homer's works and accordingly led those who supported it. Basically, like in the game of adults, good cop, bad cop. Which is fine, except for the fact that it was the same team Plato was Aristotle's teacher, the team that fulfilled the wishes of sponsors, who pursued the goal of seizing power and restoring their former world domination. Those sponsors who knew how human consciousness worked and how to activate it. It was not by chance that Aristotle became the teacher of the 13-year-old Alexander the Great, a future creator of the world power who was inculcated with a new worldview through love to the Homer's Iliad, and to such extent that subsequently this conqueror of nations will keep this version of the Iliad compiled by Aristotle under his pillow along with his dagger. It is known that Alexander the Great always carried a volume of the Iliad with him in a golden box. As it is written in the game of gods by the plot of the Iliad, the gods quickly create a hero, use him, and then he dies by the gods' will. And his name is used in subsequent propaganda. Nowadays, everyone knows the name of Alexander the Great, but who feels better because of that? 
the military campaigns of Alexander the Great contributed to dissemination of Hellenist foundations to the East. And this trend was also popularized among peoples. In the Middle Ages, one of the most popular books in several regions of Asia and Africa, as well as in Europe, was the Romance of Alexander, where the biography of the leading character was reinforced with fictional episodes. In the era of Baroque, Alexander the Great became a popular character in theater and painting. The spreading of Archon's worldview is still going on by all means that are available for them. But what is its nature from within? Olympus. Hellenic mythology is called the Olympian mythology. But to what extent do these ancient myths correspond to the memory of life history of the antediluvian, highly developed technogenic society under the tyranny of Elder Omnipotent? The history of civilization, which is known today as Atlantis, may be understood only now, in the era of a sharp increase in the development of new technologies. Olympus, the mountain of God El. As legends say, Mount Olympus is a symbol of supreme power. It's the place where the Earth merges with the sky, and where the sky turns into the subtle, fiery ether. There is neither rain nor snow there. There is eternal summer. On the Olympus, there are palaces of Zeus and other gods, built and decorated by Zeus' son, Hephaestus. Mountains open and close the gates of Olympus, when the gods drive out in golden chariots. And Lilship, Panhellenic ruler, El, the Pentacrator of the world. Zeus, D, acts as a Pentacrator of the world order, as well as a punitive force, an example of the Pentacrator of the world, and the ruler of the world destinies, the King of Kings, the Panhellenic Pentacrator. He belongs to the third generation of gods, which overthrew the second generation, the Titans. Zeus reigns on Mount Olympus, commands nature, and rules the destinies of people. People originate from the ashes of Titans burned by Zeus. People subsequently bear the Titanic and the Dionysian that is coming from Zeus' origins. The Dictation of Consciousness – How El Seized Power how did Zeus seize power at Olympus? A standard algorithm for operation of consciousness as part of the animal mind system is introduced in the story of Zeus, similarly to the story of the Babylonian Marduk, in the form of a model for mass imitation by new generations. Thus, Zeus overthrew the previous generation of gods, his father Kronos and the Titans, gained supreme power over gods and people, fought for power with his closest relatives, gave birth to children and made them gods, introduced a new law, order, norms of morality, sciences, arts, created his elite, the gods of a new type, created executors of his will, who conveyed his decisions to rulers and heroes in human society. Isn't it familiar story of the Sumerian Enlil and the Babylonian Marduk? Isn't it a familiar story of the formation of power and the reign of that very Alexander the Great, to whom a taste for the Iliad was inculcated since youth? And not only this. Moreover, from the very beginning this model is introduced by descendants of the Atlanteans with substitutions about the spiritual meaning of God for people. It's introduced in such a way that people understand that the Supreme God is the same as people with animal passions, as though any alternative of peaceful coexistence of society is not possible. After all, the omnipotent God himself supposedly acts the same way. Why is there, in the minds of modern people, an image of God as of a man with beard sitting on a throne. Who benefits from that? The system doesn't understand what real spiritual life is. That's why the dictatorship of consciousness over personality generates the corresponding images prescribed in the algorithm of the system dictate over people. A human named El, who proclaimed himself God. Zeus and the gods of Olympus have a human look. 
they are characterized by all human passions, emotions, and amusements. They get married numerous times, live idly and carelessly. The gods feast in their golden palaces. The wife of Zeus is Hera, the golden-haired Apollo with his sister Artemis, the golden Aphrodite, the mighty daughter of Zeus, Athena, and many other gods. The daughter of Zeus, the young Hebe, and the son of the king of Troy, Ganymede, Zeus' favorite who received immortality from him, bring them food that makes them immortal, ambrosia and nectar, the food and drink of the gods. The gods resolve all matters at these feasts. There they determine the destiny of the world and people. High technologies of antediluvian civilization, immortality in the body for those selected by El, prolongation of life beyond the species limit. Different peoples have preserved legends about the past, in which there is interesting information regarding the achievements of science in the antediluvian civilization. In the field of medicine, it is prolongation of life beyond the species limit, meaning significant longevity of people of the time, as well as possession of medical technologies of body rejuvenation. These legends are related to the drinks and food of the immortal gods. Ambrosia, Soma, Amrita in old Indian stories, rejuvenating apples in the stories of peoples of the West, peaches in Chinese legends. For the Sumerians, these are technologies which look like cedar cones in the images of the time. They are produced in a special place, a cedar forest where a god Enlil has set his personal guard. But if we summarize these mentions of different peoples about the same technology that makes people long livers, we can understand the following. There existed a laboratory for the production of this remedy, food of the gods, which was situated on a separate mountain island and thoroughly protected by the order of the supreme ruler of gods, the lord of air and sky. In myths it is called differently. The Garden of the Hesperides, a minor blotch, the island of apples in the land of eternal youth, the magic apple isles, Insula Avalonis, Mount Mujavat, etc. The island itself was situated on the edge of the world near the banks of the river Oceanus. Keepers of the golden apples of eternal youth were several women. For example, in the ancient Greek legends, those were the nymphs Hesperides, daughters of the Titan Atlas. At that, the garden itself was guarded by an object that tried to destroy everyone who came to steal these apples. And as a rule, those were mortal people, heroes who performed their exploits or hunted for the secret of immortality or of long life. For example, the ancient Greek Heracles, the Sumerian Gilgamesh, the ancient Indian king of birds Garuda, and others. For the Hellenes, it was the guard of the place with the fruits of immortality, the hundred-headed dragon Ladon. For the Sumerians, in the legend Gilgamesh and the Immortal One's Mountain, it was Huwawa, a multi-legged and multi-armed creature surrounded by the striking magic race of Radiance the spirit of the tree on which these wonderful apples grew. In ancient Greek legends, it is mentioned that the goddess Gaia presented this tree to Zeus' wife Hera on the day of her wedding, while Gaia herself was the keeper of ancient wisdom, the oldest pre-Olympian deity, thanks to whom the first generation of gods, titans, other creatures and natural phenomena emerged. However, ancient Indian legends left a more detailed technical description of the place where the main secret of immortality of the god of air and sky Indra was kept. In the legends, which describe how the bird hero was still in the Amrita, having assumed a golden body bright as the rays of the sun, it is said that he entered there, like a torrent entering the ocean. Near the Amrita, there was a wheel of steel, keen-edged and sharp as the razor, revolving incessantly. And that mighty instrument of fearsome and terrible looks, shining with a fiery rays, had been artfully devised by the gods to destroy all robbers of the Soma. Having bypassed that wheel, he had to defeat two snakes guarding the Amrita. Of the radiancy of blazing fire, of terrible looks 
with tongues, bright as the lightning flashes, with mouth emitting fire, possessing great energy, always in anger and of great activity. Their blazing eyes contained poison. They were ceaselessly inflamed with rage and were also wingless. He who may be seen by even one of the two would instantly be reduced to ashes. There was a constant fight and strife between gods for these apples of eternal youth. Hence the name, the Apple of Discord, arose. Interesting details have been preserved in German and Scandinavian myths about the goddess of eternal youth Idun, who was allowed to collect these wonderful fruits for the gods. The rejuvenating apples, thanks to which gods preserved eternal youth, had one feature. Their effect lasted 40 days. And if there was no further consumption of these wonderful apples, this loss immediately made gods old. Their eyes became misty, their skin hung loose, their minds started to soften, and a threat of death hanged over them. Why was this happening? And the point here is not the mistakes of science. After all, prolongation of life beyond the species limit is also possible without consequences. It's all about the total control by L of his elite. L carried out such control every 40 days. Therefore, once in 40 days, all the gods gathered at a feast, where those who pleased L received this medicine, prolonging life for another 40 days. And if anyone decided to disobey L and became self-willed, he simply, wherever he was, quickly got old and died. That's why everyone implicitly obeyed L in order to live. The mortal, immortal gods. But were these so-called gods really immortal? No. For instance, in ancient Greek legends, it is said, fate rules over mortals and gods. Even the fate of Zeus himself is in the hands of the relentless goddesses of fate, Moirai, who spin the life thread of a person, determining the term of his life. Once the thread breaks, life will end. Medical rejuvenation technologies. And what has gotten to possession of the elite? from the epoch of grandiose scientific discoveries in the field of rejuvenating medicine, only cosmetic treatments. In the myths, it is mentioned that gods could control beauty and transform other people at their will by means of certain technical objects, which are called magic objects in the legends. For example, Homer describes that goddess Athena made Odysseus higher, more handsome, and curl his hair with a single touch of her magic wand. Athena also transformed Penelope on the eve of a meeting with her husband. She made her taller, wider, and powered in her the ambrosia ointment that Aphrodite herself used. Intercontinental flights The myths of people of the world mention flights of gods, kings, and their messengers on high-speed means of transport through the air which often looked like a bird. Thus, for instance, the king Etana rode an eagle up to gods and then returned to his city to continue the reign. Iris, who delivered messengers of the Olympian gods and carried out their orders, had iridescent light winds that transferred her faster than thought in the blink of an eye, bringing her to the most distant lands. In Chinese legends, it is mentioned that the special feature of life of Xi'an is their constant flights on cranes. Xi'an He, crane of the immortals, the ability to race on clouds, to ride flying dragons, that in their country of immortality, they flew from one mountain to another and wandered beyond the four seas. In ancient Mesopotamia, the eagle is indicated as a symbol of the war deity, the Sumerian Ningirsu and Lil Sun. In the legends of ancient India, it is mentioned that gods were riding heavenly chariots, rapidly overcoming great distances. As for information technology, there is a mention of an ability to operate and use holographic images and transmit them at a distance. 
The gods of Olympus supposedly could assume different shapes. Zeus himself often assumed the images of clouds, rain, a bull, or an eagle when visiting various places. The image of a bull was also assumed by Marduk and Enlil. Construction technology Construction technology is also mentioned in the legend of Zeus, son Zephyrus, and his twin brother Amphion. During the construction of the walls of the Thebes city, Zephyrus carried and piled stones, while Amphion, with mere lyre playing, caused them to move and made them fit into a specified place. Magic objects there are clear signs of the use of various technical objects. Thus, for example, Hermes, one of the representatives of the elite of Olympus, the son of Zeus and Maya, one of the daughters of Atlas, who was a mediator between people and gods, the patron of magic, trade, and heralds, had winged sandals, Talarius, giving him an ability to rise in the air and move at a great speed. He also had a magic staff, Caduceus, which made people fall asleep or wake up. It was used to convey the will of gods to mortal people, and most often it was done in a dream, when a person was sleeping. Hermes handed out magic objects to heroes. He knew the secrets of Hades, covered and accessible only to the initiated ones. Wind's control. In ancient Greek legends, there is a mention of the Lord of the Winds, Aeolus, the king of the floating island of Aeolia. According to the Odyssey by Homer, the main character, while being Aeolus' guest, received from him a leather bag as a gift, in which the winds were sown, with a strict order not to open it. But when Odysseus continued his journey on the ship, his companions accidentally opened the bag. The winds, having escaped from there, led the ship away from its destination track and drove the ship back to the island of Aeolia, where Odysseus was already denied hospitality. The legend of a leather bag with the winds contained in it is also found in other mythologies. A high-speed ship with an autopilot system is also mentioned in the legends of Odysseus. It is mentioned that the ships of that very Odysseus were equipped with communication devices. A piece of Dedanian oak was fixed on the bow of the ship, thanks to which the ship itself gave prophecies and declared the will of Zeus to the Argonauts. How El gave out allotments to his adult children the legends about the gods of Olympus, as well as the legends about the gods of the Sumerian and Akkadian pantheon, and the legends of other peoples of the East have preserved a variety of references on how El gave out allotments, lands on different continents with peoples inhabiting them, to his children whom he declared gods. The names of cities, tribes, localities, mountains, seas, calendar months, and so on, originated from the names of these gods. For example, in the legends about the gods of Olympus, it is mentioned that one of the beloved names of Zeus, who bore him Hermes, was called Maya. From the name Maya, the name of the month of May is derived. She was offered sacrifices on the 1st of May. It is curious that up to now the 1st of May is officially celebrated as a holiday in many countries, although the names of the holiday itself and the reasons for this memorable date are different. Entertainment of the Children Gods Just like in the legends of Sumer, in the legends about Olympus, there were mentions of how these gods, else children, had fun, including fulfillment of their selfish evil whims, starting from renaming of peoples, sowing discord among peoples, disputes among themselves for the territory of prosperous cities, and punishment of people for any of their choices in favor of one or another arguing god, forcing people to pray to them, and up to their orgies and murders of people, which was a usual entertainment of the gods. Thus, for example, in the Olympian mythology, there is a legend about the fate of the family of Niobe, the daughter of Tantalus, the wife of the Theban king. Niobe had seven sons and seven daughters, beautiful like gods. 
once she didn't attend a prayer service and a sacrificial offering to the goddess of the Olympus, the daughter of the Titans, Leto, and her twin children, Apollo and Artemis, as women of this city used to do, praying to them as gods. Niobe had the imprudence to boast of the number of her children compared to Leto. After all, Leto had only two children, moreover, illegitimate ones from Zeus, Apollo and Artemis, and was persecuted for this by the wife of Zeus, Hera. Leto found out what the wife of the Theban king had said about her, became angry and complained to her children, who resided on Olympus. Apollo and Artemis immediately rushed and killed with their arrows all Niobe's children. The whole family died in an instant, and her husband, when he found out about the death of his children, committed suicide. Because of grief, Niobe turned into a stone, with a powering source, her tears. Even in the form of a stone, Niobe didn't stop feeling her sorrow, mourning her children. That's how the gods entertained themselves. It is interesting that nowadays the first day of summer is celebrated in many countries as holiday, the International Children's Day. The only question is in honor of whose children the holiday on the first day of summer was named. Today many people know the name Leto, that is, the killer of children, but not Niobe, the mother who lost her children and her entire family. Games of Gods Entertainment of Zeus On the Olympus there prevailed envy, rage, anger, revenge, constant conflicts and quarrels, sorting out who is better, who has greater influence among the elite of the gods, and who is more powerful and glorious among mortal people. As they say, the fish rose from the head. How did Zeus entertain himself? The legends of the gods of Olympus mention the following. Zeus destroys the race of Atlanteans who forgot about worship of the gods. Zeus destroyed the human race several times, trying to create a perfect human, because his desire was to destroy the miserable kind of people and to plant a new one. Zeus sends curses, which are terribly implemented, on certain heroes and a number of generations of people, legends of Tantalus, Sisyphus, Atreides, Cadmites. By the order of Zeus, Prometheus was chained to the rock for stealing the spark of the Hephaestus fire to help people doomed by Zeus to a miserable fate. In honor of Zeus, the Panhellenic Olympic Games were held in Olympia. Trojan War Zeus disposes of heroes. One of the central topics of Homer's Iliad is the Trojan War. The ancient writers explain the origin of the Trojan War as the will of Zeus, who wished to reduce the Earth's burden. Not only Zeus contributed to the emergence of the Trojan War, but the war itself was also a consequence of Zeus' decision to punish people for their wickedness. It all began with pride and strife. According to Zeus' will, the events leading to long-lasting war have developed. And games of God started. Chess games began to be played out. If you carefully trace the history of various wars of humanity, reigning from the Sumerians to this day, you can see that the severest wars in human history were played out identically. Large troops were gathered from the warring parties. The Achaean army included the noblest heroes. Odysseus, Achilles, both Ajaxes, Diomedes and many others. Agamemnon, as the most powerful of the Achaean kings, was elected the leader of their whole army. He was fabulously wealthy and had an eminent position among the Hellenic kings. The Achaean fleet, which was assembled in the harbor, contained over a thousand ships. Before the decisive battles, plague was sent upon the troops. After long wars and conquest of Troy, not only the population of that area and its defenders were killed, but the victorious heroes were also destroyed. The quarrels immediately arose in the camp of the Achaeans. 
By the will of the gods, a lot of ships, deceived by the false signal of Nauplius, perished of the waves and wind during the terrible storm, while others crashed upon coastal rocks. Even the surviving troop commander Agamemnon, the commander of the troops who got wealth and loot from the war, was immediately killed on his return home as a victim of conspiracy of his wife Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. The Zeus entourage knew in advance of the heroes who were destined to die in this war. That is, their fate had been predetermined. A bright example is Achilles, who was later on a role model for Alexander the Great. Achilles' Hill The sea goddess Thetis, knowing that her son Achilles, while he was the youngest of the generation of heroes, the future participants of the Trojan War, was destined to die, tried to hide him. However, eventually, they still didn't save the hero, who was considered to be invulnerable. He was found, returned to the Trojan War, and killed. He died from two arrows of Paris, guided by the hand of Apollo. The expression Achilles heal for the elite was an example that is enough to hit a hero into a vulnerable spot to kill him. While for me immortals, Achilles' way of life was instilled as a behavior model for new generations of mortal heroes, where a hero had to know that he was destined to live a short life, and he had to strive to live it so that the glory of his unprecedented bravery would last among descendants for centuries. Hero. The etymology of the ancient Hellenic word hero is interesting. By the word hero, the ancient Greeks originally called the spirit of the dead, which influenced the living ones, that is, a subpersonality. Heroes were the souls of outstanding ancestors, leaders. Later on, the concept expanded, and some people born from the union of the gods with mortals began to be categorized as heroes. In the poems such as the Iliad, heroes were considered to be benefactors of people, slayers of monsters and giant robbers. But there was one point – the main heroes were often doomed to death by the will of gods or committed suicide. And as a rule, in honor of the day of their death, general sports games were held with lighting of torch. Hence, the tradition of the Olympic Games in ancient Greece emerged. The same story can be traced in the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, where gods decide on the death of the hero, having refused immortality to him. They announce through their messenger that he will have a remarkable after-death fate, and a monument will be erected to him. Moreover, every summer, in the month of Nenejar, athletic competition in his honor will take place near his statue. The gods reminded to Gilgamesh that he had been born for long-term kinship, but he wasn't promised eternal life. They advised him to accept his lot and hurry to his ancestors. That is, the cult of a deceased heroes was intentionally cultivated. The life of one hero was not enough to fulfill all plans of the gods' elite. Therefore, the idea of suffering of a heroic personality an endless overcoming of trials and difficulties is strengthened in the myths. The hero often experiences painful death. The self-immolation of Heracles dies by the hand of a deceitful villain. Theseus, by the will of a hostile deity, Orpheus, Hippolytus. As a result, the image of Heracles stays on Olympus, while his shadow wanders in Hades. And that the hero's exploits and sufferings are regarded as a kind of trial, the reward for which comes after death. Priests were looking for a formula by which people will live all their lives in expectation of immortality, not working spiritually in themselves, but wasting their lives on strengthening the power of priests and leaders. That's where the substitutions came from, that a human can meet God only after death, but not unite with Him during lifetime by working spiritually in oneself, meaning it's a false hope promises from the system for later times. Millennia passed, 
And the same game was being imposed on the human society, all the same division into gods, heroes and savages, as the Sumerians had, except for these concepts were increasingly embedded into the minds of new generations as the only form of existence of a human being, which supposedly his or her freedom and life goal consisted in. But in fact, there was an enslavement of humankind by the system and concentration of attention on the consciousness dictate. Etymology of the ancient Greek word tragedy. In the ancient Greek language, the word tragos means goad. Ode, son. Thus, the word tragodia literally meant the son of goats. As it is known, tragedy as a theatrical entertainment for the elite audience was born in ancient Greece, Elada. The most ancient theatrical performances were inextricably connected with the cult of the Hellenic god of fertility, the son of Zeus and Demeter, Dionysus. Or his other name is Bacchus, where the word Bacchanalia came from as unrestrained self-will, a wild feast, an orgy, a festival in honor of Bacchus, the god of wine and merriment. At first, various legends about Dionysus were set forth in the form of a dialogue between the chorus and its leader, the Corypheus. The chorus usually consisted of satyrs, goat-hoofed companions of Dionysus. Actors who imitated satyrs, these half-humans, half-goats, were dressed in goatskins. Exactly singing of the chorus of goat-hoofed satyrs got the name of Tragodia. And so it goes since those times. For people, it's a tragedy, while for the elite, it is a merely a son of goats. That is the uncontrolled revelry of the animal mind system in the human society, where a people's attention is concentrated solely on the human animal nature. Fear, hatred, anger, conflicts. The system is always insatiable. What does the dictate of consciousness demand when it monocratically rules the personality? bread and circuses. For the system, which is always hungry, the bread is human life, bloody massacres, and the circuses are concentration of people's attention on these events, stimulation of the animal nature in a human, and consequently, it is fit for the system. Therefore, it's not surprising that the main entertainment of El and his elite was focused on wars and conflicts especially when unsurpassed weapons were in their sole possession. Climate weapons Ijokas is one of the epithets of Zeus, literally meaning the bearer of the Aegis, the shield-bearer. Aegis is the shield of Zeus. Aegis or Aegis, in translation from ancient Greek, means storm, whirlwind. It was believed that Zeus raised severe storms by means of this shield. The modern expression under the aegis means being under the protection, patronage of a person, or acting within the framework of an institution, organization, or enterprise. For example, to act under the aegis of the United Nations, and so on. It is mentioned that Zeus, reigning on Mount Olympus, commands nature and rules the destiny of people. He creates thunder, and by collecting clouds, he causes storms with a single shake of his aegis. He is the center of winds, rains, and downpours. Originally, Zeus didn't possess these weapons. At the beginning of his rise and struggle for power, his brothers and sisters were forced to give thunder and lightning into Zeus' possession. It was believed that by means of the aegis, the terrifying shield, Zeus raised severe storms. Throwing lightning with his right hand, with his left hand, Zeus shakes the aegis covered with hundred tassels. There was the head of Medusa the Gorgon in the center of the aegis. By shaking the aegis, Zeus generated peals of thunder that frightened gods and mortals. The aegis belonged not only to Zeus. It could be carried by Athena and, in exceptional cases, by Apollo. The fact that destructive storms and winds were the field of activity of various gods, who destroyed by means of them their enemies and the cities they hated, is also mentioned in the Sumerian and Akkadian epic. According to a legend, Zeus owned winds. He enclosed the winds behind the steep cliffs of the floating island of Aeolia. So 
surrounded by a copper wall. Zeus entrusted Aeolus, the king of this island, to look after them. It was mentioned that if one gives total freedom to these winds, they will raise the earth and the sea into the air. The duty of Aeolus was to release winds one by one according to the gods or his own desire. When a storm was needed, Aeolus threw a spear into the rock, and the wind began to blow from the formed hole until Aeolus closed it. He was so diligent towards the Olympian gods that, in the opinion of Zeus' wife Hera, he even deserved an invitation to attend the feasts of the gods. Attributes of Zeus are Aegis, Scepter, and Hammer. Zeus is the establisher of every order and law on Earth. The gods and mortals are in awe of him. By violent suppression of resistance and punishment, Zeus establishes his principles by force. One of Zeus' weapons is also the thunderbolt that emits lightning. The image of God's weapons may be found not only on the artifacts of ancient Greece, but also of Sumer, ancient India, and other peoples. Ancient Greek legends say that Cyclops forged thunder, lightning, and thunderbolt for Zeus to fight against the Titans. Zeus puts into action the thunderbolt, thunder and lightning in battles, so that Hades itself trembles, and the giant Earth moans sorrowfully. When the Olympians and the Titans throw rocks and mountains at each other, the heat from Zeus' lightning scorches the world. A whirlwind of flame rises. The Earth, the ocean and the sea boil. Heat and chaos cover the Earth. The sun is covered by a cloud of rocks and cliffs, which the enemies hurl. The sea roars, the earth trembles, or the giants trample, while their wild shouts reach the starry sky. Aren't these descriptions familiar to you, as the consequences of atomic bomb bursts? Nuclear Wars of Antiquity The Hidden History have you ever wondered where in the literature of antiquity the notion that war is connected with the will of gods came from? Where did such a ritual originate from in the human society, at which a tribe or a people, before going on a military campaign, should make a sacrifice to one of their divine patrons with a request to protect them and to grant them victory? Why was there a certainty that this patron deity would take a personal part in battles, supporting them with the weapons of the gods? And finally, whence did the peoples that knew only spears, bow and arrows know about ancient events characterizing the conduct of nuclear and thermonuclear wars? As of today, a lot of inconvenient facts have been accumulated contradicting the official version of world history and indicating that the world has already plunged into the abyss of a world nuclear war, and this resulted in a global disaster, extremely deplorable for the entire humanity of that time. Nuclear wars have already taken place in the distant past and left a lot of geological evidences of large-scale military conflicts of antiquity. These are the presence of multiple craters, the increased content of radioactive isotopes, the presence of radioactive zones, the existence of huge tectite strewn field on different continents, the formation of some dating back to the period of 12,000 years ago, as well as a number of differences from tectites of natural origin. Tectites are pieces of natural glass melted due to a sudden, significant increase in temperature and rapid cooling. Today, a similar picture may be observed at nuclear test sites. It is known that tectite fields appeared in the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the explosion of nuclear bombs in 1945. Such ancient epicenters, the consequences of atomic explosions of destructive power, are found in different parts of the globe, which evidences a large-scale military conflict with the use of not just nuclear, but also the type of currently unknown weapon. Legends of different peoples also bear evidence of the Great War of Gods with the application of all destroying weapons. One of such vivid examples 
is the ancient Indian epic Mahabharata, which describes the war and its consequences after the use of unusual, all-destructing weapons. Interesting facts. Fact 1. It is interesting that the first edition of the Mahabharata epic poem, narrating about the Great War and Discords, was carried out in the same 7th century BC. Rich in events of El supporters. Moreover, history repeats itself, just as in the story with the mysterious Homer. The text processing is attributed to one author, the legendary mysterious sage, who edits the famous ancient Indian epic Mahabharata, as well as the Vedas, Puranas, and other Indian philosophical texts. He is called Sage Vyasa, whose name in Sanskrit means division, separation, distraction, dispersion. He is also called Shashvata, that is immortal, eternal. Fact 2. In the Mahabharata epic poem, according to the plan of gods, by the hands of some people, the others, who are their relatives by the way, should be exterminated. One of the main negative characters is Karna, whose image by its tragic intensity is close to the image of the hero Achilles, from the Iliad epic poem by Homer. Just like Achilles, Karna died. Moreover, in the legend, more space is given to the description of Karna's death than to anyone else's, including the divine Krishna. Fact 3. The Mahabharata indicates that these events, the war with the use of the weapons of gods and the following cataclysms occurred at the turn of the age of Dvapara Yuga, where people had an opportunity to live for 1,000 years, and the age of Kali Yuga. Megalis. So was there a civilization in ancient times with high technologies, the development of which exceeded the discoveries of modern science? Certainly. More information on the science of antiquity may be found in the primordial Alatra physics. As of today, there are a lot of artifacts, ranging from remnants of ancient knowledge and up to megalithic structures ideally preserved over millennia. It is enough for any skeptic to pay attention to that very science of the ancient East and ask oneself a question, from where the ancients knew accurate values in geometry, mathematics and physics. But perhaps the most obvious evidence is the megalithic cities, located in different parts of the world, and the technology of their construction, which modern humankind cannot reproduce until today. Monoliths. Manhirs, pyramids, cities, temples, palaces, airports, and other ancient buildings that have been discovered in different parts of the world, amazed by their scale, stability, and perfection of structures. Almost all the buildings of antiquity were erected of large and heavy stones, megaliths, that weighted several dozens and sometimes hundreds of tons. Sometimes in the building masonry and in the form of separate monoliths, there are also heavier stone blocks, trilithons, the weight of which is over a thousand tons. Engineers of the distant past had the knowledge of how to make a solid structure of stones with the enormous weight, how to lift large stone blocks to set them at a high altitude and fasten together without mortar. They knew how to make a polygonal lane how to make a high-quality alloys for solid metal bracings. Even today we can see that cuts on the stones are made by mechanisms with pinpoint accuracy, which produced the effect of a tight fit of the stones, in the chinks between which it's impossible to insert even a razor blade. Masters of the past left lots of marks that indicate the use of high-tech equipment, superpower circular slabs, grinding machines, drills, possibly ultrasonic, cutters, and many other devices that the current civilization is yet unaware of. The traces left impressed with their flatness, ultra-thinness, and accuracy, large sizes and high quality of the devices themselves, which can easily deal with stone products of high-quality hard drops. Megaliths were made at a high level not just technically, 
but also their location, the form of constructions. The images left on the stones were made based on the knowledge of astronomy, geography, advanced mathematics, and other exact sciences. But what are all these high technologies and grand buildings worth when a society loses its spirituality? There is nothing worse than evil on a throne when power, terrible in itself, is becoming its spouse. Under the aegis of L, high technologies, one world government, immortality, cloning, games of gods, climate weapons, nuclear wars, destruction of Atlantis. As of today, the world public remains in the captivity of L-centrism, and everything is imbued with it, beginning with programs of the education system of new generations that is adopted in civilized countries, which impose a study of history and literature within certain limits, and ending with implantation of names from the literary heritage of the servants of L as the names of various communities, global projects, companies, enterprises, household items, and so on. Have you ever wondered why there are many people today who don't believe in God, mistakenly thinking that it's an old man with beard sitting on a throne? However, at the same time, they understand that there is something supreme after all, but in the form of the universal mind, the system. As a result, believers have questions. Since God is so loving, why does he allow wars and discord? From where there appeared so many people who are proud of atheism and consider the history of wars to be more important than spiritual knowledge? Where does it come from that world economy is much more important than human freedoms, that material values prevail over human life? People don't notice who has been reigning in their heads for a long time. They use words without understanding their true meaning. Even the personal names of many people are not the original names of the peoples they belong to. But these are the names that have ancient Greek or Hebrew etymology of origin. The question is, why is it like this and not otherwise? Do you think this doesn't concern you? And you are not involved in the game of the system? Look carefully. What kind of information are you surrounded with? And what kind of comparisons and images are hovering in your thoughts? What do the today's rhapsodies of L's servants make you dream of? What do you subconsciously choose every day? Today the word elite is embedded in the minds of consumers as something qualitatively higher, which a person should supposedly strive for, which he can achieve in this world through his wickedness and entrepreneurship by applying maximum power of attention. Elite cars, elite houses, elite goods, business elite, sports elite, art elite, political elite, military elite, ideological elite. But what is the elite in the original understanding of this word? Elite means the servants of the devil slave L. But what is the price of such selectedness? Whom does it beget in the consumer society? Is the literature which is now introduced into the ranks of masterpieces of world classics so harmless? The remnants of knowledge about the Atlanteans have been preserved in esoteric religious traditions of different peoples. The priests were their keepers. Many occult organizations appeal to the knowledge of the Atlanteans. 
Theosophical and Anthroposophical societies try to reconstruct the legacy of Atlantis. The emphasis was made on the selected race of people or the domination of one nation, which allegedly originates from the gods of Atlantis, over others. This idea of dividing off the lords from slaves was used by dictators in different times. In the cultural tradition of modern times, Atlantis has become one of the symbols of the triumph of intellect, the vehicle of ideas for the formation of social ideals of consumer society. Alexander the Great, who was convinced of the idea of monocracy establishment, that is of sole lordship over the world, is far from the only example of influence on people's choice, under the impact of such literature in the interpretation of else servants. Another vivid example is Reichsführer of SS, Heinrich Himmler, who at his time was also firmly convinced in not only the existence of Atlantis and further resettlement of the Atlanteans, but also in the fact that the descendants of the Atlanteans have remained in their best form only in Germany. In 1945, the Allies found in his library pretty heavily used books about the Atlantean civilization, including the glacial cosmogony by Herbiger about the super race of people, the race of lords which acquainted the Greeks, Egyptians and others with the civilization. Who benefits from this and why? Do you think it happened accidentally that in cultural tradition of modern times, Atlantis is a symbol of the triumph of intellect? How many films, literary works, articles have been devoted to it? How much attention and effort have been spent and involved in its search? But what is this all for? Have you ever wondered why in your consciousness, without your desire, a deliberately positive image of Atlantis is actively being formed. Atlantis is still searched for until now, but it is interesting where the attention of new generations is being directed. Do the search for answers to the question where it was located and what happened to it, but not more. What have modern people incidentally heard about Atlantis? Did a tragedy happen to Atlantis? That highly spiritual and highly educated people, a race of lords lived there? What is the expected result? The program implanted by L is the desire for world lordship. The global interest of certain individuals who are planning for centuries is quite obvious. The establishment of a new world order in human society. And L's return to the throne. But there is an ancient expression. Every power arouses vices. Absolute power generates a dragon. The information is scattered. And without a key, a person doesn't have a global understanding, believing in something that is feeding his pride, thereby getting into the system which manipulates him from outside. And there are millions of people like him. The servants of L only order PR in mass media. But all this propaganda and implementation of the ideas of world lordship are being done by the hands of misled people, deprived of their history. With people's lives, the elite, the descendants of El, are paving their way into the future in which they deeply believe, hoping for resumption of their bygone power. But what motivates the servants of El to do all these things today, if this is mere history? The answer is simple. The system's promise of the ninth day. They believe that in the future created by them, when El comes to the power again, they will resurrect in material bodies in Elysium, because in their secret orders, under a great secret accessible only to the initiated ones, legends have been preserved that all this is absolutely real, has a scientific basis, and similar resurrection in bodies was carried out in the times of El. As a matter of fact, this is a lie, because during El's reign the experiments were conducted, but only with regard to the transfer of a part of a human consciousness and creation of a body from the DNA of the deceased. 40 days after his death, 
but the deception consisted in the fact that the personality of the human himself, the one who the human is and feels himself during lifetime, actually becomes a personality, while people were shown a copy, just a clone of a human, but not the human himself. Everything is false in the system. The one who knows the best, understands the present, and can foresee the future. Sumerian Cuneiform Tablet. And what's the result? The system standardly creates its hot spots and uses people who live in illusions of obsessive thoughts, not knowing that they are being manipulated by the system and how this game of material immortality will end, first of all, for themselves. Their dream of immortality in the material body is the dream of the system about the ninth day, which will remain an empty illusion, because the system itself is finite and mortal. Its momentary existence with billions of years is nothing for the world of eternity, for the spiritual world. As Igor Mikhailovich Danilov said, the system is designed in such a way that your consciousness erases all the discoveries that you receive, and all understandings disappear very quickly, driving you into the stall of ordinary life. And only a mist remains of your freedom and understandings. But in order for the system not to deprive you of understanding and gain freedom, you must work very hard and not give power over you as personality to demons in your head, to those whom you perceive as your own thoughts and desires. Only this way you can gain true life and real freedom. The one who knows the truth can change the future. It's also interesting what you said in the previous program, that in fact there was also a period for humanity when it was on the edge, and nevertheless humankind had managed, let's say, to come out safely from this period, and there was a thousand years of reign of Alad sisters. Well, if we consider what happened afterwards, naturally there were people who remained. And something that was later called Hyperborea was formed out of them. There is such an alternative history where it is told that there was Atlantis, there was Hyperborea, and they fought each other. No. Hyperborea was already a spiritual formation. Practically all of them left later on, the Hyperboreans. Yes, it grew and was huge. Both maps and territories exist and remain, but this is a subsequent history. They did not exist together. Mm -hmm. And after Hyperborea was precisely the golden millennium of the spiritual reign of Alat sisters, and thereafter, well, a thousand years of normal existence of people, when the devil was weakened to the utmost, and the weakening of the devil was precisely during Hyperborea. The question arises, how people actually managed in such a moment when, so to say, the devil was very strong? Well, then the devil was as strong as he is now. But even now there are people who are aspiring to God who are able to step over the devil, who are capable of arguing with their consciousness, isn't it so? 
who are able to observe their consciousness and analyze. And they understand, after all, that their consciousness is not their tool, and that they are not the consciousness and they are not the body. After all, people obtain this experience. Well, there were also such people then. And thanks to them, the world out of let's say, I will say it carefully, out of less than 150,000 people, the whole civilization was reborn. Well, just count, out of 8 billion, isn't it sad? It is sad. Try to gather them now. 150,000. For example, in all religions, all monasteries, it's just interesting those truly aspiring to God. How many could be gathered? There is the answer. Although inside each one of them thinks that he is worthy, that he is a believer, he serves. Maybe the only question is, to whom? What is he worthy of? And whom does he believe in? And whom does he actually serve? This is the point. Consciousness has confused people. There are indeed a lot of questions. It's like a program. This is its work, this is its function. After all, no one comes and forces a person even to make a step. No one, including consciousness. It only suggests to the personality, and personality already puts in its attention. Consciousness begins to act in accordance with the choice of the personality, meaning consciousness, it instantly gives a lot of suggestions, but for some reason personality chooses these or those thoughts, those or other emotions. It is clear that the personality does not see a three-dimensional world. This is exactly the domain of consciousness. This is the material world, the mortal world. Nevertheless, a human exists here and the personality has to develop. Since childhood it is enslaved by consciousness, isn't it? What is being hammered into people's heads? Here is the answer, what is the most valuable and the most important. Still, today we would like to shake the positions of consciousness of people, such as atheists, because… But what for? Because after all… After all, this is their choice. If everyone honestly admits this to himself, he actually feels and seeks God, and in some cases not having received the answers to some questions… Out of pridefulness, they just fell for the tricks of consciousness. It is banal. A child could be even at a rather young age when appealing to God. He does not get what he wants. But appealing to God from the material position, of course he will not get what he wants. Well, this is the impulse to a person to take the other side. Ah, since God did not give me, then I'll go serve Satan. Again, we return to these very problems. Another situation. A person was born in a normal family, but after looking at his friends, after watching programs, he wished to be cooler, better and so on. Well, greed, envy and everything else arose in him. Well, how to justify the inner negativity which Satan gave him? By atheism. Isn't that so? There is no God, what should I be afraid of? And what is more, this is one of the persuasions, one of the forms of the work of consciousness, that there is no God. Well, no one stands in front of the mirror and says that there is no me. This is absolutely the same. Go to the mirror and say, there is no me, I do not see anything, I simply do not exist, this is just a hallucination, a mirage that I am observing. They just reason that there is no God, because it is impossible to measure Him with devices. Then there is also no consciousness. It cannot be measured either. Intellect can be measured, but intellect is exactly what you have to develop yourself. Isn't that so? The harder you try, the more developed it becomes. If you need it, go ahead and develop it. And of course, it is impossible to measure God, for how can you measure Him in the material world? There is no way. There is no way. It's just interesting how the system acts in general, at all times, and already going back to antiquity, and just now, how it all intersects. It turns out that, again, what was offered by this elite, in order to defend some of their social and economic convictions, they took those questions that the priesthood could not answer in that religion, and simply twisted the information for the person, as if caring about the spiritual, gave some of their own answers, considering people to be, well, Commoners that all these fairy tales for children, the uneducated ones, they do not understand. This is happening to this day. That all this is for simple people, but for the wise, educated ones, for the elite, profound thinkers, 
For the chosen ones. For the chosen ones, yes. By L. Yeah. And they should know that God doesn't exist. Well, I think that this will indeed surprise a lot of people. This information actually opens people's eyes anew, because for sure, if everyone honestly admits this to himself, he thought it was unique that he doesn't serve anyone, because atheists don't want to serve anybody in any way, and their consciousness strongly opposes the fact that they can be controlled by anyone. The highest form of egoism, let's say, and pridefulness is atheism. Naturally, they think that they are absolutely free, but only because they have never really worked on themselves. They have not studied either their consciousness or themselves, or the world around them. They have been content with just that whisper coming from the depths of their consciousness and have not understood that it was the demons who whispered and nothing more. But they think that demons are fairy tales. All this is a mirage, there is no death. Yes, the death exists, but but there is no hell, there is nothing. That everything is fine, everything is good, and that God is just a fantasy, let's say. In the past people invented Him, because it was necessary to somehow explain the thunder, lightning, something else, human death, that everything happens in terms of higher forces. And all this is simple physics and chemistry. And a human being just accidentally originated from animals. Well, Darwin said so, after all. It's easy to justify everything. Consciousness always criticizes and distorts everything. But there is also another experience. However, it takes time, it requires effort. What is easier, to walk the spiritual path or to serve the devil? This is a simple question for consciousness, but consciousness cannot walk the spiritual path at all. It only leads people around holy places with the hope of seeing God and creates hope for people by saying, if you go there, you will come into contact. A person went and didn't come into contact. He comes out, God inspired, all is beautiful, all is fine and wonderful, but empty inside. He didn't find God, in fact because it is impossible to find him somewhere, as we have already talked about it. He is inside a person, only through those doors that are inside, which people call the soul. Only through this a person can come into contact with the spiritual world. There is no other way. Well, consciousness tells the opposite. Right there was a wise man, right there was a saint. Well, so people are chasing after the external, after the images. We have also had such situations when a woman wrote a comment. I was searching for God everywhere. I traveled through all the temples. I wanted so much to get rid of my sins and, well, to enlighten, to get enlightened, and I was seeking. And here a very interesting situation arises. The woman wanted to get rid of her sins. And what is sin? Sin is exactly the service to Satan. That is the greatest sin. And all the sinfulness lies in nothing but indulging our consciousness, because it is exactly consciousness that creates this whole sinfulness. But this same consciousness was leading her to God in the desire to get rid of itself. Well, that is how consciousness jokes. And yet the devil is a good joker. Yes, and… While a human, as a personality, felt, she felt the need to search for God, but ultimately, not having found Him anywhere, she could have become an atheist. Yes, well, she is all discouraged and is still looking for answers. Uh Uh-huh. To be discouraged and seek love, yes, it's impossible. God is love. There is nothing else and cannot be. And until a person understands this, and until he starts to love, he will not get anything. Everything is actually simple. People indeed spend a lot of time in order to, well, they just go around in a vicious circle and do not understand what the attainment of this love is, what love is. They do not even understand, somehow, what it means to love, because there are categories of consciousness. There is an old expression, bogatir, yes? What is a bogatir? That's the attainment, the accumulation of God. What does it mean, accumulation of God? This is accumulation of allied powers. Meaning, when a person as a personality really aspires, when he begins to feel, this is the perception through feelings and not some kind of tactility or something else. It is precisely the perception through feelings that allows one to feel the spiritual world. And what is the spiritual world? It is an endless joy, it is love, it is absolute grace, isn't it so? And when a person, having felt this, begins to send love himself, he himself begins to love sincerely and truly, 
then what can he get in response? Only love. So that's what accumulation is. And it turns out, the more he gives his love, the more he gets in return. And getting overfilled with it, he just shares it. That's when they say, a person is with God, because it emanates from him. But again, who can feel it? The very few people. And others? On the contrary, experience hatred that comes from consciousness. They envy him or something else. Why? Because they look at the image, they see the image and immediately compare it with themselves. So that's where the conflict of interest arises, between consciousness itself and egoism, which the very consciousness has formed in a human. Isn't that right? Everything is simple. Igor Mikhailovich, and love, does one need to learn it, or to somehow develop oneself in love? One should constantly learn and develop. The person comes to this world to learn and develop. Having learned and developed, he can become an angel. And if a person doesn't learn and develop, he will become a sub-personality 100%. There is no other way. And consciousness hinders him, it's true. But actually, there has to be an obstacle on the path. How else? What kind of path is it, if it's smooth and even? That's not a path, is it? What would the person's merit be, if the path were easy? Once we have already talked about Zoroastrianism and ancient religions, it is clearly described there, because there is still an understanding of all this. This is exactly what we have also mentioned of Hyperborea, and that's where these explanations already came from. This is in modern civilization. Well, again, similar explanations were also in the previous civilization. The one that ended with the disappearance of Atlantis and almost 8 billion people. What has this led to? There was knowledge, there were religions, everything was there. Here is also such a point. It turns out that people feel, at some moments of their time, this very instant of contact with God. Consciousness simply deceives people that… Well, sometimes people, having been impressed with something, experience euphoria, the work of, say, endorphins inside of themselves. But again, we must not forget about the function of consciousness. Human consciousness is a part of the common system. The system is always hungry. The attention that our personality distributes is nothing but food, no more than that. Any information should be fed with something, with some kind of energy, otherwise it cannot exist. Everything is very simple. And in view of the fact that the system is a thinking being, you cannot call it otherwise, it's a kind of artificial intelligence, as we have said even if it is artificial, but it's intelligence. It means that it's already a being, isn't it? This is already a certain life, even if it's temporary. But again, what does temporary mean? It is temporary from the position of the spiritual world. But from the human's perspective, it is eternal, just as the universe is boundless. Well, in reality, time goes very fast, and the universe is very small. It depends on what and from which position to compare and from which direction to look. If you look at the system from the inside, it is huge. But if you look from the outside, it is practically invisible. This is the point. Igor Mikhailovich, just now you've said about eternity and immortality, and also, when looking for the information, we came across what people say about immortality in general. Why don't they believe in it? They say that supposedly, in their understanding, the soul consists of atoms, and atoms just decompose together with the body at the end of life. If one looks at it from their perspective that the soul consists of atoms, and the atoms are part of the material world, so the soul will disappear. But in this way, there is a confusion. They confuse with sub-personality. After all, a sub-personality, it actually consists of four particles. These are not atoms. It consists of that of which consists something that precisely creates atoms afterwards, let's put it so. This is a bit beyond the quantum limit even. These are not quantum states yet. So yes, a sub-personality is material because consciousness remains and everything remains. Naturally, it cannot exist eternally. It exists temporarily, but not the soul. The soul does not belong to this world, and it cannot be destroyed. And I also like when they say, 
to save the soul, right? Such an expression. But saving the soul is like saving a life ring. A simple example. We have already talked with you in the previous program, and I will say it once again. A person is drowning, the ocean is raging, and he has been thrown a life ring from the ship, but he starts throwing it back. How is that? It's a life ring. It should be saved. That's what it's called, the life ring. So you have to save the life ring at the cost of your own life. Well, that's what people do. They save life ring, throwing it back until they drown. There is another belief. You have touched on the subject of subpersonalities. People ask atheist questions and they answer. Well, as if knowing somehow, even intuitively, subconsciously, that is, they still feel they do have a component of the soul. And they say that, well, okay, let something be there after death. Then we'll figure it out. But now I can do anything. I won't feel pangs of conscience. I will not be afraid of anything. I don't want these doubts. Well, you have told it yourself. This is a convenient form of existence in slavery. Yes, that is the reasoning. As we have already said, this happens only because people do not understand that they are being manipulated and controlled, that consciousness decides for them where to go, what to do, whether to stand up, and even what to feel. Consciousness controls everything. Right. What to eat, what to experience, when to get sick, when to recover. Right. This is a part of the material world. Or here's another situation when people set themselves a material goal. They already have everything, have already achieved this goal. Everything in life has come together perfectly. Children, a house, everything is planned. It's not enough. It's not enough, but... It's never enough. At some point, they kind of get disappointed in this material world and already... And here is precisely where it starts when they as a personality feel that death is inevitably approaching. That which is called death. But they have not received satisfaction from life and they have not done the most important thing and there is no way out. And here two paths remain. Either to grasp at consciousness with all the strength, sweeping the spiritual aside, well, or to pretend that you are spiritual. That is, without understanding, without knowing and studying, but again, without working on themselves. Isn't that so? It's almost always like this. And also, in order to deceive the sphere of death, the following expression is used quite often, not even an expression, but considering the experience of those people who survived clinical death, and it is said that, supposedly, people who came back from there, they did feel the state of joy, therefore, why be afraid of this death? And it's always like that. The point is that, in actual fact, clinical death is a short experience. It is just a short experience of the personality's escape from the power of consciousness. But actually, in the majority of cases, the primary consciousness remains active and basically even in some conjunction with the personality. And it is natural, of course, that people experience joy, euphoria, this physical weight is lifted. But this is a temporary transitional state. And when the real death comes, the person instantly turns into subpersonality. At first, of course, he won't understand anything, but the initial period passes very quickly. And the person understands that there are no hands, no legs. And then gradually he will understand even more how he wasted his life, not lived, but wasted. Well, this is sad. It's interesting that even... Let's talk about something pleasant. It's just that such problems and misunderstandings, I guess, are primarily related to the fact that people, even those who are watching us for the first time, they simply do not understand the basic concepts. What is a personality? What is the soul? What is a subpersonality? A state of... But who hinders them? After all, if you take any subject, you should first study it in detail, isn't that so? If a person aspires to God, he should study everything that concerns God as much as possible. Isn't that so? And when a person limits himself, let's say, to one direction, it doesn't work. Let's take science, any science. If a person does not study the works of predecessors, the works of, say, other people who are engaged in this, his colleagues, how then will he develop in science? Well, that's easy. In order to make any progress, he has to first compile a critical mass of information. Then, for a long time, he has to very persistently apply an enormous amount of his attention, in terms of time, to this science. 
and subsequently, as a rule, if he has financed it sufficiently, he will receive an answer. However, he will believe that it is he who has sold it, that this is his achievement, that's what he came up with. Well, that is so, but the answer he gets is a ready-made one. Yes, very few people know that. Atheists, well, they do not believe in religions, and this is considered to be atheism, right? But still, there are religions that do not believe in our religions and argue this with the same evidence, meaning they operate with the same concept that the atheists operate with. Well, again, this is what we have already been talking about, that practically in all religions, not practically, but in all of them, there are a lot of hidden atheists, and it is not God they need. They just need participation, they pursue completely different interests, and they are manipulated by Satan despite the fact that they are in some kind of a religious organization. But they are controlled by Satan. They deny all and everything. They are the only good ones. They are the only ones who are the most intelligent. They are doing well. Yes. Naturally. It's interesting that modern atheists they used as a basis the following. Back in 18th century, there was Holbach, who said that children are atheists because supposedly they do not have any concept of God. And now this, let's say, statement is promoted quite a lot. Yet, what is the situation in the actual fact? Children's consciousness, in fact, begins to develop when they cognize the world. After all, they do cognize it, the material part of this world. Well, but no one touches on the aspect of feeling that kids do feel and who develops perception through feelings in children. No one. And it turns out that the first thing that develops, and develops intensively, is consciousness. Naturally, it gets a huge head start over the personality, and later on it simply oppresses and manipulates the person. This is how a slave of Satan is formed, but not a God's servant. That means they take a word, in this case lack of understanding of this very state of feeling by those people, right, who are atheists, and simply refer to the fact that if it is not called by the word God… But a child who doesn't know words yet cannot, let's say, use the word God. But it is enough when the child begins to talk more or less freely, to talk with him heart to heart. You might be surprised by his wisdom. After all, many children have the wisdom, let's say, of truly holy elders. Isn't that right? Yes, it is. They have perception through feelings. They may not know what God is called in their language, but they certainly feel what it is. And they feel perfectly well that this world is not their home. And they understand where they need to go. They may not put their aspiration correctly into earthly words, but they do have this understanding. That's why it is precisely children who are much closer to God, because they are not as dirty as adults yet. They are not so burdened by their consciousness and by this sinfulness, as they say. It turns out that atheists doubt any of this experience of feeling. And we came across such information that they often say, I'll read it now. I've studied the work of the brain. I was interested in the subject of some kind of revelations, some spiritual experience. How, if this happens in one particular consciousness, how can it be distinguished from a malfunction in work of the brain, prefrontal cortex, and from hallucinations in general? Actually, I would say this is an interesting question. But this is precisely the lack of understanding of what consciousness is and what simply neurophysiology is, right? And how the neurons of our brain work. After all, the chemical reactions that are displayed and which we observe on the devices, EEG machines, PETs and everything else, this happens already after the personality begins to finance this or that thought, this or that image. And what happens? Firstly, the image is born. And then, after the birth of this image, or rather when the image originates, at that moment a small group of neurons lights up. But when the personality has financed, let's say, this image, this idea, then a certain area of the neurons of our brain flares up. That means there is already a reaction. But naturally, how can they distinguish let's say, the spiritual or not the spiritual, yes? If it's material work that is going on. 
Here is a simple example for understanding. We take a tablet, well, I don't know, a laptop, whatever. We install certain programs there. In one program is written devil, in the other one God is written. Both are in the same font, the same brightness, bold type, well, saturation, and then highlight it. But the tablet highlights equally. Simultaneously. Yes. Here the neurons of the brain are like the screens of the tablet and all that. But the only difference is that their combination causes chemical reactions. That means there follows a subsequent physical reaction to the body. And here the personality decides whether to finance the further action or not, meaning to give energy for the further development or not. If the information came from the body, yes, the personality should finance it. If the personality does not give a certain amount of energy, the consciousness will not work. Consciousness does not work on that energy which the neurons of the brain work on. This must be also understood. Why? Because neurons, they work exactly on electricity, on the chemistry which arises after we eat something. This is the machine that processes. I'll say it simpler. Here is a car with remote control. There is a battery in it, or it runs on gasoline, for example, or on internal combustion engine. But it is exactly the operator who has the remote control. Well, there is such kind of a parallel. The car drives to the right, drives to the left. Well, and a person is also able to convert one type of energy into another one, thanks to which the aggregate of our cells perform the function of this car. And in this case, the operator is like a personality, which sends signals, and the car drives right and left. It can drive to the dump, or it can drive to the gas station. And here, of course, the choice comes from the operator. Therefore, the personality, as an operator, has the opportunity, has the right, and no one can refute this right to choose. Well, it's a different matter that the spiritual world, it is static. We already talked about this once, it seems to me, in the previous program. It does not run anywhere, it does not strive anywhere. It is, because it is eternal. But the material world, it constantly rushes on with acceleration already for billions of years. That is why it turns out that Satan needs a lot and faster. That's why he has such a cunning and everything else. And he fights to the last breath for his feeder. This is normal. Igor Mikhailovich, you mentioned the moment of choice, right? That means, ideally, a personality chooses between programs. But what happens? Some automatic actions start working. Why do people pay attention to this or that program, this or that thought? Well, people don't even think about it. They don't think. Naturally, without experience, not really having experience in spiritual work, people don't think about it. And what is spiritual work on oneself? Well, we have already talked about this also more than once. Well, we'll talk again, at least the way the elders who reach this spiritual liberation describe it. It is control. Control of demons in head, of what they whisper, whether to accept something or not. It is a constant observation, a constant work on oneself. And of course, it's better to write everything down in order to see. That's the only way for you to understand that you are being fooled, when you put every thought on paper, when every revelation you have goes on paper. For example, enlightenment came to a person, an insight. Yes, meaning he got inspired, came into contact with something divine. He really understood. He is able to perceive this power. He has perceived. This love lit up in him, even if it just began to smolder, but it's already warm. Go ahead and write it down. If you haven't written it down, tomorrow you will forget. Consciousness will erase everything, and it will say, that was just kind of a hallucination, that was an emotional search. What kind of emotion? If this is real, this is alive. Well, and this is exactly what work is. The spiritual path begins from this, from the study of Satan. Consciousness in every way. And you can't get away from this, of course, from the study of consciousness. Studying his own consciousness, it turns out that a person begins to unmask Satan. 
Satan. Is it beneficial to Satan or not? Of course not. Will he resist? He will resist very strongly. And people face this. Yes, they do. And just here, also a woman wrote in a letter that she encountered a misunderstanding and she began to stop herself halfway. What does it mean? Living by spiritual is easy, but it's very difficult to come to it. It's a titanic work. Enormous work. In fact, if it were easy, everyone would be saints. Well, then it would be not appreciated. It is like it was before, when people didn't have a body, right? It's like in Zoroastrianism, but they themselves ask for it in order to become worthy, to enter the world of God as equals among equals. A human, when studying how the system works, he understands that he is being manipulated, then he learns to resist it and finds himself as a personality, begins to develop himself as a personality, then to control. He learns the love of God, meaning coming into contact with the world, meaning at first he understands that there is devil, he understands there is a spiritual world, there is love, he begins to develop what is precious to him, what brings him life. Well, one fine day he just begins to live and he realizes that it's so easy. Yes, it's very easy and it's very pleasant. Yes, but it's easy, pleasant, it's joyful. This is life, it cannot be… Well, how can life be complicated or hard? How can it not be joyful? Well, how can love be burdensome, right? Yes. Well, without it there is no point in existing here for even a single moment. They say, is it difficult to love or… Well, why it is hard to love? It is scary not to love, but to love it is everything. Happiness. This is happiness, yes, but this is when a person knows. When he found it, well, it seems so easy, so simple. Well, it's really easy and simple. But in order to make this step towards this simplicity, one needs to step over the devil. And this is not so simple. Because you move with the help of the same consciousness, you study it precisely with its help. Well, it's natural that you stumble onto resistance, have plenty of substitutions and everything. But the question stands different. If your aspiration is sincere and true, and if you really go, you will surely reach. It's impossible that you do not reach. But if you listen to a consciousness that says that you are nobody, and you haven't learned anything and will never learn anything, well, yet again, it's your choice, human. What can I say? That's what democracy is, the highest democracy from God, the human right to choose, to choose life or death. It is simply that. That's it. Well, there is one point. The world of God is eternal, and it is for everyone who aspires to life. But another world, under the guidance of Satan, it is definitely deadly dangerous. Well, of course, it would be nice to expand on these points where people stumble. After all, when getting these gleams, contact, and already having experience of spiritual immersions, perception for feelings, but a person is still distracted, consciousness distracts him. Of course, well, let's just say a person's existence is an ideal condition for the formation of an angel. This should be understood. This is not God's cruelty, absolutely not. God has given a chance. Atheists think so, that this is cruelty. And whether you take it or not, it is your choice. God cannot be cruel, God is love. And who prevents you from loving? Who prevents you from living? Well, who? No one. It is only your choice. So, and why does a person choose precisely the earthly, precisely material? Why does he choose to judge someone? Why does he choose discord, wars? Why does he choose dirt instead of purity? Well, who forces him? No one besides consciousness. But if you know that consciousness is a tool of the devil, then why do you succumb to this? After all, no one humiliates a human as much as his own consciousness, isn't it? Nobody makes a human so unhappy as his own consciousness, doesn't it? It belittles, it offends him, it mocks him, it glorifies him and belittles him at the same time. It leads him in circles around emptiness, and people are content with this. Well, Yes, but the question also arises, all right, I believe, I feel, but I can't, I need someone to have faith in me. And faith is, well, we talked a lot about this. Faith in this case is not acceptable. Faith should be the first step when a person hopes, he believes and he goes. 
Faith can encourage you on the way to God, but it will not bring salvation, knowledge and experience. There can be nothing else. One should earn his experience, he needs to get knowledge, he has to achieve it. When you learn the system, when you understand all this, when you feel that very love, when you come into contact with the spiritual world, what Satan can bring you down? This is a simple question. What can he do? Nothing. All is powerless, because it goes beyond the material world. Everything earthly, everything worldly, it all remains far behind. This is true. Just like the fact that life should be acquired while you are alive, after that you will not acquire anything, because you will be helpless. This is also true. But consciousness tells one otherwise, because it is beneficial for it. And the whole trouble… Yes, to each their own. Yes, and the whole trouble is that people don't understand that consciousness is not who they are. But many people think, consciousness is me, the body is me, everything is mine. Yes, we feel, we feel that chemistry is working, neurons are working, primary consciousness perceives all information about the body and sense of touch. All this is analyzed, it all works. The first experience that takes place, it happens through neurons. That is, you touched, and neurons, there are also neurons in fingers, they activate it. Information started moving, what started? The electric current started, the discharge went, which excited a certain group of neurons, which, in their turn, gave out a certain image. This image was already perceived, let's say, by a quantum mechanism, yes? Meaning in consciousness itself, it's a quantum computer. Consciousness activated, perceived it all, and now the personality already receives a certain picture. Well, and then later, whether a personality was seduced or it was not seduced, where to go, right or left, is the choice of the personality. But consciousness offers a lot of roots at the same time, and this is multivector. Yes, just to each his own, to an atheist, that's… Of course. The only thing is that if there is love, then why are there woes, wars, devastation? The question is not about love. In fact, the very concept we have already discussed more than once what love is. Love, it is also understood in different ways. There is love from the consciousness and there is love from the spirit. And here the difference is significant. Say, people love each other, they cannot live without each other, but excuse me, they are constantly cheating on each other, in the head. Moreover, it's constant. Isn't that so? If not physically, then in thoughts. But what's the difference? After all, our thought is material. In fact, there is no difference whether you were unfaithful in your head or you were unfaithful physically. Everything is the same. Well, the only difference is infections might be added when it's physical. Other than that, the essence is the same. After all, this is perceived by the personality absolutely identically. This is a sin, and that also is a sin. Well, and where is the love here? Well, isn't it so? And when they constantly quarrel, trying to dominate each other, is that love? Why there is nothing like this in the spiritual world? And it cannot be, well be it as it may. The consciousness of those same atheists, it puts such a counter-argument, it can be said. Why such a merciful God, in whom you believe, allows all this, allows strife… What exactly? Allows wars, allows… I understand. This is an age-old question. Why does he allow injustice and all the bad things that are happening in this world? Yes, if he is so merciful. Well, I say simply, God, he never interferes in human affairs, in human choice. And everything that happens here, wars, strife, or troubles, is human choice. Isn't it people who start wars? And where do wars begin? In the head. Who whispers? Consciousness. What is the reason here? Pridefulness and greed. There is nothing else. Pridefulness and greed of certain people who have power. And why do they start wars? They're bored. Or they want something that doesn't belong to them. To take what somebody else is. If they cannot buy it, let's go to war, because supposedly we are strong. We will take what somebody else is. Well, isn't it so? It is. Yes, and then exactly such atheists appear who say that I do not believe in God, I do not believe in your religion, because you do not act in the way it is written in your sacred writings. As it's written, do not kill, but the wars are going on. Being hit on the left cheek, turn right one, and believers don't do that way, so… Well, we have already talked about this, that some time ago this was relevant. People were more spiritual, and an evil person who lives under the control of Satan, well, a person cannot punish another one very much. They will hit you on one cheek. Well, you understand that he is directed by Satan. A person has punished himself. How can you punish him more? Well, no way. That's why they said, turn the other cheek, but do not be angry. 
That was the point. Forget this person, he has punished himself, you cannot punish him more. But excuse me when after only a few thousand years the system has become so strong that now, well, if you turn the other one, he will hit you even in the nose. I've already said that if you are bitten on your left leg by a rabid dog, do not give him the right one, evil must be punished. But here also the question is that one may misunderstand what is evil and what is good, and might become a rabid dog oneself and bite others. This is important. Also, there was such a key question, how can we distinguish a good, God-pleasing deed from a deed that God is not willing? And an example was given, that a God-pleasing deed is an action at the moment of which you experience joy, but if there occur, some other states come. Listen, but if I'm eating a candy and feel the joy because of it, is it a God-pleasing deed or not? Well, you know… It's my personal business, right? To the dictation of consciousness, after all, it is experiencing this joy. Now, as a personality, I don't really care what an organism that lives in my organism wants to eat and why it needed this chocolate. And which parasite wants? Well, generally speaking, which parasite wants the chocolate now? But the consciousness cares about this. Well, what does God have to do with this? Well, it's simple. What does it mean a God-pleasing deed or not a God-pleasing one? I'll put it simply. All the deeds that lead to spiritual development and especially to spiritual saving of people are God-pleasing deeds. All the rest is human deeds, deeds that are inevitably dead and have nothing to do with the spiritual world. Whether I praised you or I scolded you, well, what the difference has it made? A simple question. So if I prompted you, gave you a tool, and only when you accepted it and began to use it, now that is already a God-pleasing act. But if I gave you the tool, I've spent my time, but you didn't want it, again I come back to you and tell you, am I doing a God-pleasing deed or not? Of course not, because at the time when I offered you a tool, you refused, you made your choice. Well, God be with you, little goldfish, swim along, and I'll find someone who needs this tool. I will not waste a lifetime on the dead, you know, because those times are over. The alive for the living, dead for the dead. Everything is simple. And maybe in the minds of those very atheists, this will be perceived as injustice. Well, how is that? God, he's obliged. Well, God does not owe anything to anyone, first of all. God does not even know whether you exist or not until you mature and become someone whom God will notice. We've already talked about this many times. Well, I've said it once again. Now, as for atheists, this will infuriate them. They will say, well, how's that? He's God. He must know everything. Excuse me, as of today, the Internet knows everything. Does it know what you have in your left pocket? But perhaps you have no pocket, if you are, pardon me, resting in the negligee. Well, isn't it so? What does it have to do with the Internet? It's just an example. Or what does the alive have to do with the dead world, as a matter of fact? Yes, it may be insulting. Insulting to whom? Insulting to consciousness. What did it hook at? At the pridefulness it hooked. And what is pridefulness? And pridefulness is precisely that anchor which drags one down, isn't it so? It is. And that's how it all starts. We must not cuddle and cherish pridefulness and selfishness in ourselves, but we must work. We must study, we must strive. If you want to be saved, do save yourself. There will be no other way out. Nobody will pass it and do it for you. But there is another expression. That's when they say that the prideful people, they say, will save ourselves, and so on, that without God, human will not be saved. So who is right here and who is wrong? Well, let's say so. In fact, it's true that a person cannot be saved without God, because it is unrealistic. But, on the other hand, after all, it is a person who makes this choice, isn't it? When does he get real power, love and freedom? Only when he deserves it. When this becomes his only willingness and desire. When he steps over the Satan, going towards the light, right? When he jumps over the bottomless pits, aspiring to exit. Well, then, of course, he gets help. Say, does God give His helping hand? Yes. Yes, He does, when you enter His home. Yes, when you are pure with Him. He greets you, but only when you enter His home. 
And that's the point. When there is purity of intent. But the consciousness will hold you by the tail to the last. Yes, and will suck you dry. And will try to tear you away, yes? Even as you're walking through the door, it will still try to pull you back. Scream? Of course. And here is your choice what to listen to. Consciousness or go to God once again. Well, when a person is already walking through the door, then there is no doubt that consciousness no longer plays a role. Isn't that so? Igor Mikhailovich, what is the help of God? It is His love. It is His power. This is exactly what God's help is. Well, again, no matter what, God never leaves people. And when it is necessary, He gives them tools. He will certainly give them tools. He will find an opportunity and a way. The question is, will people take these tools and whether or not they will use them? We have already said many times that it is easy to work with a good tool. However, one cannot build a house with a 32 kilo kettlebell tied to a throttle. That's the point. But when pure good tools are given, then a person can easily just pave the way, the way home to God. God never leaves, He always gives. Well, again, the question is in the human choice. Yes, you have just answered many questions that also exist in religion on the issue of God owes. There is such a belief and there is also a continuation that not only does God owe one, the patriarch is obligated, but a layman himself is not able to do anything at all and he is not shown. Yes, everyone owes a human. Yes, everyone owes him. And following that, the question was asked, how can I see God, how can I cognize him? And the answer from the clergyman was, stay away or you will burn like a candle. You cannot address God directly, you need mediators, you need a priest, you need a pastor. The answer is from whom? The answer is from Satan, literally. After all, who will burn at the appearance of God? Matter will. If the power of God really manifests itself, well, I mean, not in a hidden, it's like antimatter. All matter will disappear immediately. But on the one hand, this priest has been reading a lot about such physical phenomena, let's say. But on the other hand, again, his egoism and his self-importance, well, this is pridefulness and megalomania. Stay away from God. What are you doing to love God or something else? You must be afraid of God, and only the God-fearing one will be saved. From what will he be saved? Only the one who obeys a clergyman, who follows him and does whatever he says, only that one will be saved. Will be saved from what? From life? From life, yes, he will be saved. Well, if this is a salvation for them, let them choose. They are free people, after all. But it only shows that this clergyman was, well, let's say, a representative of the organization, but not the one who is going to God. If he really served God and not the organization, he would never say that. And even more so, if he had experience. And the one who embarks on the path of service, he must go to the Lord. He has to strive for home. If the organization was also properly organized. Any organization, whatever it is, exists according to certain patterns. An organization cannot be different, therefore we should perceive them as they are. Well, here also, this should be approached correctly. Because the same believers blame, let's say, I do not go to church because everything is for sale there. Yeah, candles for a price. Candles for a price and so on. Well, there is a simple argument I would like to respond with to such people. If you do not like that everything requires payment in the church, that candles cost money, well, no problem at all. There is a simple solution. You buy a candle factory, you buy raw materials for candles production, you hire experts who come and make a certain amount of candles that are for your temple, where you don't want to go, well, let's say a year's worth at least, and then you take it all and bring it to the priest. I think not a single priest would refuse, and he would hand out these candles to everyone, let them pray to God by candlelight, for God's sake. You no longer want it, right? 
All desire is gone immediately, but I will spend a lot of money, and so on and so forth. But one must pay for everything at the temple. Well, how can this be? Excuse me, but is everything free at your house? Free electricity? Free gas? Well, isn't that so? When we come to the temple in the winter, slash, it's cold, we come in and there is light. It's warm there. It's clean. Well, this doesn't appear out of nowhere. Lights cost money. Electricity isn't cheap nowadays. Gas for heating costs money too. Even if they heat with firewood instead of gas, that also costs money. Someone has to pay for this somehow, right? Well, isn't that so? And it turns out that the poor clergymen, they have to hustle somehow. Instead of engaging in one's own spiritual growth, and let's say the spiritual growth of his congregation, the lay people who come to him, the man is engaged in administrative work. He is looking for ways to find these pennies in order to repair the temple, in order to renovate something, in order to build something. But to build for whom? The very same parishioners, and they are the ones who will blame him later. Yes, they do blame Isn't that so? Yes, why does the priest deal with everyday matters? So why? But what should he do? And how should he support the temple? After all, everything costs money. Moreover, the priest is a human like everyone else. He might have a family, children and all that. After all, he is not deprived of these needs, say, ordinary ones, the same as you want. And where to get money, simply said? That's why they have to. For a rite of baptism, it costs this much. For a funeral, that much. So he arranges it somehow, somewhere. Well, he just collects funds by little bits in order to maintain all this. But why not to do the opposite? Meaning, why in some countries sometimes they do this, let's say, in some religions? Well, everything is simple. There is a parish, there is a certain number of people who come there and visit this temple. A thousand, two thousand people, even a hundred people, for instance. Well, what's the difference? People made an estimate. Anyway, you form this budget, which is then spent on everything, maintenance of the temple and all the rest. They have estimated how much money is needed for the wages of those who work there, that very priest, deacon, because they must be paid for as people spend the whole day on this. Again, people calculate how much repairs and maintenance of the temple will cost. And taking into account that this is an organization, and in any organization, a portion of money from this smaller cell should always go to the top authorities. Well, same as with government. We pay taxes here for our business, they go to the city, to the region and the like. Everything has to be supported, it's natural. This is normal, with all the deductions, how much it amounts to, so that it would satisfy everyone, and it's normal. They made calculations, split a certain amount among themselves per quarter or per month. Well, whatever works best. I think it would be just pennies, for everyone. Well, then you would come and no one would take any money from you. Ideally, there should exactly be some kind of a headman, there should be some kind of an administrator, a layman from the public who has to take care of cleaning, repairs, pay bills and maintain order. That is, the priest should be relieved of these duties as much as possible. He must work on his own spiritual growth. And when he walks on the spiritual path ahead of you, it will be easier for you to follow him on this path. Well, and then he won't do any anything stupid, then he won't rob you. Isn't that so? It is. There are a lot of such people. Of course, there are those who, well, cross the line, live by consciousness. Well, they exist in every organization, and there's just no way around that. Well, there are higher authorities. If such a person appears, that same parish can gather and decide that they do not need such a priest. They need someone different, a real one. They'll replace him immediately. Well, it's natural. This is a simple solution. but. Consciousness will be against it. Why should I give money? And then he comes when it's necessary. Well, you pay anyway. You still spend. Well, what's the difference? This way it would be all fair, nice and right. And at least there would not be any problems at any temple. Isn't that so? That is, it is not easy for the priests themselves to be in this position. This would be help, a great help. Yes. A person would have freedom, freedom from these material duties. What material to cover the roof with? what to use for heat this season. Well, this is household stuff. This is what a regular administrator should do. And priests have to deal with all this. Well, isn't that so?
And priests complain that so much time is spent on this administrative activity and all these issues, a great deal of it, educational activities, that there is no time even for prayer. And again, you have to understand how consciousness works, right? And I'm not surprised that there is no time for prayers. Again, when a person has a lot of material problems and he is constantly absorbed by these material problems, that means the activity of consciousness is very high. Does a person care about spiritual surges at this time? Well, that's a simple question. All he can do? He does all he can. Hoping that God will see his zeal and will be merciful. Will have mercy on him. Well, there is no free lunch, that's the problem. A person has to come on his own. It's extremely rare when people, as a reward for outstanding service, gain. Well, there is such an expression about peace and salvation that's actually it. It should be really earned in the eyes of the spiritual world, so that as a personality you would be taken and reared in the spiritual world like a baby. Well, this person has to get over a lot of things and do something extremely good, which depends on him. Well, these are rare phenomena. More often it's just the opposite. Yes, there is also a question from the lay people. That is, if everything is built correctly in an external temple, then how to build an internal temple? It's even easier than building an external one. The temple is within a human. It exists, that's the point. But unfortunately, there are two of them. And we covered this in the previous program. Here, you do not need to build it, you just have to enter it more often. The right temple, the temple of God, and not Satan's one. Then everything will be fine. Igor Mikhailovich, now I'd like to return to the questions which the consciousness of, well, different people appeals to, of both atheists, lay people and believers. Yeah, here's the next question. We partially revealed that if there is no God, then everything is allowed. If there is a confession, then it turns out you may sin as much as possible and then you will confess lying on your deathbed. Well, you may confess, but it won't help yourself. Of course, you may confess, but it won't make it any easier. If a person didn't start living during the lifetime, then, well, of course, that's not going to happen after death. And at the last minute, well, you cannot erase your life either. As we have already said, the spiritual path, it is not fast, and it requires tremendous effort effort from a person. Everything is not that simple. You won't be able to deceive God, no matter how hard consciousness would aspire to this. Right? Yes. There is also such an argument, if you don't consider time solely from the human point of view, then everything that happens to us at this very second will be happening to us eternally at this very second. So, we are, in fact, immortal if we equate time with other coordinates of space. This is not right, under no circumstances. This is an attempt of consciousness or the system to become equal to the spiritual world. It's like, this second will live forever and we will exist forever, under no circumstances. The spiritual world is eternal, it is static, it does not have flow of time. There is no time at all there, and cannot be. And since the material world cannot stop even for a one tiny moment, it always flies rapidly. While I said these words, we flew millions of kilometers in space. All our bodies, together with the planet. That is why there cannot be that point in time. Time forms precisely the process of expansion of, so to say, matter of the material world. That is, all the planets fly apart, the galaxies fly apart at enormous speed, everything spins, everything moves, that is, there is constant movement in the azosmic grid. This is the reason for the flow of time, and it doesn't stop for a single moment. Therefore, this is unrealistic. This is the desire and aspiration, I say once again, of Satan to become like God. That's not going to happen. Yes, the next argument is that I want to believe in God, but I can't meet a person who believes sincerely. And what does the person who believes have to do with your desire and aspiration for God? This is out of principle. Show me this and I will liken myself to Him. Yeah. Again, what's this? And whom does it come from? From consciousness. This is likening. It's someone's image, the work of mirror neurons, and so on. Yes. But where is aspiration for God? And in the question itself, I want to believe in God. Yes. But I don't strive for God, I don't inspire to enter the spiritual world. 
I want to believe this is already an exclusion. Well, this question comes from demons in the head. Thus, so to say, consciousness manipulates and plays with the personality and doesn't give a chance for liberation. Yes, it is related to the topic of authority, both among those people who follow the path and those who are lay people. That is, again, they're looking for authority. But what are they looking for? Not to, let's say, go along the same spiritual path as they did. But they're looking exactly for people on whom they can lay all responsibility for their future, for their spiritual salvation, for everything. That is, to shift responsibility from yourself to someone else. It's just like people, well, many people, especially those who are in religion, they say, Lord, in you the one I trust and completely surrender myself to your hands. Do with me whatever you want, as long as in the end everything is fine. So he said this and went to do everything that his consciousness told him. And he believes that this is God's will. If I wanted to, I deceive someone and the like, but it is God who wants it this way. After all, I put myself in his hands. This is abdication of responsibility. This is a a game of consciousness. This is manipulation, nothing else. No, this will not work. And in what case is the subject of authorities acceptable? Not even authorities, but teachers? Well, the only teacher is in heaven, as the Bible says. This subject is acceptable only if a person really aspires to God, follows the path himself and serves as an example to others, no more. However, this is a rare event, but it has the right to exist. Only in that case, let's say, one can learn something. Yet it must be realized and understood that everyone will walk his own way, solely one's own way, when he is on the path. It is impossible to walk along the same pathway, because this pathway is too short and it is within a person. So you have your own inner way, she has her own way, she can never follow your path because it's your body, your consciousness, your personality, excuse me, your soul. It's impossible. But it is impossible to be without mentors in the process of service. It's true, there's no other way. But this has nothing to do with spiritual salvation. It must be understood. And true service is those whom we call the Geliars. Or, well, from time immemorial, there have been those who really took the path of serving God. They serve not to some kind of organization, not the interests of organization in some organization, but they really serve God. Yet, this is due to the fact that people serving the spiritual world actively confronted, say, metaphysical manifestations, which come from those very servants of the devil and hinder people on the spiritual path. And it is they, the Geliars, who protect on this path. This requires tools. In addition to tools, it is natural that they receive certain spiritual powers that are capable of manifesting metaphysically in this world. But here, there's definitely no way without teachers. But these are extremely rare occasions that are not related to the spiritual path. This is the highest form of service. I already talked about this. When a person made it to the spiritual world, opened the door, took a step, then stopped, went back and stayed to serve the spiritual world, because those who remain in the world are dear to him. So he wants to ease for them, let's say, their way. Well, this is rare. But in order to learn here, of course, mentors are needed. But this is a rare phenomenon. Right. Here is another question about Gellership. Many people when they face some situations which, well, it's hard to cope with. Let's say they want to get this knowledge, these super abilities to somehow deal with the difficulties that they encounter. Actually, they want to get magical abilities in order to dominate other people. This is all that the consciousness urges them to do. People will cope with any obstacles, with any problems that stand in their way, if they really do strive for God, if the desire to live is above everything material in this world. 
But excuse me, if there is at least any value in this world for you about God's love, sincere and real, which you can acquire, you will never be saved. Because even the very understanding of equal value, and especially above, well, it eliminates the process of liberation, isn't it so? It is. So what kind of obstacles might a person have for which he needs tools, magical powers that he can influence other people and not only, to subordinate demons, to command them, so that they later attack unwanted neighbors who make noise at night. Igor Mikhailovich, people also wonder, what is the difference between religion and ethics? It is believed that religion teaches a human to be good. Well, ethics, it teaches people to do the right thing, according to, let's say, generally accepted norms. But religion, it gives a chance for spiritual salvation in addition. Well, because in religion there are grains of truth, spiritual grains that a person can comprehend and thus to be also safe spiritually. And ethics is just a set of morals, just masks, wearing masks. When you feel sick, yet you're smiling. However, religion teaches us to act exactly in such a way so as not to feel sick, but to understand the essence of things. The difference is substantial. Yes, and here's the next question. Who is more pleasing to God, an honest atheist or one who believed in Him because of fear? Neither. Only those who come to Him are pleasing to God. Excuse me, but I will give a simple example. Which of your excels is more pleasing to you? Do you know about them? No, I don't. Well, that's the answer for you. But excuse me, when it meets a spermatozoon and a life is conceived in you, nothing you can do, what you get is what will please you. Whatever it turns out to be later, isn't that so? Well, that's an earthly example. Here it can only have both gender and forms, and ultimately to be someone of his or her choice. But only equal and free ones come to the spiritual world, angels come there. And a person should acquire this life here in order to come there with joy. Because, as you can see, the filter is very considerable. There is a considerable filter in the role of Satan, which, let's say, eliminates any doubters, prideful ones and all the others. Although this same filter creates this interference. But excuse me, that's the weakness and immaturity of human, when he succumbs to temptation, isn't that so? If for a person, I say once again, something in this world is above God's love, then he's not worthy of the spiritual world. But this is his choice, and it's all fair. Igor Mikhailovich, there is also such a question, and it's a very common argument, that believers talk about eternal life, but still no one has ever returned from there. Who said that no one has ever returned from there? Jesus is a good example. To feel. Do people really see, say, other people who represent the interests of the spiritual world, let's say this carefully? After all, they look with the earthly eyes, and what do they see? An image, nothing more. And the image corresponds to their own image, which they see in the mirror, doesn't it? It's possible to feel, I'll put it simply, it's impossible not to feel. But again, this happens only when a person is able to perceive the sacred and spiritual. But if a person does not really perceive, for example, the representatives of the spiritual world, he does not feel them, but considers himself to be spiritually free, then all his freedom is dictated by demons in his head. That's it. Isn't it so? We have already spoken with you about this in the previous program, and I will say it again. True believers were, in fact, throwing stones at Jesus Christ Himself and crucified Him at the end. They did not see who was in front of them, and they did not feel it. So what kind of believers and true ones are they? That's the answer. 
There is another question. The root of religion is the practical powerlessness of a human. That is, atheists say that this is shifting responsibility onto God, that God is responsible for everything, that if God disappears, then everything will disappear, and then there will be no meaning to life of the believer. Well, here they are absolutely wrong. They are trying to argue without studying and knowing. It is not true. First, God cannot disappear. This is speculation from consciousness. But they say, if this particular religion disappears, then the meaning of human existence is also lost. If a person comes to religion not to increase the quantity of, let's say, the collective belonging to this institution, but to seek God, and he really is looking for God, then it does not matter what it's called, this or that religion. He is still looking for him. Well, isn't that so? Nothing will disappear for a person. But it's a jump scare and a horror story and such an argument from consciousness. Why? Because, God forbid, there appears a convincing proof of God's existence. Then what will the atheists do then? A simple question. What is it to them if God exists and there will be proof? And it exists, and there are many of them. Simply, let's say, the blind ones do not see the sunrise. Well, what can you do here? Well, he does not disappear because of this. The sun will rise as it always does, right? Regardless of the fact that someone does not see it. It can be also said that what the atheist consciousness does not agree with is religions propose to take a lot on faith, and the rule is that one should believe not with a head, but with a heart. But after all, it was God who created a human. He gave him a wonderful tool for cognizing the universe, mind, logic. It is with its help that we build airplanes, we take care of our teeth. And for some reason, while thinking about God, we must put aside both mind and logic. I believe that when we voluntarily give this up, it harms our faith. Undoubtedly, we upset the Creator. You know, I am with the atheist here. Definitely. After all, the first step on the way to God, a really true one, is to study your own consciousness with the help of your own consciousness, to study the devil, to study everything that it slips in. Only when you understand that your consciousness is not yours and that it is not you who is constructing these planes, but you are just financing these projects with the power of your attention, that you are wasting the days of your existence, only then you will start to understand that it turns out it's possible to exist differently. Only then, on this path, when you force the primary consciousness to study the secondary consciousness, will you begin to feel as a personality, like an observer of this process. It is only in this process that the first steps on the spiritual path begin. And to some extent, they are right here. And the tool that should enslave the personality, it also serves as the key to its locks. But these are not the only keys, right? Of course not. But this is the key that most people need. There is... In the transitional stage of this. At the initial stage of cognition. When a person feels the aspiration for God, but does not know how to get through, these are the first most reliable tools that really allow to do it. But again, you must be persistent and diligent here, because consciousness will erase any cognition, any revelation tomorrow. But once you read it, today a revelation came to you, you wrote it down with conclusions, with everything, and tomorrow you realize that you have lost something. And then you read your own notes, and again this insight comes to you, and you understand, and you write already a new one that consciousness is erasing. Why? For years you remember some nonsense, some rubbish, TV series, but it erases important and serious things and you begin to understand how the mechanism works, and this is a mechanism, how these programs work, and these are programs, these are directives, and then you realize that it turns out that your brain is a computer, it's a part of the system, the material part, but it appears that there is also something that is beyond the quantum limit, something that you cannot touch with your hands, that is consciousness, which affects the work of the brain only as an echo and when it is necessary. And then there is more. The next question is that, it isn't God who created a human in the image. But the human created God. Yes. This is a powerful argument they present. If there were no human, there would be no God. Why? Because a human invented God for himself and believes in him. 
Well, and the Brahmans, we have already discussed this in one of the programs on this topic, they went even further, that people create gods. Like, if we wish, we won't pray to this god, and that's it, he will disappear. But in fact, these are all games of consciousness. However, they please humans' megalomania. This is no longer likening to God, but it's already rising above Him. That's what the system is striving for. It strives to become like God, to reach those powers. But in fact, the system is absolutely dependent, just like any computer, on electricity. Just remove the battery from it, from the tablet, and that's all. It's that. Those powers that are given, say, to everything material, which were given upon creation, these are the powers coming from God, and the system understands this perfectly. That is why it wants to create a closed loop, and it desires. So, this desire for the ninth day, this myth, it very much excites the consciousness of many people to this day. And people, as I've said, are part of the computer network, everyone with their own computer, with their desires. And if the consciousness succeeds, so it hopes, in solving this problem, then the system will exist forever, and people will become absolutely immortal. That is, to create within the boundless world yet another boundless world, like that. But this is a fantasy. Why? I've already talked about this many times, because about the six dimensions where the material world exists, there are 66 dimensions, which are again related to the world, well, not quite a material one, yet not to the spiritual world either, and they control these six dimensions. This is firstly. And secondly, I will give a simple example. Now, think about a chamomile. Well, recall a chamomile. Good, you've thought, right? And now, guys, recall how a fish swims in the water. Just imagine any fish, a carp, a perch, whatever you like, how it swims in the water. You've recalled, but you've forgotten about the chamomile at that. So the whole material world, it is enough for the spiritual world to think about fish. This is just so you understand, and nothing more. And there are no material worlds at all. These are disparate things. Clearly. It's true. But that chamomile you were thinking of, it consumed your energy, and it was living at this time. And there were lots of processes which you weren't even aware of. This is also true. One more argument that Religions is just an untruthful speculation, a kind of fiction, and belief in a lie cannot be beneficial a priori. I'll say it more simply. Belief in a lie, of course, cannot be beneficial. It is fatal. But who is a liar, in fact? And everything falls into place. After all, is it not in our consciousness where a lie is born? Surely, in consciousness. Isn't that right? Is it not our consciousness that hinders and stands, say, as a stumbling block on the spiritual path, when a person aims to cognize the truth? After all, it's not through faith that a person is saved, but through knowledge, through the path, through aspiration. This is wonderful. Until he knows the truth. The truth and verity is one. It is God. All the rest is an image of chamomile in one's head. This is such a significant point you've just voiced, that the system and consciousness are always looking for a liar in the external, for example, in religion, Certainly. in the government, or somewhere else, but to see him… The point is that liars always blame others. This is the first rule for the system. It always substitutes and distorts everything, and it always shifts its own lie onto someone. That is, well, such a simple example. People always try to humiliate someone. Why? Because they believe that they exalt themselves this way. Well, these are false ideas, stupid ones, completely unrelated to reality. These are, let's say, foolish games among the dead. It doesn't mean anything. It's just, the dead entertain themselves this way. Just to know that the system, the liar, it lives inside of every human. It's living by life. Just to know that. Every person is deceitful, each one. There are no people who don't lie. Why? Because consciousness, it is a liar. Some people who strive to be completely honest are deceiving themselves. Duality. Of course, duality.
and you can't get away from it. They are running to the temple of Satan from morning till night, and they keep saying that they are not religious, those very atheists. Aren't they liars? But if you put away the rose-colored glasses and imagination, and look, in which temple and in front of which altar are you kneeling? And here everything will become clear, even to them. But one must be extremely brave, one must possess a great courage to face the truth. The whole atheism is basically built on pridefulness. Well, that's why it exists, because pridefulness exists, as well as likening and confrontation. After all, look, even a small part of the whole system, a human, he opposes himself to God. Well, there's the answer for you human consciousness. Right. So the next question also, atheists, as well as ancient atheists, considered religion to be evil, because by imposing fear of gods and after-death life, it deprives a person of happiness. Well, I'll put it this way. In this case, they are right to some extent. They are wrong in saying that religion is evil. But the fact that they impose the fear of God, this is evil. It is impossible to love someone you're afraid of. For example, if I'm afraid of a dog, how can I love it? Well, or a rabbit bear, say, or not a rabbit one, but an angry bear. Well, I'm afraid of it, so why should I love it? Or a snake, are you going to declare your love to it? Here is a simple example. Imagine a poisonous cobra in an attack stands in front of you, and you say, you're so beautiful, I love you, right? Well, consciousness urges many people. They take the scriptures and go to read them to lions, because someone wrote that even a wild animal will not touch you. Well, as a rule, it ends in a little outcome. Why? Because they simply don't understand the voice of a human. And to animals, holy writings are just a mumbling of food in front of them. Right? That's the point. It is only through love that one can come to God. There is no other way. And there cannot be. It turns out that consciousness has mixed two concepts together and presented them in such a form, at the same time accusing religions by saying that they are evil, because they do impose the fear of God, not fear of losing God, like God-fearing. Well, I think we've also explained this, but the fear of God Himself. A substitution. This is how it works. But at least we clearly see, based on these questions, who uses them as arguments? It is the demons who do. But where is the personality? Where is the human? Just a grey mass, manipulated by Satan. Isn't that so? Yeah. Well, consciousness always says it can't be so simple. Of course. It just can't be. Well, consciousness always says that it cannot be, and especially when it concerns the spiritual world. Well, because consciousness cannot do this. Consciousness can't even approach the spiritual world. That's why it is outraged, because there is so much life, there is so much energy there. And there is no way it can. And it cannot connect to it. It simply can't. This is, you know, like a fisherman. There is a lake open for fishing, but there is no fish. Yet there is a closed one where there are a lot of fish. You want to, but you can't. Well, something like that. By the way, some of the main questions of believers in different religions are the questions basically the answers to which you voice in various programs, including the program Consciousness and Personality, From the Inevitably Dead to the Eternally Alive, and in the Elettra book. I will simply read these questions, because if people are watching for the first time, they can at least refer to the sources where these answers are. Why did God create the world and a human being? What was life of a human like in Paradise? What is the cause of human fall? What is the ancestral sin? And other questions. Let's put it simply. The answers to these exist. And if anyone is interested, let them watch the programs you've mentioned. I think that will be honest and fair. Yes, because besides these questions, which we've just voiced, there is really a huge number of them. Consciousness is confusing so much. Let's do it. Let's try. Let's efficiently approach the time. Yes. Because there's not that much time. Here, lay people ask a question. Who is the devil and how does he operate? And the Church answers them that it's somebody who provokes you into... That's right. Into evil. That is, the image that is formed among, let's say, believers, that the devil is something like someone third in some image, more often with a pig's snout, with hooves, a tail and horns. Right. Well, something that looks like a goat. So then, if you want to see this goat, look in the mirror. 
Sometimes it's pretty cute, because matter, especially living matter, is an if it's also a thinking one, this is a prime example of the very same devil. The devil, this is not something objectified, but it's a common name for a bunch of demons which... Well, for understanding, yes, there are a lot of ants, but there is a common consciousness of these ants. So it is this common name, this is the devil. Or even simpler, there are a lot of computers that are connected into one network. This is nothing more than the Internet. They share information with each other. Here, the Internet, it is the devil. And consciousness, well, let's say, in each computer there are programs. Well, these features are exactly the demons. Well, this is such an understanding. And for what the devil is generally needed, we do understand how he operates through us, through our consciousness. We talked a lot about this, and he does it every second, all the time. And we also need to emphasize for people's understanding, Jesus and that very Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were constantly fighting with their consciousness. Is not that so? It is. And this has been clearly written about. And Muhammad, he was also an example to his followers. How much time he spent on spiritual practices, in order to tame his consciousness, in order to subdue it to himself like a wild beast. Is not that so? It is. After all, we should precisely follow the examples of such teachers. This is blissful. There is also this question on the eternal subject of good and evil. There is simply a lack of understanding in the explanations that are given well, let's say, traditionally. Well, everything seems to be clear about good, that this is God Himself and everything that originates from Him and surrounds Him. It's not true. Good is understood in different ways. Everything that surrounds Him. Well, for example, you want to eat, I give you an apple. Is it a good action? It is a good one. What does God have to do with this? After all, there are two natures in a human, and the choice is made by the personality. What has dominated in the personality is what has produced a result. But is it a good or bad deed? From the perspective... When you wanted to eat, I gave you an apple. It's a good deed. A good one. How do you know? Maybe you have something I need, and I just came with a different purpose in order to find the right approach to you. It may lie just over there, on the back shelf. On the surface, it is a good deed. But in fact, I am pursuing my own interests because I might need something from you. All this is twofold, this is a material world. And once again I say, good and evil are done by people, by their choice. That's why, to classify something and separate, attributing it to God or something else, God-pleasing deeds or not God-pleasing, it is God-pleasing when a person already goes into the spiritual world, out of this hell. That's God-pleasing. When a person acts in such a way, that he helps himself go to the spiritual world, and if he helps others as well, and really helps them, he doesn't alter or invent something, but shares tools and helps people to get out, that's God-pleasing. All the rest, these are worldly affairs, it has nothing to do with the spiritual world. But it has to do with the personality itself. The more developed the personality is, the higher level of conscious, the more good deeds he does, the less he listens to the bad in his consciousness, the less evil is in him. It's good. Good for what? For the personality, for the freedom of the personality. But to cover it up with God-pleasing deeds or not God-pleasing ones, this is a manipulation. Excuse me, a religious manipulation. It's also interesting that they say that evil in and of itself is not real, meaning it doesn't exist, so it shouldn't frighten or scare us. Only by our negligence we bring it to life. Of course, this is said exactly by those who do evil in order to justify it. If they say evil doesn't exist, well, God forbid they meet someone worse than they are, because this is an attempt at self-justification, because in the consciousness of these people such things are going on that even Chikatilo didn't dream about it. You see, this is 100%. They mute the voice of conscience. Of course, they say that evil does not exist, there is no good, there is no evil. So what does exist then? They do? Just them and that's it. And the whole world revolves around their egocentrism, right? Well, because they are the center of the egoism of the whole world. Even the devil is running errands for them. Now then... There is such a contradictory concept. It is said, do not judge. But in another case, it is said, judge with righteous judgment. What is the righteous judgment? Well, righteous judgment is... 
I would say it this way. The righteous judgment in this world means according to the law of the country you live in. But these laws were written by people and invented by people. This is a certain agreement in society, so it is they who create a righteous judgment. While everything else falls within the domain of judgment, well, it goes much higher. And there can be only one judgment. Whether there will be a future for humanity or like Atlantis with all the others. This is the judgment. This is serious. And all the rest are private issues. And I'll put it simply, God does not judge. God, He is far above all this. There are those who deal with this kind of foolishness. Atlantis is an example. There is also such a topic, what is heartlessness? What is an unfeeling person? An unfeeling person? Well, this is the majority of people who greatly prevail, unfortunately, in this world. This is a lack of perception of the spiritual world by the deepest feelings. That's what an unfeeling person is, while everything else is an emotional one or an emotionless one. And as to feeling, well, a feeling, it comes from the personality. And when the personality is developed, it perceives everything that comes from the spiritual world or comes from a person. Well, this is a feeling person. Where does true repentance lead a person? Well, that depends on one's understanding of true repentance, you see. Repentance is admission of one's mistakes. Well, for example, I got an F for dictation, then I come and repent, will I get an A for this? Until I correct it, nothing will happen. Until I stop serving Satan, I won't get closer to the spiritual world. And just going around saying, oh, I did it, I have done it, consciousness, I'm sorry it had failed me, and I did that. Well, yes, so what? Well, you've repented, yes, so learn. These are your problems. Take a diary, learn, write it down, and don't do such bad things, right? But if you do it every time, and every time you repent, repent, then where you were sitting, there you will stay. There is even such a rule that the more you repent, the better you are. And you're always… Better what? You become better as a person, you get cleansed, you become sinless. Well, I will say it this way. Well, how is it to be sinless? A person cannot be sinless while consciousness controls him. And since you repent, then you have a reason for that, isn't it so? Yes, it, it means is. every time you do something, well, and where are you? Yes. And who are you? Right. And every time it's called true repentance. Well, that's what people call it. Again, everyone has their own traditions. That's why we cannot discuss traditions. We can talk fundamentally about the essence of things. And in this case, I'm talking fundamentally about the essence of things. Repentance is an understanding of the process of consciousness manipulating you as a personality. For example, you have understood this situation, you've voiced it, for example, among your friends, and altogether you already do not make such mistakes. That is, you know the patterns of consciousness and don't go that road again. This is the point. And if every time you do it again and talk about it all the time, well, guys, it's your choice. You can do this as much as you want. It's your life, and you can do whatever you want with it. It's great that it's not just about repenting somewhere inside, realizing it, and not acting like that anymore, but sharing it with others, so that others… Well, that's the point. If we take the repentance as catharsis purification, which was used before, this was exactly the studying, a collective study of Satan, meaning of the work of one's own consciousness, the study of patterns, how it traps, what it talks about. They studied collectively and collectively tried not to make the same mistakes. You know, it's like when a D miner went through the minefield and the rest followed in his tracks and everyone arrived alive. Whereas if someone misstepped, it's his choice. He just wanted to take a step to the side. Why should I walk like everyone else? I can walk nearby, I'm brave. Brave he was. While the non-brave ones survived, that's it. That is, it fundamentally changes the notion of what repentance is and what confession is. Consciousness plays with people, and it distorts everything. Everything. It distorts even the concept of repentance. And every week, every month, people go, repent of committing their sins, and think that they are being saved this way. Well, this way they... Forgive me, God, they're messing with the priest's head, you see? Nothing more. 
and basically the priest is no longer interested in it, and this is no longer a service, not a job, and they are not repenting, simply some kind of foolishness is going on. Also, in addition, I would just like to say that there is such a thing in Orthodoxy as crying, the crying of the believer, and they say that there is a great benefit of this crying, and there is even… I'll put it this way. Instructions. There is such a thing when there are certain families where the wife uses this tool and she bargains something from her husband in her favor. So she cried a little here, a little there. Well, no matter how you strain yourself, they say husband is certainly the head, but wife is the neck. Where it turns, there the head turns. So crying is this tool of turning. Well, so why not do the same with God, right? Consciousness tells this. Because he is a comforter. If I cry and suffer, that means I yarn, I strive so much, I feel so bad. But if you feel bad, I'll put it simply, here's a simple banal example. Would you like to be around a whiner? I would want to run away. Well, that's the answer. But for the spiritual world, these egoists who are just busy with fussing about themselves and crying for themselves, and these really are egoists. They think that this way they are crying for the whole world, they are saving it, they are crying for themselves, for their sinfulness. But this is precisely sin. Instead of loving, living, really living, getting filled with this power, they like, excuse me, flush all this down the toilet. While they get filled with tears and grief, they put on a show in front of others to attract everyone's attention to themselves. And they say this is what spirituality is. Well, if they think so, it's their right, it's their choice. No one forbids anyone to do anything. They want to cry, let them cry, O oh Lord. That is, this moment of whining is the moment of feeding the system. What is self-pity in general? It's selfishness. As simple as that. Well, or simply put, these are far-seeing people who are crying over themselves beforehand. This is the only foresight that exists. Why is there such an addiction in people, like a narcotic one, to constant crying and whining? Well, it's endorphins kicking in. After that, again, this is commonplace physics, it's all based on emotions. These people are completely controlled by their consciousness and obey their body. In fact, when a person cries, it is followed by relief. They feel a certain euphoria. Simply put, it's enough for a person, well, if he has a healthy spine, to jump for a long time, and then euphoria comes. To swim, provide a workout or run a long way, the same euphoria follows. Instead of crying, it'd be better if they jogged, let's say, well, if health condition permits it, of course. Why? Because traumatization happens in that case, the body perceives this as running means constant shock to the joints, including the joints of the spine, they're better innervated. Well, the body knowingly blocks and produces endorphins. It also produces endorphins for the production of acids, okay? I'm way off base. But what's the point? Doesn't matter reaction to the body or to whining. When there is such a heartbreaking whining and the like, as compensation the body produces endogenous opiates, that is, the same endorphins, an outburst, and the person feels euphoria and elation, and he perceives it as a gift from God. That is, a person cannot achieve God's love and gain real happiness. He can't even come into contact with it, but he agrees to tricks from consciousness and literally to substitution, you see? Here I'll just give you an example. Well, to eat a homegrown chicken raised on pure wheat, or, excuse me, genetically modified, who knows what, which is a jellyfish and a shrimp, and something else lives in it. Plus, it's fed with antibiotics and all this. Well, where's the benefit? It looks like a fowl by size, and the taste is somewhat similar. But then one develops allergies and a bunch of diseases, while the first one benefits health, right? See the difference? Well, this is meant basically for primitive people, let's say with limited thinking. Thank you, Igor Mikhailovich. I think that this will radically change the attitude of other people. I hope, I When hope. they encounter moaning and pity for themselves in their consciousness. They will not change. Do you know why? Because they do not hear me. In order to hear, they need to feel. And how will they hear me when they are busy, these egoists, only with themselves and with their weeping? They're a kind of drug addicts. They cannot hear anyone, especially me, believe me.
They are more likely to listen to someone else in their head, because they kneel and ask for earthly things in another temple. Yes, and the next question is, why is God's grace? I plead for it so much, but it descends more often on those who are indifferent to it. In this case, God's grace is perceived as material benefits, its assets, money, order in the house, health and the like. It descends on those, that is, a person lives by deception, sells in the market, cheats, overweights, and he has a beautiful house, a good car, everyone in his family wears fur coats, while I work honestly, I pray, yet grace doesn't come to me, that is, God doesn't send me a freebie, right? Is this what grace really is? It's not grace, it's earthly matters. It's all satanic, let's say, games. While grace is God's love, it is to give grace. But grace in this case is replaced by consciousness for some kind of capitalization, material acquisitions. Look how consciousness substitutes. The most real, the most valuable that can be is life. What could be more important? And this is replaced by a desire for some house or a fur coat. Well, where are you going in this fur coat? Well... Into the spiritual world. Yes. Well, let's just say, listening to these questions, I understand one thing, that the filter works great. That's why it is needed. Let's try to clean it. There is such a very common question. They do not understand how to know God's will. Is that God pleasing and His will, or is something not God pleasing? Wait, what does it mean to know the will of God? Is there a will of God for this or that matter? How to understand? Now I will read in order not to be unfounded. It's like, can I explain? Okay. So I wake up in the morning and ask a question. It's the same as via the intercom, right? I say, so God, which foot should I get up with? He said, get up with the left one. I say, well, I'm lying on the right side. It's not convenient, maybe with the right one? He says, no, that's my will. So I get up with the left foot and everything is fine. Whereas if I get up with the right one, I fall down and get hurt, or I don't find my slippers and have to go to the bathroom barefoot. Well then, is that what God's will means? Well, it's all games and mockerings of consciousness. Well, honestly speaking. Three-dimensionality. Well, just imagine, what kind of pridefulness and megalomania is imposed by consciousness on a person if he thinks that God does nothing but plans one's every step. The system, yes, it plans, because this is a program. It has to do it like that. It's like, excuse me, a navigation system, right? You turn it on in your phone, how to get from point A to point B, and it shows you step-by-step -step instructions. You change the detour, went off the route, and it shows you another way, but again to the same point. The only thing is that the very point in the navigator, forgive me, but it's death, it's a personality. And it will show you no matter how far you up the route, it will draw a lot of roads for you. Rearrange the route. In different ways. Yes, whereas, excuse me, the spiritual world is life. It is freedom, no roads are there. Life is there. And there is a huge difference here. And in in this case, what a megalomania a person has if he says, how can I distinguish God's will? What can I do? What do I do about my neighbor? And what do I discuss with my neighbor in the evening? Or rather, what do I do with my neighbor in the evening? And everything has to be controlled by God. That is, again, we are talking about shifting of the responsibility for oneself onto someone else. In this case, of course, it would be best to shift it onto God, so that a place in paradise is guaranteed, where a lion and a rabbit are sitting side by side, munching a carrot, and both are happy. Both are material and in the three-dimensional image. Everything is fine. Because it is comprehensible to consciousness this way, this is what it's able to perceive, and people perceive it. But they can't, excuse me, work on spiritual self-development. Regardless of what religion this person practices, if he really wanted to know God, he would understand that that world is non-material, and that God really exists. And in fact, the person is responsible for oneself. And a human can fulfill the will of God only when he is on the path of service. But until, excuse me, he hasn't even saved himself and doesn't aspire, how can he serve God? That's a simple question. It's same, you know, as, well, I want to dance a ballet, sign me up, right? 
Well, imagine to sign me up for a ballet now. Well, they will sign me up, of course. Well, for I have friends, kind people. They will say, of course, Mikhailich, we'll sign you up. What will I do there in the ballet? Make people laugh? I see it's already funny to you. Well, it is just as funny to me to listen to such people. Sorry for the truth, people, but it's true. God gives grace to the humble ones. What does it mean to be humble? In this case, if we look at the root of this issue, where it came from, the humble one in this case is the person who controls his consciousness, and the grace is what God's love is. This is exactly how I would express it. The Lord gives life to those who defeated the devil within themselves, if interpreting this correctly. But it may be interpreted in various ways. By consciousness it will be interpreted as obedient, submissive. And surely submissive and obedient not to God, but someone who is supposedly an intermediary, well, a representative of some organization. And humbling means you were blessed to rejoice, so rejoice. That will be all the grace. Well, that's if you interpret it from the perspective of consciousness. But actually, I have said what it is. This expression has existed since ancient times, and overall, the understanding of it has been well described. Igor Mikhailovich, also there are many talks about such a tool as Jesus' prayer. And this is a great tool. A great tool. Yes, and it's one that really works. And I must say that a lot of people, thanks to it, have joined the ranks of angels. This is a good one. But it requires a tremendous zeal. And the problem here is that people were using the method of elimination. That is, they eliminated any thought, suppressing it with an inner aspiration precisely for Jesus Christ, with a striving to join Him. This is that huge say, this enormous potential, all of it was precisely redirected and deepened into this prayer. This is a desire and aspiration to get into the spiritual world. Well, of course, imagine what kind of resistance they had from the system itself. It's a hard way indeed. Of course, using other tools is much easier to build a house. Well, this is a good tool. As a matter of fact, there are also substitutions, right, already now, at the present stage. Jesus' prayer is very simple, and it is very easy to understand. It is the attainment of God's love and strengthening of it. It's this entire thought is directed and brought into a single point. That is, what does it mean? The power of attention is put only in God's love, in love and devotion to Jesus Christ, that's all. And this means that spiritual world is perceived through Him. Well, what's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong. It's absolutely a working tool. But it's a hard one. And the substitution here is just that many people, they were likening themselves to those who passed this hardest way. Well, say, talking is easier than walking, you see? Just imagine, if we would now be carrying a huge load on our shoulders and climbing the mountain, or would we sit here and talk? Well, it's certainly easier. It's just that you said, to direct this power of attention, right? The point is that this understanding has already been lost. What kind of power of attention is? How to… Well, the fact that the system takes away the tools from the people because of their stupidity, well, it's true, of course. But thank God a description has been preserved of those who truly passed. However, the trouble is that a lot of chaff has been added by those who didn't pass this way, but only tried to. He withstood a day or two, then it became hard, well, when he sees someone, he kinds of whispering something. You see, that's a huge difference. This is an inner prayer, not a whispering with lips. Those who whisper, they are likening themselves. After all, they need to show that they are in this prayer. As soon as someone has left, snoring is heard in the cell. Well, there are many of those as well. This is this consciousness. Well, they still want to be extolled and considered to be the ones who have also cognized. Well, one can see by their deeds who they are. Be that as it may. Well, in general, Jesus' prayer unfolds perception through feelings. This is a good tool, but a very hard one. The question is, why are the saints, friends of God, sometimes being persecuted and rejoice in persecution? I'll give you a simple example. Again, why are they being persecuted? Because they are dangerous for the system. And here is a simple practical example. 
When you are doing something and you feel consciousness activating, even in a group, yes, well, the people, you also rejoice as it means you are doing the right thing. Well, is that the right answer? Yes. Well, you see? Well, for people to understand, when people are on the spiritual path, and really acquire God's love, and they strive to do something good for people, and the system gets activated, the devil gets activated, and they start to be persecuted, a lot of problems arise. They are happy because they are doing a God-pleasing deed, and they are doing the right thing. Yet Satan is angry. Well, that's why they are happy, that they at least, in some way, may travel for the Horned One. That's great. Well, actually, they rejoice because without leaving their, let's say, path leading to God, they are acquiring new strength, and they are happy with the love that overflows them, and not those troubles that are happening. Only a fool can think that they are happy because they are hurt. No, they have the same pain as you have. Well, they rejoice at the inner forces, the love that fills them, and the body. The body is mortal anyway. Sooner or later we will die anyway. The question is, where you will be? Yes, when you understand it internally, then it's just… it's… Yes, but our topic today is not about this. Our topic is questions from the mind, right? Yes. Well, basically, it's a common situation, both for believers and people who follow the spiritual path, when at some point a prayer or a spiritual practice is already becoming a formality, such a… Why is this happening? Because at first a person gets a spiritual impulse on a certain wave. For example, a person felt God's love, right? He just felt it, and it filled him. He wants to be there, right? After all, this is great, well, if he can feel, of course. But if he's not able to feel, but God's love is emanating, then consciousness will become outraged. But the question is that God's love, if you don't acquire it, meaning you don't increase it and it is unrequited, then, well, as Winnie the Pooh said, it's like honey, it gradually runs out, because you eat it and it runs out. You enjoy this love after all, and it is used but it isn't multiplied. And as soon as it has weakened, consciousness starts to attack at that time, right? So it turns out that the next day you don't feel it already. And consciousness says, was it there or not? So at first, having felt this grace, you do it with eagerness, you do prayer, you thank God for this gift, because you feel it, and you are overfilled with this joy, and it is alive inside of you. Even consciousness stops, doesn't want to understand something different, because you are filled. But at this time it comes from you, from all your heart. Your prayer, your spiritual practice, no matter how you call it, is alive. But one has only to get a little distracted, to think about chamomile, about something else, and the power abates. Then you begin to do a prayer, but that happiness isn't there. You perform a spiritual practice, but it is empty. And the next day, it is even worse. But you do it because it has to be done, isn't that so? But the question is, what are you doing? You are trying by means of your consciousness to evoke, to perceive that spiritual, which was sent down from the spiritual world, isn't that so? To simulate. Consciousness becomes sad and bored. Well, it doesn't like to do this, it is not its cup of tea. And it starts telling you that you are wasting time. But on the other hand, it tells you, no, do it, do your best, because consciousness is twofold. Well, on the one hand, it pushes you, and on the other hand, it laughs at you. You as a personality become sad indeed. Well, and you begin to listen to consciousness, and then everything turns into emptiness. But what could you do? And you could have Lived. not stopped it. You could have stayed in this love. You just shouldn't stop the dialogue with God. But the dialogue with God is not a chatter from consciousness about one's problems and desires. It is exactly an inner impulse and life. Isn't that so? It is. 
Only this works, while everything else is tricks of the one who is called Satan. These are substitutions. They are cruel, but fair. Why fair? Because you are financing them. You as a personality, you choose whom to serve and what to perceive. That's why this is absolutely fair. God's will and inner freedom, are these the same things? No, these are completely different things. Inner freedom is God's love, which grants you all this, while the God's will well, it occurs and manifests itself only in the case, I'll say it once again, when a person is on the path of service. That is, he uses certain tools to add new angels to an already boundless world. Here's, let's say, such a difference. Freedom is love, it's life, it's freedom. Oh, Igor Mikhailovich, the wave is very good, while well, the questions… Well, I don't even want to divert. Well, there is actually a substitution from the system in the fact that the system constantly wants to slip into a person a result and some kind of guarantee that he will be saved. And what's interesting is that it invents very easy ways of salvation, as if salvation is an easy path, either some indulgences or just to accept. Well, salvation is indeed a very easy path. The question is in something else. The question is that the system takes over this function onto itself. It's just a deceitful lie. Well, that's the way it solves its problems. But after all, people also feel that this is a lie. Excuse me, you come to an organization, they write out a piece of paper for you, you pay for it with a bag of gold, and you've already been saved. It's chartered for you, already the place is provided, that's it. This is not some kind of a hotel where you've booked a double room, for example, or a single or some luxury suit. I don't know, a presidential one, well, depends on how much money you have, and it is waiting for you for eternity. Well, so, after all, people themselves understand that this is foolishness, it's just playing around in order to clear one's conscience. This position is convenient for them, right? Meaning… Of course it's a convenient position, to brag in front of a neighbor. Well, we also have people, well, I understand, if one presents to someone, let's say, a star name, then name the star, well, in your honor, they present it to you just in order to satisfy your megalomania. But when a person pays money to name a star after him, which no one will ever hear about, it's really ridiculous. How do you know where this difference between prayer and magic lies? Oh, there's a very clear difference here. And everything is really very simple. A prayer, it is like Jesus' prayer. No one asks for anything except God's love. So a prayer directed to the salvation of the soul, to God's love, to the expression of love and gratitude for God, this is a prayer. And everything where something is being asked for, that's magic. And here is the difference. Prayer to God, it is performed, well, indeed, sincerely and with aspiration. Well, it's like consciousness doesn't even enjoy pronouncing such prayers. Here it comes more from feelings, where is a request for oneself, it always comes from consciousness. Well, the Personality will never ask God for anything except an aspiration for home. Everything is very simple, no matter what it is. Even if you pray for the salvation of the whole world, just simply of the kitten, the whole world, yourself, well, whatever, everything that is related to the material world, that's all magic. And long ago it was said, don't ask God for anything except for your own salvation, well, except God's love as it was before, and your own salvation. They called it in different ways. Then ultimately, they started to call it salvation of their souls. Well, this is such a cliché, although this is wrong, of course. We have already said, salvation of one's soul is the same as salvation of a live ring. Well, it just doesn't sink. You need to save yourself as a personality. It is for this that you are given this life ring, that which is called the soul. This is exactly the door that leads to the spiritual world. It is near, and the home is near. Well, but you can't come in, say, prematurely. There is also such a concept as righteous anger towards otherwise minded, including in the family, in the society and in religion. Can anger be righteous? No, of course not. 
Definitely not. Well, how can anger be righteous? Well, I'll put it simply again. If we look at it all globally, due to the fact that it's a substitution and aggravation of it, anger may be righteous. I gave an example of Atlantis. Yes, that was righteous anger, which simply wiped the civilization of the face of the Earth, having washed it away and destroyed it. But it's like a useless weight. Yet, in relation to people, this cannot be manifested. First of all, righteous anger comes through the spiritual world, from the spiritual world. Well, how can it be in people, especially in those who are as far from the spiritual world as I am from ballet? But this is a convenient form of manipulation, to declare someone a Satan, and to bring down all one's righteous anger upon him. Thus, one's earthly problems are easily solved under the guise of, let's say, postulates. Of selfishness and defending their thoughts. Yeah, of course. Are they theirs? Igor Mikhailovich, there is also such a question. Lay people believe that holiness is the destiny of chosen ones. Of course, holiness is the destiny of chosen ones. But people are not born chosen, they become chosen, because to step over Satan and come to the spiritual world, that's worth a lot. And holiness is, again, accumulation and retention of those spiritual powers. Here, to put it simply, a holy person or a saved one, there is a huge difference. That is, holy or alive, there is a difference. That means a person is still here, but he's already acquiring during his lifetime. During temporary life, our earthly life, he acquires eternal life. This human is already free and saved one. Whereas a holy one is filled with this power, this grace, this God's love, and he holds it just like a miser and doesn't share it with anyone, but he's constantly increasing it. Well, he shares, of course, it's impossible. I'm just saying it's... I've said it in good context that he doesn't share it with Satan but he happily shares it with other personalities. That's why it is multiplying in him. This is who a saint is, the one who doesn't lose this power of love, this inner light. And why they are called saints? Because they are shining what they share. Yes, there is another similar question, that you have to wait for grace to descend upon you, and you don't need to do anything for that yourself. You're sitting. Well, again, these are directives from consciousness, meaning be obedient, sit quietly, wait, and it will definitely descend upon you. That is, do nothing. Well, it's very convenient. It's the same as when, you know, you owe money to someone and tell him, sit still and wait, and I'll bring it to you. A year, two, three, five, ten, and there already, as one fascinating Eastern poet said, right? He said, either the donkey will die, or the sultan, or me. It will be resolved somehow. The same is here. Sit and wait. Most importantly, don't do anything. Don't prevent consciousness from stealing from you, stealing in large quantities, taking away your life and every chance. But you sit and wait. If you want to live, get up and go. There is no other way. If you sit, life will not come to you. Igor Mikhailovich, there is also this question. In many religions there is such a thing that there will come a day when weighing on the scales of good and evil deeds will take place. What kind of weighing is this? What kind of day is it? The day, this is what your life actually is. That's what the day is. And you are the scales. And every second, every minute you are weighing it all. Because a human born he is already dying, and he is the scales of his actions. And if good and God-pleasing deeds prevail in you, then you will attain life. Having attained it here, you will cross the bridge to life eternal. But the bridge from death to life is, in fact, this existence of yours. So, it's not some kind of a judgment day, but it's what happens to the person in every… Judgment day? Well, one can say both, a judgment day, and it may be called Armageddon, but everyone has his own one. It's just that for someone, life consists of many years, decades, and the like. But in reality, it's just one day, even less. 
In the morning it has begun, the sun has risen, and in the evening it went off into the sunset. The same is with life. Well, not long ago, people had this understanding. There is another question. When a person develops spiritually and begins to look for confirmation of his spirituality in the external, that he's doing the right thing, whether his eyes are shining, how he looks outwardly… Well, eyes are shining. Eyes may shine for many different reasons. Smoke got into one's eyes, he was cutting up an onion, someone stepped on his foot. Well, eyes may also shine with tears, and, and tears can be different. There are tears of sorrow and of joy. This is not an indicator. Life in the eyes, this is an indicator. But the issue is that not everyone sees them, but everyone feels. The only thing is that sometimes consciousness revolts and perceives it as a hateful gesture. And it often happens, well, you know from your own experience, you come in and feel hateful glances. Why? Because they are envious, they liken themselves and so on. Isn't that so? Eyes of very few light up in response when you come in. Well, isn't that so? And the others, just the opposite. It's even visible how their muscles tighten. Why? Who is controlling whom? When God lives in people, He rejoices in you that you have come. But when, excuse me, the devil rules them, he begins to move these horns of his over there. People feel pain inside, so they clench, become tense. That's your answer. And this is just you. Isn't that so? Let's move on. There is also such a, well, just a common expression among people, that you need to worry about someone, to ache for someone. And what is aching for someone? Well, this is direct expression. It is, in fact, you know, language is a very interesting thing. And the system, it actually gives a lot of signs and calls a lot of things by their real names. Well, let's say you are worried about someone. Means you are spending your life for someone's sake. You ache for someone, you are experiencing pain instead of someone. Well, if you translate this into normal language, then by your actions you are simply wasting your time pointlessly, and you are putting the power of your attention into the system, you are feeding it. Whom is it better for? It's better for demons, it's better for the system. But is it better for you? Of course not. You are just living through your life or burning through your days, month and the like. That is, you are shortening your real life, reducing your chances of spiritual salvation, because you are just flushing this power down the toilet. Excuse me, well, this is a direct expression, so that everyone understands. Igor Mikhailovich, there is also this common question in Christianity, that people, in their daily prayer, they commemorate the deceased, and it is believed that the commemoration of the dead, it can somehow improve or ease their situation. What did Jesus Christ say? After all, in Christianity, who is Jesus to a Christian? Tell me, who is above? The one who later wrote these prayers and made people act this way? Or Jesus? What did Jesus say? Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Let the dead take care of the dead, while the alive ones are walking the same path as we do. When a person commemorates a deceased person in prayers and wishes him the best and tries to beg for something, to bargain, he's feeding the system. Yes, we have already spoken about this more than once. Indeed, subpersonality feels better for a short while, but the costs are immense. For the dead, it eats an awful lot. Well, for them it's disease. I'll give an absolutely simple example. Imagine, a person is very hungry and experiencing a constant hunger, and you, well, I don't know, gave him a small piece of bread. You took your own daily ration from yourself, but you gave him just a little crumb. He won't survive thanks to this and won't be saved. But for a moment, 
he will quench his thirst. After all, for sub-personalities that wandered through centuries, for them a day of satiation, well, yeah, is a holiday for a short period of time. But what will happen to him when you also become a sub-personality? Who will feed him? Well, a simple example. If a person, well, maybe it's not moral, maybe it's not good and the like, but this is consciousness talking. Why? Because it is beneficial for the consciousness to be fed. And it builds a whole system of continuity so that children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, we already talked about it, keep on feeding and feeding and feeding it. Because, well, it's beneficial, convenient and nice to be fed, isn't that so? Maybe you shouldn't be hoping to be fed, but should be attaining life, so as not to die, so that no food would be needed. Isn't that so? They say, yes, you can feel thirsty, or you can become an ocean. That's the difference. What is religious fanaticism? Religious fanaticism? Well, it is the same thing as atheism. It is, first of all, denial of God, it's not knowing God. These people fanatically believe in the dogmas of their institution, their religion, and they do what the authorities say. Meaning, this is actually what fanaticism is, but by no means it is knowledge of God. Because these people, they will very strongly rest against and resist the truth. It's, well, we often notice it when people, well, defend their religion, excluding everything else. They don't even allow a thought that in another religion it is just as good as your religion, where people can save themselves as well. And they have been saving themselves, and they will be saving themselves. Well, no, only our religion, this is. And in the name of God I will do anything, he says. And I'll kill anyone, right? Well, there's your answer. This is the path of death. This is lack of knowledge, and above all, it's laziness, slave-like existence, one of the forms of consciousness substitution. Well, what will you do? There is also a very frequent phenomenon among representatives of different religious organizations, sects, occult and magic salons, when they operate with one and the same phrase when performing some ritual action. And so they say, by the authority vested in me by God, or by the power vested in me by the Almighty, I give you permission for something, or I release you from something, or endow you with something, give you absolution, and so on. That is, it's a matter of power and authority, which is allegedly given by God to one or another representative of the organization. Well, even Christian texts mention when it came to the Apostles and the Almighty. I'll say this way. It all comes from the desire and striving of the system itself, let's say, to possess certain power. But the forerunner of all this, if we take Christianity, then in fact Jesus endowed some of his disciples with certain power. Some of them, I emphasize, of whom we don't even hear now, they did possess certain power. But again, they were at the service. You need to understand this, service in the highest understanding. And indeed, they were endowed with power. And the rest, well, they are likened. After all, it's nice to know that you possess certain power just because you are in this organization. Well, that's a custom, so it happens. Well, what will you do? That's the way it is. And it is believed that, for example, was given power, some sort of power of demons or something else. The point is different. A person has come to such a clergyman, and he says that by the authority vested in me, so to say, I am a representative from God, I absolve you of all your sins. And the person left in the same state as he had entered. As he was empty inside, so he remained. Did he become less sinful? Or did his consciousness stop and doesn't work? Well, what in fact? They are already adults. They must somehow approach this more seriously, somehow, let's say, either from a scientific point of view, or at least from an elementary adult understanding of what the spiritual path is, to treat it more seriously. Whereas people treat it as some kind of game, but not as... You see? Well, that's the whole trouble. One wants to believe in fairy tales. That's despite the fact that he or she is already old, right? In childhood it's okay, but when you're an adult, why are you playing at all this? If you want salvation, get up and go. Go save yourself. There are tools. Well, and to believe that another person can forgive your sins to you, well, that's ridiculous. 
We have already talked about this a lot. Again, what is the very understanding of sin? After all, it's terribly distorted. I will say simply, to be a slave of the system, to be a puppet in the hands of Satan, to live under the dictation of demons, when everything is decided for you, absolutely everything, even what food to get up on, everything is decided and reasoned by consciousness. This is a sin. While everything else, well, there is nothing else in this world. In this world, there is only one thing, either a dictatorship from the system or spiritual love. Also, the next question is that the presence of some kind of holy order makes a person more spiritual, more filled. Well, God doesn't give ranks. People themselves bargain, buy, deserve these ranks. I'm not saying that everyone does, well, and also deserve. It's like in any other organization. Again, someone steps on people, as a rule. Well, isn't that so? Well, to look at things reasonably, somebody likes someone, someone is higher in rank, and he likes this toady, so he promotes him. And if a person follows the path of God and defense, well, they usually seclude themselves. Well, who would appoint him to a top position? He would destroy the entire system. It's just shifting, well, responsibility of believer to someone who is a clergyman, that is. Well, again, we bump into authority, right? That is, a person, instead of really going by himself, priests are important and needed. They must prompt and tell. Again, who is above? Priest, the Church or Jesus? Simply put, Jesus, what did he say about scribes and Pharisees? Well, that's the answer for you guys. Don't be like them. Don't act like them, but do everything they say. Because the instructions are often right. Well, again, there are good people everywhere, wonderful people, and there are, excuse me, just people who are controlled by the system, greedy and the like. These greedy ones, that's, that's ridiculous, they begin to tell their... And it's true, it's from life, people come, tell. You look at this and think, well, it's somehow... Again, people themselves are to blame. They themselves create authorities because they listen to them and indulge them, right? One could say no, turn around and go the other way to another priest. And that's it. So if everyone acted like this, then that one who is lazy and greedy would act differently. Isn't that so? It is. Here, I've started to tell that they come and tell me that some fathers say that during remembering of their deceased, Every week, a representative from the family is obliged to bring food. And not just food, it should be fresh, freshly cooked, warm, and the best. Here you sit down to have a holiday dinner, and the best food is portioned and carried to the church. And it's not just to bring warm food to the church, but also it must be wrapped in a kerchief, necessarily in a new kerchief and not cheap one, because you cannot skim on your dead ones. And if priest's wife wears this kerchief, then it's all the more grace for your dead ones. Well, 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 guys, well, that's scam. Well, it's sickening to hear honestly. I ask people saying, is this really so? Yes, indeed it is. I say, do you also bring? We do. I say, well, which of you is a fool? Is it, well, the priest? Well, we know some fathers who are about to burst with greed. Well, what will you do? Well, Satan controls them. Well, Satan isn't really afraid of either temple, cross or water. He's afraid of nothing, because he is sitting in the head of a human. The only thing he's afraid of, it's really when a person steps on the path to God. And he's afraid of God's love inside. That's what he's afraid of. And the rest are games, people and the like. Well, it's true. It is so. Well, who is to blame that such people appear, say, in the churches, like in organizations? Well, people themselves are to blame. Once you've heard the stupidity which they tell you for the first time, well, just gather openly and send this father well somewhere to collect mushrooms, preferably inedible ones. That's it, and everything will be fine. Isn't that so? It is. They themselves indulge, they themselves bring. Well, how can I contradict as a priest? Well, he's a human, first of all. What does it mean, a priest? Excuse me, if I burn a fire, am I a heartkeeper now or what? 
Well, that's a simple question. And if I'm not there, the fire will end up and no one will have fire in the world? Well, that's a simple question. Well, is it possible like that? You should think, people. Just think. You create problems for yourself, and then you take offense, then accuse the entire church and everyone. As much as I talk to people, and I talk, believe me, a lot, it's the first time I've heard about the happiness that is happening now. Well, who is to blame for this? What, excuse me, the leadership of the Church is to blame, that is it there? Well, it's impossible for every priest to put two more. Why two? Because if you put one, he can share what was brought to him, you know, so it's necessary to put one more, so that he would be honest. Well, what are people for? What are the lay people for? Well, 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 it's… Actually, the temple is your home. You go there for spiritual growth. If something hinders you, eliminate it. That's why it is required, as you've said, to send them to the forest for mushrooms, and preferably for inedible ones. That's right. Why to the forest and for the inedible mushrooms? So that in the forest there would remain more edible ones so that fewer people would incidentally pick up the inedible ones. I mean, good people, promising ones. Well, this is also good, such forest orderlies. If you cannot bring benefit among people, then bring at least some benefit. Igor Mikhailovich, there is also such a question, one might say insurmountable for a layman, how to love your enemies. They keep trying, but, well… You know, a person, in fact, has one enemy, and this enemy is Satan. And it is impossible to love him. Well, how is it possible to love a mad dog that bites you? Isn't that so? Why would one love the devil? You need to love God, and then reconciliation will come, then an understanding will come that one should not take offense at people, because the devil rules them, just like it rules you. It's been embedded in this expression that one shouldn't take offense at people who are doing wrong things, because one cannot take offense at those personalities who are deceived by Satan, and they do not know what they are doing. That's why they are doing evil. That is really so. Well, because they punish themselves. Well, what can you take offense for at a person who is Satan's slave? Well, it's demons who do it in him. You shouldn't be offended. But to love whom? To love the devil? To love dead? Well, it's somehow wrong, isn't it? Vazlubit, it's just, well, there was such an expression, but not to love. Close to love, meaning not to take offense, but not to love. There is such a question. What should the action of the believer begin with? What do you mean? Well, what to begin with? Well, namely, not to be passive expectant, but… Well, we've talked about this many times. That is, any spiritual path begins with the first step. The first step, the simplest, let's say, truly verified path, starts with studying your consciousness with the help of your own consciousness. And, as a matter of fact, if one takes this seriously, the person will simply be horrified to what extent he's being manipulated. And this is exactly what strengthens you on the spiritual path. When a person really starts to work because an understanding comes that everything is being decided for you by someone. But who are you and where are you? Well, the system does not really want to show it and to give such an opportunity to a person to start engaging in this. It always distracts, puts it off until later. Well, because it's not very pleasant for the system to be exposed, since its tool gets taken away. And it is with these tools, by the way. These are its spoon and fork. And you should not feel sorry for Satan, as he does not feel sorry for you either. He deprives you of the most important thing in your life. Isn't that so? It is. There is such a saying, the prayer of the priest who has received the priest ordinance has special power. It's much more likely that God will hear you, Christians, when clergymen pray with you and for you, when church ministers pray for you, with you, O oh my Lord, may God forgive me, no matter who would pray with you or do something with you. If your prayers are recited by demons in your head, then no one will hear you except Satan, people. Again, it's better to follow the path together. It is better to study the patterns, the influence of Satan and his distractions together. It is better to share experiences, 
to learn the experience of ancestors, to preserve culture and to study history together. It is better, that's the point. But to aggrandize yourself in pridefulness over someone, when you yourself are the same, no matter what kind of rank you are given, well, it's a sin. Well, it's already a sin which is voiced here. The Lord will hear you. Well, there are no intermediaries, and there cannot be any, between God and a human, because the path is too short. No one will fit in. Well, imagine, I'll give you a simple example, personality and soul, a short path. How will you cram between this? A big dude, no matter which clothes he has on, no matter what religion he belongs to, everything is banal. It's all banal, guys. But in the meaning of manipulation over people's consciousness, the aggrandizement, why should people obey and fulfill that prayer is more powerful? Well, then they slip down so that you have to bring them hot meals every week, precisely hot meals and wrapped into an expensive kerchief. And to dream that the priest's wife wears this kerchief, then blessed will be your dead ones whom you commemorate this way. Well, that's how it all begins, priests. Well, here we should also understand that this has been going on since ancient times, when people indeed served God and their deeds were absolutely secret. After all, those who are in the service of God, they act secretly and the person does not know about it. Well, this is not interesting. The secret action when, well, let's just say, those who are in the shadows, we have already said, there are many diverse manifestations, and indeed there is an influence, and when someone stands and still gets in the way of influence upon you, you don't know it, you just felt bad, you've started feeling better, and you've got some free time, a minute, some weight has fallen off you, and you've recalled God, you've recalled love, you've recalled the good, and you've got inspired by this, and you've got this joy, and maybe something good has become of you, but you do not know whose work it was and why it is so. You're just in a bad mood, the weather changed, blood pressure increased, hormones were playing up, a lot of problems, you ate something bad. While sometimes, exactly when a person is attacked by those who are in the shadows, the third ones, as they are called, that are not related to the system. Well, they are still a part of the system. It's still all that, the same demons, well, they also eat a lot and the person is in a depressed state. So, those who are really in the service of God, they secretly, well, remove this unnecessary interference, because even consciousness is already more than enough for a person. And God willing, this filter is sufficient to get through, whereas those ones already latch on like leeches. Well, this is the point of the service. While consciousness, it likens and twists things, because, in fact, Jesus' disciples, what did they do? They carried this knowledge and gave it to people, right? But after all, they did not say, well, everybody heard there was Simon, who tried to liken himself. He even surpassed, well, Jesus Christ was nothing compared to him. When he, Simon, was walking, if his shadow fell on a person, then the person was already blessed and was healed. And that's all. There were such, oh, such God's power he possessed that he was bursting. Well, here is the answer for you guys. Everything is from consciousness, likening and so on. Therefore, well, what kind of power can someone's prayer have for you if you do not want to and are not going anywhere? You will not get anywhere. Isn't that so? Everything is in your head. Igor Mikhailovich, here is also such a point. I would like to touch on the topic of monkhood. After all, monkhood is actually a rather, let's say, young phenomenon, but… Yes, it is young. What was it like before? What was the prototype, yes, of this monkhood? Well, at the root of the prototype of monkhood, where it all originated from, and then it appeared later, let's just say the mention of the Alad sisters. Initially, there was a spiritual service, I mean, already after the Alad sisters, there was a spiritual service, and only women were there. Later on, with the advent of patriarchy, already with the development, well, let's say, when everything had already changed, the devil gained strength and wasn't already so afraid, became stronger, that's when priesthood appeared. That is, female groups of people who lived as a certain community akin to monasteries, 
but they were no longer engaged in serving God, but were serving Satan, meaning practicing magic, foretelling and the like. That is, they were wasting Allah powers, turning them into anti-Allah, well, in exchange for information, so to say. Well, this served as a prototype again for the establishment of monkhood, of certain groups, and it already became male and everything else. Why? Because they saw that there was a community of women who lived in solitude, doing who knows what there. But they possess enormous power. Well, the desire for this power had actually led to this. And also served the fact that people who aspired to follow a simpler way, an easier one, they rejected all mundane things and went into such concentration, into solitude, well, in order to be inseparably one-on-one -on -one with God. Well, for some reason it was considered to be easier. Well, no matter who you hide from and where you go, even onto a high mountain, even into a deep cave, consciousness won't leave you anyway. It will be with you, whether in seclusion or in society. Consciousness will still remain with you. You won't hide from it anywhere. Well, that's the truth of life. There is nothing bad in monkhood. It's a community of people. Well, people, well, are people. There are people everywhere, whether in monkhood, in religions, or anywhere. Isn't that so? It depends on a person. Apart from that, there is nothing bad in it. On the contrary, it is interesting. On the contrary, it is good. Let's say, when people really develop themselves, when they strive for God, of course, it is easier and better to do it collectively. And when it's all done in discipline and aimed at spiritual development, well, of course, that makes it simpler. There is also such a point as a renunciation of the world, right? Meaning some kind of cutting off one's own past, a change of names. Well, again, here we take likening to service, because when a person starts serving, he renounces everything that was before. Well, what does it mean he renounces? Skills and memory are still preserved. It's impossible to renounce everything that was before and to start with a clean slate. That means you need to learn the language, learn to walk, yes? Meaning everything. Well, if we approach this honestly. Otherwise, no. Well, it's a kind of game. I'm renouncing what was before, and now I'm starting something new. Well, such a belief. It's more like a game of consciousness. Also, such a substitution from consciousness, which sounded basically at the first stages in my head as well. What does it mean to renounce, right? So, I have embarked on the spiritual path… And lost everything. You have to… Everything that happened in the past, that's all lies. You have to… What? You will not cook, you will not live, you will not communicate with your relatives, well, what? You have to become some kind of a new one. But what kind of new? New? What kind of new? Green? Red? And then begins the search of what kind of new? Where are these saints? How? Well, this is consciousness. Nothing does change in a person. Well, how can something change in his image? What can change in his memory? Nothing. It just the life is gained and something becomes immortal, while everything else is mortal. That's all. But how can it be otherwise? Thank you. Here's the key point, that it's not it's not a change of masks, but this is just… No, on the contrary, it's taking the masks off. Yes. Although sometimes on purpose, and a person already puts the masks on consciously. If in everyday life, every person, I emphasize each one, he does not notice how masks are being changed on him, he does not even notice it. Then, let's say, when a person gains life, and still he is forced, well, here already, as they say, he who keeps company with the wolves will learn to howl, and so as not to be recognized as a delicious lamb being among the wolves, you have to wear a wolf's mask, right? Well, here I am speaking figuratively. Well, this is all masks. Well, it's a conscious action already. Well, how can we talk about, for example, God, when there are only atheists around? So, you will talk about fishing, about sports, about anything, although you do understand the suffering of those who are near. Well, what can you do? It's their choice. There is also this point that one other's monk admiringly told that while he was sitting and praying on the mountain, an eagle was circling above him. Well, an eagle, maybe it wasn't an eagle, just the man made a mistake because of his old age or pridefulness. Maybe it was actually a griffin. 
Meaning this point, when people are looking for some kind of confirmation, if a prey is the right one, then an eagle circles, if an eagle doesn't circle, then… This is megalomania, this is a manifestation, a sign from God, which was sent down to him, because he is an ethos monk, he sits on a mountain and prays to God, he himself prays to some God. And here God says, Wow, what a good guy you are, let me look at you, at least with eagle's eyes, when actually it's just a bird wanting to eat waiting when this liar and prideful man finally turns into food. Everything's very simple, while this is a prideful man and a liar. And such people are not worth listening to, because he is mistaken himself and leads others there too. But I must say, there are a lot of very decent people on Athos. I have many friends there, and they are good people. Yes, but this point… Those who do not wait for eagles to fly over them, they got up and went. They have one trouble, but the trouble is trouble of the organization, that one cannot talk openly about keys, about the true ones. Well, that's the organization. What is the invisible battle of monks? Well, that which they face, that which hinders them. Consciousness. Nothing else. And what else hinders them? What can hinder a monk, as well as any layman, and whatever a person would call himself, and whatever he would do? Besides consciousness, besides Satan, there is no one between him and God. Nothing more. Yes, here is also, on the other hand, a question from a laywoman. I pray for sins to go away. I am constantly worried. I am afraid that… What if it happens again? What if I again fall into… And this is nothing other than just the work of consciousness, right? Meaning, consciousness blames, exposes. This is its favorite method. A person embarks on the spiritual path, and it starts denigrating, humiliating and filling him with fears. Will this person get anywhere? Well, to nowhere, but a subpersonality. Why? Because he spends the power of attention on listening to these actors who chatter in his head. He finances them, he feeds them with his attention, instead of directing this attention to God, to love, to sincerity. After all, this is really easy, isn't it so? So, excuse me, who is the fool in this case? The fools are demons who whisper this, or a person has a personality who finances this chatter in the head instead of gaining life? Well, it's all fair. Well, this is true, but when she's in worries, it's like that crying, yes? Well, they consider themselves to be fighting, that they are doing something, they are opposing and they are achieving something. There is some kind of action because consciousness says, well, how is that just to love? There is no action, you just love, and that's it. And why? Because consciousness does not know what love is, and it will never know what true love is. The love that consciousness knows, it's, well, I don't know, there may be some kind of pheromones, a game of hormones, that's what love is for it, and that's it. That's where it ends, and then the confrontation and hatred begin. But it doesn't know what love is, and it cannot know. Why? Because the mortal does not know life. And one must remember that. Igor Mikhailovich, in some monasteries and in communities, there is also such a practice when people cut themselves off from the outside world, restrict access to means of communication, interaction, the internet. Well, again, this is solitude. It's… How does this help, or does it help, in working on oneself? Absolutely not, not in any way. Well, yes, they get less information, less distraction, but consciousness is consciousness, you see? But the question is, no matter how much we try, say, somehow, to prevent Satan from attacking us, well, it won't work. Well, anyway, even if there are two of them in the same monastery, they will still be angry with each other. At that, consciousness separates everything. And the question is, just whether a person is tuned, how much he is striving, and how sincere his need is, and how much he is willing to work sincerely and truly. If a person really feels and has a desire for life, an aspiration for the spiritual world, and he is ready, then he does not care, even if there is internet or something else. Even if all the TV sets in the world are arranged around him at the same time and are droning on from morning till night, it will not distract or hinder a person in any way. Well, there are no such distractions coming from consciousness, and there cannot be. Whatever consciousness offers, let's put it simply, a thousand years of the most exciting shows, 
excellent health, all the benefits and delights on the one hand, and one instant in the spiritual world, just one instant. Is it possible to compare this? It is impossible, because a thousand years here will fly by as one instant, while one instant in the spiritual world is forever, because there is no time there. Such old jokes. Well, but it's true. It's incomparable. The life of believers has acquired a kind of sin-centeredness, meaning they are looking for one sin, then for the next one, overcome it, then look for another one. It is striving for fight and the like. And often people on the spiritual path, also while performing the Jesus prayer or spiritual practices, they come across an understanding of the study of how consciousness works. They face certain patterns from consciousness, attacks, and so they begin to resist this. And here it also happens that Satan wins. Instead of starting to live, a person confines himself specifically to the process of struggle itself. A substitution takes place, and the person no longer invests the power of attention into God's love or something else. He does not gain eternity. He is busy with the need to fight. He needs an enemy with whom he will… Well, consciousness, it goes for this easily. Well, and that's it. And eventually, life ends in the fight. One has to study. This is one of the stages. But once you've realized that you are being manipulated, further you should gain life. Life. Further, you need to continue as a personality. Once you've realized that you are a personality, that you are the one who endows with this attention, and that you possess the freedom of choice, redistribution of these funds, let's say, this energy, this vitally important energy of attention, then you should already make a choice on your own where to redirect it all. If you like fighting, well, it's the same. Well, I don't know as any other life as atheism or disputes about God or to completely forget about God and live your life. After all, that's what most people do. They remember only when, excuse me, like the patient with the aneurysis remembers about the bad pen only when he really has to go. But otherwise, well, they live without God. And he does not bother them, you know, because in general everything is cut off, and it seems to them that they should live like this. But animals live like that, well, and people also live like that. Well, what can you do? Where is an understanding that you invest the power of your attention and you make a choice, you are a free human, and you make this choice of investing the power of attention in the spiritual world. That is what spiritual growth is. While fight is, fight, it's a fuss. It is justified at the initial stage, but later on it's not. Not to get stuck. It's impossible to overcome the system. Well, we have to approach this reasonably. This means that you will fight again out of pridefulness. I will defeat Satan. Well, how can you defeat him? Well, it's like you will look through the entire internet now, well, on your tablet. Well, you will now scroll through all the internet, it's ridiculous. But that's just some internet. While well, there, excuse me, it's the system. I would also like to share one priest's insights. The most crucial, decisive moment in life is the moment of here and now. And what is the most important and significant in this moment to understand what God wants from you? Nothing. And that's the point. God cannot want anything from a person who has not started living. We have already cited this example, namely on Jana's excels. So, has she understood what they want from her or not? Well, right? Right. Nothing. God cannot want anything from a person until he sees him. And God will see him only when he enters the door of his home. The point is that you should understand what your personality wants. Not consciousness, but personality. This is the one that remains after death. What are you striving for? Life or subpersonality? Do you want to live or do you want to die? That's the point. And this understanding, it must be preserved, despite the fact that consciousness will resist most actively. It's supposed to resist, and the stronger it resists, the more correct is your path. Where is that fine line? between responsibility for people and lecturing. Well, responsibility and lecturing, well, it's very simple. It's not a fine line. Responsibility is when you take on responsibility. You desire nothing and want nothing when you're in the shadows. But let's say you don't feel any kind of pridefulness for the fact that you are respected by everyone because you are such a great teacher or something else. 
Isn't that so? It is. And responsibility means that despite the fact that it gives you a lot of troubles and hassles, but you do know all this from your own experience, all this, let's say, when one points a finger at you in a store and says, oh, come here, look, yes, tell me, what did I dream of yesterday? I had a dream yesterday about a horseradish with a beat. What's that about? Isn't that so? This is called responsibility. When you understand and experience all these stupid questions, like about horseradish with beat, yes, coming from consciousness in the middle of, excuse me, a supermarket, but, well, despite this, you continue to do your work, because you know perfectly well that there are also normal people who do not work for the system, and who do not crave for magic, who really want to live, and a tool given to them correctly and at the right time is a big help for them. And in such a way, you really serve the spiritual world. Well, that's right. Well, that's the responsibility. Despite the fact that it gives you a lot of troubles and inconvenience, you continue to serve the spiritual world. Let's put it so, right? There is also another point. In monasteries, a huge amount of, let's say, time is allocated to such a thing as discipline. And naturally, some household issues come up. Why a novice doesn't follow certain rules there, or was late for the service. It's a collective. Well, it's inevitable. After all, any organization, any community, and especially since they live together, they must have an order. And it's natural that they deal with administrative matters, decisions and disciplinary issues. And the community must exist according to some clearly elaborated algorithm. Well, it's natural. But still, if they experience this constantly, and instead of spiritual development, well, that's like leadership's omission. They are not doing the right things. That's not what they have gathered for. How does discipline help in gaining freedom? Not in any way. But discipline does help, let's say, to save time. This really helps. Where is freedom? Well, what kind of it? There must be discipline, primarily in relation to consciousness, which comes from the Personality. There must be discipline in distribution of the power of attention and responsibility. That must be. That does help. But the fact that you get up every day at 5.40 in the morning, and then you go to bed at 3 o'clock at night, well, that's not discipline. That's abuse of the body, let's put it so. Can this end well? Not for the body. While if the person is free, well, what threat can that pose? Generally speaking, none. But responsibility should exactly be present here. The body should be given rest, and should be fed on time, and kept clean. And how can it be otherwise? That's the responsibility. It's like when a person drives a car which is falling apart and says, it's okay, I have another one. Well, that's irresponsible. Change the worn-out silent block in time, and it will serve longer. Change tires in time, after all, it's safety and everything else. Well, and again, you should wash the car more often. It's a different matter that you don't always have time. But a body is not a car. You need to take a better care of it. Igor Mikhailovich, there is also such a question from people. Can a person, while being here, in this three-dimensional world, encounter a miracle, a manifestation of a miracle? He can. But let's say so. Will he notice it? Well, let's say simply. Was there a miracle today? And more than once. But who has seen it? Only the one who has an ability, let's say, to observe the world with spiritual eyes, and not only with earthly ones. Whereas those who live to the dictation of consciousness and look with the earthly eyes, have they seen? That's the point. And what forces a person to exchange the constant expression of love for God for a fight with his demons? Trivially, it's a mere, let's say, art. Well, I would say, the excellent work of actors in his head. Or, let's put it simply, that's the tricks of demons. 
because it is they who distract the person and make the person betray life, betray the truth and exchange him for the earthly dust, for the empty, for the temporary. That's just the work of consciousness. Igor Mikhailovich, there is also a question. Well, it is already noticed by people, while they work on themselves, that if any thought comes, it comes simultaneously to two people, and also… Not only to two people it comes, well, when a group is working, but it is clearly visible when there is a group of like-minded people, and they all strive for spiritual development, they don't play around, don't play spirituality, but really strive, they are really moving. And so, when they study the patterns, how it works, people already are able to analyze, to see, to observe how thoughts come. They can immediately voice them. Well, indeed, when there is work of the group on spiritual self-development, then it turns out that a thought comes at the same time to at least one-third of the group. It may change a little, but the main point remains the same of that very thought. A woman also asks, well, a simple laywoman, a believer, she says that she's been attacked by demons, and so she's very worried about harming another person with her thoughts. Can she harm another person or cannot with her bad thoughts? Well, how can she harm another person with her thoughts? There is no way. She can harm with her deeds, but not with thoughts. Moreover, the thoughts are not hers. She simply watches the performance of her actors and worries about the actors in her head. But this is all staged. It all comes from shaitan. It often happens that there is a blockage in spiritual issues. That is, a fear to ask. To ask about some material issues is easy, while… But who exactly doesn't let one voice the truth? Well, again, we come up against work of consciousness, against very system, right? Meaning, to whom is it disadvantages here? It's not beneficial to consciousness. And what is the first rule? Consciousness says no, but you do it, right? And then you see how it starts to obey. And what's also important, in order to make consciousness attack less, it must be loaded up as much as possible. If there is nothing to do, well, everything has been done, nothing to load it with, let it learn Chinese language. Well, if you do not know it, of course, if you are not Chinese. Make it work, make consciousness study. It will be indignant, saying, well, why, how is it? Why do you need to study such a complicated language? Yes, there is no need, just so that consciousness is not idle. Or let it solve some problems. Well, consciousness should be constantly loaded and constantly in work. And again, pay attention only to the performance of a certain work, but not to the idleness of thinking. If a person does not do anything, lies on a sofa resting, watches a movie and philosophizes, he is far from the spiritual, believe me. If he watches some TV series, he worries about the characters, he compares himself. Well, what kind of spirituality are we talking about here? Isn't that so? That's why consciousness must work untiringly. Then there will be no idleness. Then it won't attack you. Then it, it'll have no time because you've set a task for it. I will only pay attention to you for studying studying the Chinese language and nothing else. It will have no choice, it will have to study. Well, what's wrong with learning certain languages? Nothing. Make it study if it doesn't want to be obedient. Igor Mikhailovich, people have also faced the fact that after an experience of the first context with the spiritual world, there is a loss of interest in everything external, and there is a moment of avoiding everything in the external context. Well, this is fear. Again, a person has encountered the spiritual world, and he has a fear of losing this love, losing this connection, this, so to say, non-verbal dialogue, and of course he avoids, so that he doesn't get distracted. But this is such an understanding, let's say, that it's enough to get distracted by anything, and the spiritual world disappears immediately, meaning this inner connection. Well, these are the first steps. After all, if we look at children, how they learn to walk, they fall and stumble. But it's normal, not a big deal. They get up and go. It's okay, this will pass. But you shouldn't be afraid of anything. You just need to stand your ground firmly, and everything will be fine. Therefore, I think the next question in this context, how to harmonize these relationships with relatives, well, it has already, has already been answered. Of course, just to love.
consciousness often conceals from personality even the understanding that this life is fleeting, that everything in it is an illusion. Naturally, consciousness is obliged to cover this up. Why? Because personality understands the existence of eternity. It understands the existence of the spiritual world. It understands love and joy emanating from the spiritual world. It aspires to go there. But consciousness has to give something as a counterbalance and it covers up understanding. Yes, it leaves you an understanding, yes, you will die sometime, but it doesn't give an evaluation of that. Why? Because consciousness perfectly understands that after the death of the physical body, if it has won the Armageddon and the personality has remained an obedient slave, then for consciousness there still be centuries and centuries of existence. This is not death. And for it, after all, consciousness doesn't experience pain and suffering. It's just a program, and the program can't worry. It is precisely the personality that is endowed with suffering and all the rest. This is a torture for a human, but not for consciousness. Therefore, this is extremely beneficial for consciousness, the subsequent existence after the death of the physical body in a state of subpersonality. After all, it continues to live and exist. There is also such a question, during spiritual development, side effects are possible, but consciousness substitutes and says that if you develop those very side effects, then you will become spiritual. And there is no knowledge how a person should act otherwise. Side effects during spiritual development are what's called sagacity, gifts and everything else. This is a natural process, because when a person is studying how the system works, acquiring God's power, much is revealed to him. It's not for everyone, really, but it happens quite often. Some people pass the spiritual path very fast. By understanding, catching the essence, well, they at full speed, without any of these effects, break into that endless world and never step out of there again. If a person walks in a certain fight, in a confrontation, then here, of course, such outright manifestation of, say, metaphysical abilities start taking place. Well, it is natural that consciousness, clutching at it, tries to distract, tries to exalt a person, saying, you see, you know what will happen to you tomorrow, and tomorrow it really happens. And consciousness puts an emphasis on this, telling you, look, you're already spiritual, you've already developed to such an extent, and so on. These are tricks, tricks and directives from consciousness. But many people looking at this, especially if he works in a group and sees how someone is growing and these metaphysical abilities start manifesting themselves in that person, he begins to listen to his consciousness and consciousness begins to tell him, you must develop extrasensory abilities and the person simply slides into magic. This is a side effect of spiritual development, but it doesn't manifest itself in everyone, I say it again. But the development of metaphysical abilities has nothing to do with spiritual development. On the contrary, it leads away from, say, the spiritual world and inevitably kills a person. It happens so that someone becomes involved in some projects which, for instance, are aimed at spiritual unification of people. And there surely appears some servant of the system who starts judging the actions of the person who is doing a lot. Well, the system always judges and always opposes. Again, there's commonplace envy, hatred that arises inside. Well, hatred comes from consciousness. A person cannot separate himself from consciousness, cannot resist it. All this is manifested through him. It's normal. But, as we know, when you do the right deeds, the more the system revolts, the more effort you need to make Make, right? Yes, if only these goals would be directed to a peaceful course. Well, if all these were to the good, the world would be wonderful. If people, at least a little, at least a bit, made at least the first steps in the direction of the spiritual world, then there would be paradise on earth. But... Igor Mikhailovich, people also have such a fear. They are afraid that the more they are engaged in spiritual practices or the Jesus prayer, 
the stronger is the activation of dark forces and demons, meaning that… Well, we've already talked about this, but this is really so. At a certain stage, they really start to resist, because their goal and task is to keep a person under control, because this is their food. And when a person becomes spiritually free, then, excuse me, he already thinks whom to feed, when and for what, meaning a person already has a choice, and he doesn't give away food for no particular reason. Well, but this is inconvenient for them, so they are fighting to keep what's theirs. Well, this is normal. How can people go through this stopping phase? Well, how? One should hold on. And you see the goal, you don't notice obstacles. We've already talked about this today. So what? Well, well, it rebels, it means you're acting correctly. You're on the right track. It all passes quickly. Consciousness strongly doesn't want to unite. But consciousness cannot unite. After all, if there are even two people in a group, they will still think badly about each other. Because any matter strives to enslave, to suppress, to dominate over other matter. Isn't that so? It is. If there are three people in a group, then it will be two against one. Well, this is the law. Moreover, today I'm with her against you, tomorrow I'm with you against her. Well, these are games, games of consciousness, divide and conquer. But in the same way, consciousness divides a human within. This is also true. Yes, it's just that there are such moments, people encounter the fact that consciousness doesn't let them into groups, right? But it's clear that in a group, the growth is faster and… Of course, it doesn't let them. This is natural. Why would it let a person go where he can find freedom and escape from the power of consciousness? Well, it must resist. Well, people differ from animals by the fact that they have, say, in addition to being spiritualized, they also have soul feeling, that is, apart from consciousness, they also have personality. And they have the right to choose where to go and how to act. Not by the will of Satan, but according to their choice. Well, right. It's just that there are directives like, I won't go, because when I'm on my own, there are no factors that provoke me into something. There are no those… Well, it's kind of easier. Yes. But let's say, what is easier is not always right. And this easier may be precisely an illusion that is leading the wrong way, right? Yes. And this is dangerous for consciousness, because people, if they're engaged in their own spiritual development, and moreover in a group, and without fear they announce all that, they tell and study the patterns of the system. After all, a person having come there can hear exactly how to get rid of, how to get out from under this control, how to get rid of Satan's oppression. But is this profitable for him? Of course not. That's why he says, sit and that's it. And who is this person? A puppet in the system's hands, if he obedient performs all that is ordered by demons. Well, what can I say here? We can feel sorry for him, but this is his choice. Another point is that consciousness always pushes on person's red buttons, meaning it yanks precisely at the most painful spots. Well, of course, it touches on a sore spot, because a person reacts to it. So, if a person has, say, something that the system can yank him at any moment, or create conditions for the person to be distracted from the spiritual, it will surely do that. But again, here is an understanding, what's more important, his egoism, his red buttons, well, anything in this world, if it is more significant than the spiritual world, then a person is not worthy of this world, meaning he needs to grow, he needs to do his best. But this is his choice. It is for this that the devil is needed, as a filter, sifting the dead from the world of the living. But if a person has gone through this, he has the right to life. But this is a person's choice. After all, a person creates himself, he makes himself either alive or dead. It's the choice. It's indeed freedom. It's wonderful. It's also been noticed how consciousness, by palming off some unnecessary thoughts and arguments, says that it's not a big deal. And this moment of the first entry well, that nothing will happen, nothing will occur. Just think about it, get busy with this and the like. At the time when a person is exactly, say, interacting with the spiritual world, meaning when he is exactly in such a nonverbal contact, 
Well, it's not a big deal, but the personality has paid attention. Then, after this not a big deal, comes something stronger, bigger, and in the end the person observes that he is already, excuse me, not in a dialogue with the spiritual world, but he is a spectator on whose stage, in consciousness, certain actions are unfolding, and the actors have already taken full possession of all his property, right? meaning his entire attention, well, that also happens often. But this just indicates either weakness of a person who cannot resist or he doesn't want to. Everyone can. There are no weak people, and everyone can. He doesn't want to. He likes more being in slavery. Well, it's his choice. Maybe you have questions. I've had a question. Previously you said in the program, it turns out that consciousness is trying to find someone from outside who is lying to you. Well, someone from the outside who is enslaving you. Although, in effect, it is the one that is enslaving. And here I've had such a question. This enslavement from consciousness, a person feels it with his attention, because he himself during the day wants to enslave someone. To put it simply, with his attention, a person strengthens the influence of consciousness on himself as a personality. Why? Because this fuzz of consciousness, these fears of it, if they are financed by the power of attention, and a person starts listening to them, then the game begins, and everything internal gets lost. Consciousness is cunning. Well, how will it not be cunning? The system has existed for billions of years, so it is natural that it has experience of deception, including deception of human-like beings, meaning spiritualized and soul-filled. This is normal, but it cannot make a choice for you. And this is true. You are the only one who chooses life or death. It turns out that a person, simply by seeing that it is deceiving him, that it is that very enslaver, then actually he stops believing anything. He might not believe it. Meaning, see the true essence of consciousness that… Well, why not believe? Here we should also differentiate well. It doesn't mean that consciousness lies about everything. Two times two makes four. Well, it's not lying. These are elementary things. But consciousness does substitute everything that concerns the spiritual. It always works exclusively for itself. It will never work for personality, especially for liberation of personality. Well, how otherwise? After all, it is unprofitable for it. Excuse me, but consciousness is a good economist, and it simply wants to eat. It will never work to starve. It doesn't have the concept of conscious, honor, goodness, love. Well, there aren't any concepts. It's a program. It's soulless. We enliven it by investing the powers that are coming from the soul. Excuse me, Yes, it is spiritualized. Yes, it's a part of the alive, but it is also inevitably dead. It's just a program, and one shouldn't make something alive out of it, something really existing and possessing human qualities. No, it doesn't possess these qualities. Listen to yourself carefully, write everything down to the last thought that comes, and you will understand how awful it is, your consciousness anyone's, even the best person's consciousness. During the day, consciousness throws in him such things that even that very psychiatrist who tries to understand, let him write it down, he will make such diagnosis for himself. For the freedom of conscience. Very often consciousness uses the slogan for the freedom of conscience. The concept of conscious, it is again often substituted. What is conscious? What does it originate from? In fact, conscious is the aspiration of a person as a personality for freedom. And conscious is a quality of personality. But consciousness easily violates it. If it, excuse me, leads a person to death, then what would it cost for it to step over conscious by simply changing the viewpoint and showing other pictures? Well, it's quite a liar. That's the reason of all troubles here on Earth. That's why there is hatred, hostility among people and everything else. Because people listen precisely to the one whom they shouldn't listen to. They listen to demons in their heads. And this, as we have said many times before, is precisely the main cunning and sneaky abilities of Satan. 
He simply hides behind an invisible world and acts through consciousness, because consciousness is his domain, and a human cannot understand where to find Satan. Well, where, where, he himself is a part of Satan. Why, if everything is so simple, in fact, everything comes down to one thing, that, well, the power of attention, and that's all. And to understand that consciousness is the end. You shouldn't just understand, you should study and practice. After all, it is the one that doesn't let you go anywhere, sunshine. Well, I... Well, the essence is one. All the time, everything that is filmed, everything that you say, the essence of this all is one. Only one. Then why is it so... Why is it so difficult? Because you are not working on yourself. Everything's quite simple. When was the last time you tried with a notebook and a pen? I tried with notebook and a pen a long time ago. Here's the answer for you. Will it be easy? No, it will not, because you aren't studying it. Because it twists you around its finger. You get these moments of a surge during that same filming. When we communicate, it encourages you, and you feel that it is true. But consciousness immediately tells you that's all rubbish. Isn't that so? It is. Well, it doesn't talk about rubbish. Come on, it does. Well, don't be shy. After all, it's not you I'm accusing, I'm talking about consciousness. That, generally speaking, all this is nonsense, there is so much there, and all this is trifles. Well, the phrases sound, but I... Yes, but they do sound. Phrases sound. Of course, here's the answer for you. But I do know that it's not so. But you do know? How do you know? Then why are you excuse me on the other side of the table? Didn't you have the opportunity to be on this side? And who prevented you, except your consciousness? Here's the answer for you. Is it worth thinking about? It is. Well, I'm constantly thinking about it. But you should neither think about nor invest attention in it, because this way you feel sorry for yourself and sympathize with yourself, since you're so good. And what do you do to stop this? Nothing. You continue to feel sorry for yourself, isn't that so? For your own beloved self, a good and worthy one. But what must be there? There must be an action. Inaction doesn't solve anything. If a person is inactive, if he's not going to God, God will not come to him. And this is true. Do you want to be free? Be free. It's very simple. It's really simple. But this requires a lot of effort. You have to be selective at first, highly selective. What exactly to finance and why consciousness forbids you to do it and you don't do it. It literally forbids you to develop spiritually. And you listen to it and obey. After all, who are you in this case? Nobody. It's a personality. Here's your answer. And this is not a joke. This is a life which you, let's put it so, forbid yourself. Isn't that so? Well, it is, so I don't see because I don't write it down and don't observe, right? Because you don't work on yourself, because you yarn for it and you just cry about it. This is crying by the wall, just like Tatiana said. Well, I've pushed it deep inside, because as for crying, I actually don't... Well, I'm telling you figuratively, and there is no difference. You are always thinking about it. But what are you thinking? And what kind of thoughts do your actors palm off on you? Are they good ones? No. They are just sorry for you. They tell you it's not working, you can't do it, you don't want to, and you don't do anything. You are always just thinking about it. But if you had spent these forces studying the system, then one fine day, a long time ago, already back then, you would have realized how much it's screwing you, and believe me, your pride would have won over your laziness. You would no longer allow demons to control you, but you allow it, and they manipulate you. Excuse me, they do whatever they want with you. But the pleasure of this is illusory. Isn't that so? Is it good to live in an illusion, realizing that you're digging a hole for yourself and as if you cannot do anything? Who tells you that you cannot do anything? The actors in your head? They cannot do anything, but you can do everything. And why don't you do it? Because they forbid? Well, isn't that so? Give me at least one argument. 
well, there are no arguments because, well, I don't know, it kind of forbids. It's just from them, well, thus I'm deceiving myself because also in the external, for instance, I'm doing things in the external. And this is precisely the forbiddens from them. In the external, you try to pretend, but in fact, you're not working on yourself. In fact, you conform to their fairy tales, which they tell you, and you walk around in circles to their dictation. Probably I only just changed the record. Well, if you were changing record, Sunshine, but I'm changing. There would at least be a different melody, while you basically have three verses in your head. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. First of all, stop lying to yourself, and that's where it all starts from. But not lying is boring, it becomes scary. In fact, when a person stops lying to himself, and this is the first thing to start with before embarking on the path of studying the system, it gets scary and terrifying when you face the reality. And that's exactly what many are avoiding. Again, who is scared? You as a personality? No. Consciousness is scared and terrified. Satan is afraid of being exposed. But until you, excuse me, drag him by the ears out of the depths of your consciousness, well, he will sit there and manipulate you. Do you need this? I don't. And nobody will do this for you. A person himself makes his choice. Consciousness plans doubt. Was there an experience, spiritual experience? And this is for sure, because consciousness, it actually doesn't receive this spiritual experience, and it cannot receive it. It's not accessible to it. After all, the entire spiritual experience that a person perceives, it all happens at the level of the personality's development, while consciousness is obliged to cast doubts on it and destroy it. Why? First, it's inaccessible to it. It cannot fit it well in the category of logic. It can't understand it. All that we need consciousness for, and that we can get from it on the spiritual path, is again, at the primary stage, to study and understand that Satan does exist and how he works. This is the maximum usefulness we can receive from consciousness on the spiritual path. And everything else is a hindrance. Also, besides the argument, it's not a big deal, consciousness has another argument. At the moments of deep contact, it says later on, take a break, rest from the spiritual. Oh, that's for sure as well. But are you really tired? How can you rest from the spiritual? This just shows that it is tired and it is asking for rest. So what should be done? Do more with great intensity, isn't that right? It is. That's the only way. If you just relax a little, well, have a rest, well, it's nothing to worry about, get distracted here, dream like before, it was good before after all. Well, if a person feels good in the oven, then he's, excuse me, a pie, not a human. This is his choice, of course. Also, there is such a point. A person who once came into contact is looking for ways back, how to return, meaning he's going around in circles, because there is no knowledge. But here, one thing sometimes happens. A person who has come into contact with this real miracle, with this happiness, with God's love at least once, Later on, he often keeps trying to find all this, but with the help of consciousness. And this doesn't work. And consciousness often tells him that this was just a delusion, it didn't happen. Why? Because consciousness doesn't experience this. And what does a person experience besides love and happiness in the first place? This is freedom from consciousness. But of course, this is not profitable for consciousness. Everything is simple. I would just like to voice the arguments of consciousness, which stop people on the way, well, basically, even from performing spiritual practices. You won't be able to do it, I want to sleep, I need to take a fresh look, and in this state it won't be done properly. On the way of working on yourself. It'll be better when I'm in a different mood, or you don't have enough experience. When you gain a little more experience, then we will succeed. Well, I'll say this, this palette here, it is very diverse and full of colors, with which consciousness colors its aspirations. And there's one desire, to distract the person from spiritual salvation. Well, how can a person get tired of God's love? Well, this is unreal. Realistic. Where his consciousness gets tired, it's hard for it, and it begs, so the person gets distracted. 
He tells him that, you're tired, you need to rest, what spiritual practice or prayer? What are you talking about? Go to bed, sleep, and everything will pass. Well, if a person listens to this and goes to bed, then indeed everything will go away, and in the morning it will become easier, as there will be no need to take care of himself anymore, no need to think or fight, just like a slave. Like an animal, you live by instincts to the dictation of consciousness, and everything is so simple, everything is so good, but not for long. Later on, there appear doubts and fears. After he already begins to act, has already come into contact. And then, yes, of course. An attack already begins, a series of thoughts that make a person doubt everything. Certainly, make him doubt and oppress him. Well, how can it be otherwise? This is the work of consciousness, it scares, it drives him away. It does everything to lead a person astray. But excuse me, this is a filter. That's how it should function. A worthy one must pass. An unworthy and weak one? This is his choice. After all, all people are born with the possibility of spiritual liberation, but not all aspire to it. Does that mean they like it? Well, they don't really like it. Actually, everyone is afraid and everyone feels inside what spiritual world is. And people do understand that hell doesn't exist. But there is something worse. There is a state of subpersonality. This is what people call hell. And people feel and understand this perfectly. But they do not let this understanding turn into awareness. Well, self-defense, instinct, reflex, they can be called differently. But this is just a fight of consciousness for his life. Right, and as the next point, consciousness simply erases the gained experience. Well, it turns out that it imposes some new ideas, new projects, new, well, some kind of new life goal. Yes, a thousand and one little things to distract you with some problems, or something has happened. Well, again, it's a matter of distraction. Let's say simply, nothing prevents a person, neither learning a new language, even a quite complicated one, nor getting involved in some projects, work, business, study, nothing, even illness. Nothing prevents a person from gaining God's love. Well, but it's impossible if a person, let's say, himself, doesn't want it. If he as a personality doesn't invest his attention into desires and aspirations of consciousness, but will direct it only to spiritual development, well, definitely he has only one way the way to immortality, the way to the Chosen Ones. Well, isn't that so? It is. Igor Mikhailovich, please tell us, what is the most important thing in the life of every person? Love. This is what's most important, because love is what gives life. Love for the spiritual world and love for each other. So, guys, let's love each other and just live. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Igor Mikhailovich. Thank you. Thank you.